I welcome you to cancel conclave of normally whenever we discuss about cancer we only discuss amongst ourselves either this is doctors discussing or it's the social workers discuss discussing we hardly have an audience which would be across the board and today we have this opportunity so without wasting any further time let me call upon uh, mr ravi prakash mr ravi prakash ji is a renowned reporter with uh, bbc hindi and apart from that he is himself a cancer survivor and i would say not only a cancer survivor he's a cancer conqueror he he keeps on showing ways to not only to patient but many doctors like us and we i get inspired by whenever he whatever whenever he posts a beautiful tweet or with his articles so over to uh, ravi ji थैंक यू डॉक्टर पाटिल पहले तो सभी लोगों का स्वागत है यू आर ऑल वेलकम इन दिस कैंसर कॉन्क्लेव ये एक अच्छा आयोजन है कि जब भी कोई कॉन्क्लेव होता है खासकर कैंसर का जो डॉक्टर पाटिल भी कह रहे थे और मैंने भी मरीज रहते हुए जो समझा है पिछले दो साल में वो ये है कि ऑनकोलॉजिस्ट जो होते हैं जो लगातार काम करते हैं कैंसर पे चाहे वो सर्जिकल हों या मेडिकल ऑनकोलॉजी के हों या जो भी स्टेक होल्डर्स हैं जिनका डायरेक्ट कनेक्शन है कैंसर से चाहे वो फार्मास्यूटिकल कंपनीज के लोग हों एन जी के लोग हों तो इनसे बातचीत शुरू होती है किसी भी कॉन्क्लेव की मतलब ऑनकोलॉजिस्ट अपनी रिसर्च को बताते हैं कि हमने ये रिसर्च किया है इतने पेशेंट्स को देखा तो ये चीजें हुई ये पहला आयोजन मुझे मेरी मेरे, मेरे कैंसर मरीज के तौर पर मेरे जो दो साल के अनुभव हैं उसमें ये पहला आयोजन है जिसमें आ, किसी पेशेंट से इस कार्यक्रम की शुरुआत हो रही है तो सबसे पहले तो आप सभी लोगों को बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद कि आपने एक मरीज को आ, बोलने आ, का वक्त दिया कैंसर कॉन्क्लेव की शुरुआत में और जैसा कि हम सब लोग जानते हैं कि ये कॉन्क्लेव अगले साढ़े तीन चार घंटे तक चलेगा जिसमें अलग अलग से सत्रों में सेमिनार्स से अलग अलग विषयों पर बातचीत होगी जहां तक मेरी बात है डॉक्टर पाटिल ने बताया ही मेरा नाम रवि है मैं बीबीसी हिंदी सर्विस के लिए काम करता हूं और जनवरी 2021 से लंग कैंसर के स्टेज फोर का मरीज हूं और पैलिएटिव ट्रीटमेंट मेरा चलता है और मैं ठीक हूं डॉक्टर पाटिल और डॉक्टर कुमार प्रभास जैसे लोग हैं जिनकी वजह से मैं अपनी जिंदगी ठीक ठाक गुजार पा रहा हूँ और जो जब भी कोई कॉन्क्लेव होता है या जब भी कैंसर पे कोई बातचीत होती है तो फॉर्मली मैं आप सब लोगों का स्वागत इस कॉन्क्लेव में करते हुए यह भी कहना चाहता हूं क्योंकि एक मौका है कहने का कि कैंसर मरीज को आ, क्या दिक्कतें होती हैं और आ, क्योंकि विवेक शर्मा जी ने और बाकी जो भी आयोजक है वहां को और सब लोगों ने ये अपॉर्चुनिटी दी कि मरीज अपनी बात शुरू करे तो देखिए कि क्या परेशानियां होती हैं एक एक रिमोट जगह पे ऐसे मैं रांची में रहता हूँ झारखंड की राजधानी में एक रिमोट में अगर किसी व्यक्ति को कैंसर डायग्नोस हो जाए तो सबसे पहले दिक्कत उसकी ये है कि वो कहाँ पे इलाज कराएगा क्या कोई डॉक्टर वहां उपलब्ध है कि नहीं उसके शहर में क्या कोई बड़ा अस्पताल है कि ना है कि नहीं जहाँ चीजें इक्विप्ड हो जहाँ पे अस्पताल में तो सबसे बड़ी चुनौती तो वही होती है और अगर उससे भी मरीज निकल गया उसने एक अस्पताल का चुनाव कर लिया उसको अच्छे डॉक्टर्स मिल गए उसका डायग्नोसिस अच्छे तरीके से हो गया ठीक है स्टेज फोर में ही से या या, या स्टेज वन में डायग्नोस हो इस पर करे लोगों का तो अब है कि वो उसके लिए जो मेडिकल प्रोटोकॉल तय किया जाएगा जो दवाइयां तय की जाएंगी वो दवाइयां उसके बजट में है कि नहीं उनको वो अफोर्ड कर पाएगा कि नहीं कर पाएगा जिंदगी कॉन्क्लेव में जो हम रिसर्च की बात करते हैं क्लिनिकल ट्रायल्स की बात करते हैं नए डेटास पे बात करते हैं तो ये चीजें छूट जाती क्योंकि हम ये नहीं बता रहे होते कि अगर किसी मेडिकल प्रोटोकॉल का बजट साल का 40 लाख रुपया या 30 लाख रुपया या 50 लाख या उससे ज्यादा है या इवन बीस लाख भी है तो कोई आदमी कैसे अफोर्ड कर पाएगा उसको कैसे लोग करते होंगे तो इस पर भी बात होनी चाहिए मुझे पूरी उम्मीद है कि इस कॉन्क्लेव में इस चीज पर भी बात होगी क्योंकि जो स्पीकर्स हैं उनमें एनजीओ के लोग भी हैं डॉक्टर्स तो ऑब्वियसली हैं ही हैं 
फार्मास्यूटिकल कंपनीज के लोग हैं तो मुझे लगता है इस पर बातचीत होगी दूसरा जो दूसरी जो बात होती है मरीजों को लेके वो ये है कि जब भी वो बैरी शहरों में जब कोई जाता है इलाज कराने के लिए तो वो उसके एकोमोडेशन का खर्चा उसके 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 आने जाने के खर्च ये कुछ स्टेप आगे बढ़े हैं हम क्या क्योंकि इसमें पार्टिसिपेंट्स काफी है मैंने उर्वशी जी का भी नाम देखा जो नीति आयोग रिप्रेजेंट करती हैं अब मुझे मतलब ये कहते हुए दुख होता है कि आयुष्मान जैसी योजना जो बहुत ही जिसको बहुत ही शोकेस किया गया भारत सरकार के द्वारा उसमें एक टारगेटेड थेरेपी की एक भी दवा नहीं है तो मुझे पूरी उम्मीद है कि ये कॉन्क्लेव काफी अच्छे रिजल्ट के साथ समप होगा और अगले साल जब ये कॉन्क्लेव दोबारा हो रहा होगा तो हमारे पास कई सारे पॉइंट होंगे जी थैंक यू थैंक यू रवि और मैं एक ही बात आपके लिए कहना चाहूंगा इंदीवर का लिखा हुआ गाना मुझे याद आ गया जीवन से भरी तेरी आंखें मजबूर करें जीने के लिए मजा आ जाता है जब जब आपसे बात करता हूँ और थैंक यू सो मच फॉर बीइंग हियर एंड गाइडिंग अस एंड यू नो हम एक कंटेक्स जो है वो सेट करने के लिए कि हम क्या करने वाले हैं क्या बात करने वाले हैं और अब मैं आमंत्रित करना चाहूंगा डॉक्टर सुबिता पाटिल को जो है जो जुड़ रही है हमारे साथ टाटा मेमोरियल इंस्टीट्यूट से एंड जब हम कैंसर की बात करते हैं तो सबसे अहम जो है ट्रीटमेंट तो खैर बात की बात होती है सबसे पहला जो हिस्सा होता है उसका वो होता है अवेयरनेस तो अवेयरनेस कैसे इंक्रीज करी जाए कैसे स्क्रीनिंग करी जाए ये सारी चीजें हम जानेंगे डॉक्टर सुबिता से डॉक्टर सुबिता बहुत बहुत स्वागत है आपका थैंक यू आई स्टार्ट शेयरिंग माई प्रेजेंटेशन जी Uh, very good afternoon to all of you i will be highlighting on the cancer awareness screening and early diagnosis and i will focus on these uh, major topics for you as uh, shown here in this slide uh, the cancer burden of india in comparison to the world uh, is shown here breast cancer is the number one cancer not only in the world but also in india breast oral and cervical cancer are the three most common cancers occurring in india accounting for 34% of all cancers in india according to ncdir icmr 2020 cancer of mouth lung stomach colorectal and esophagus they are most common cancers in men while cancer of breast and cervix is the most common cancer in women the highest burden uh, was found in northeast region in india there is a rise in trend of incidence of cancer breast while cervical cancer is on the decline but uh, tobacco related cancers uh, are likely to account for 27% of india's cancer cases giving rise to the increased burden of cancer in india the age standardized incidence rate for india for breast cancer is 26 per 1 lakh women for the cervix it is 18 per 1 lakh women while for the lip and oral cavity is 15 per 1 lakh men not only this but the mortality from breast cancer is highest followed by the cervical cancer so hence these three cancers that is breast cervix and oral are the common in india and are targeted by government of india under the national program as uh, they ca they can be screened detected early can be preventive reaching to the advanced stage where treating is difficult for the health professionals now this uh, slide shows the evolution of cancer control program in india uh, in the year 2010 uh, the cancer control was merged in the uh, uh, npcdcs program that is a national program in prevention and control of cancer diabetes cardiovascular diseases and stroke uh this was implemented in india in the phase wise manner and currently covering more than 600 di districts uh, through the more than 5000 ncd clinics at community health centers across india uh 266 day care centers for cancer care and 187 functional cardiac care units uh 
Government of India has developed the customized module of training of all the staff, guidelines, uh, operational frameworks uh, were prepared for covering the all aspects of uh, uh, program, including the uh, community uh, health workers, grassroots level workers, such as the ASHA, ANM, MPW, CHO, medical officers, and the other health staff. The broad uh, programmatic guidelines, they mainly focuses on the opportunistic screening within the existing public health uh, system framework. Now, this is the community-based assessment check checklist or CBAC form for the early detection of non-communicable diseases by the grassroots level workers during their fortnight visit, that is the ASHA workers in their community, uh, which includes a set of the questions for the men and the women to find out what are the early signs and symptoms of these common cancers so that, sorry. Yeah. They can refer them with the referral slip. Now, these are the available tests for the screening of cancer, uh, cervical cancer in India. The secondary prevention of cervical cancer with the help of the visual inspection with diluted acetic acid uh, uh, of the cervical os in, in the sufficient light by the trained healthcare, uh, primary healthcare worker at the health and wellness center or the primary health center or the community health center between for the women between the age group of 30 to 65 years in India is recommended. Uh, these, uh, this slide shows the recommended uh, VIA uh, uh, strength, uh, the test strength and the limitations. The strength is being the non-invasive and it is inexpensive, easy to learn and does not require any lab involvement. It is a real-time test and the results are available immediately. Even the non-physicians can be trained for this. The efficiency and the cost effectiveness of this test has been evaluated in two randomized controlled trials showing the significant mortality benefit. The WHO recommended a VIA-based screen and treat strategy that or the single visit approach or SV approach with the cryotherapy is adopted by government of India. Secondary prevention of breast cancer by the clinical breast examination the steps are mentioned here by the trained primary health care worker uh, in the primary health center or the community health center for the women between the age group of 30 to 65 years in India is a practical cost effective way of the screening. But still there is a need to address the value of self breast examination. The second mm. prevention of oral cancers by the oral uh, visual inspection of the at-risk population who are using the tobacco, alcohol, erica net, or the mixed use of it by the trained primary healthcare workers uh, at uh, the wellness, and, uh, wellness centers uh, is recommended. A meta-analysis of this OVI study is conducted in developing countries show indicated a satisfactory test performance and a community-based cluster randomized control trial conducted in Trivendram showed a significant 34 percentage reduction in the mortality because of this uh, test when it was implemented in the community. This particular table shows the uh, format uh, for the screening and follow-up of the common cancers uh, which mentions so who should be beneficiary uh, what should be the frequency of the screening and what is the next plan of action in case of the screen positive patients. This is the referral slip uh, to be provided for further investigation in case of suspected symptoms by the trained ASHA, ASHA workers or the healthcare workers. While this is the algorithm of screening and management of the breast cancer, this uh, is the algorithm of the screening and management of the cervical cancer. This is the algorithm of screening and management of oral cancer. Tobacco kills more than 1 million people per year in India. Tobacco is identified a cause of cancer. Still, the consumption of tobacco is high in India. The activities which uh, are conducted to prevent tobacco-related cancers in India, they include the 85% of the principal display area of tobacco packs should have the pictorial health warning, national tobacco quit line, incisation program, national tobacco testing labs, global uh, knowledge hub on the smokeless tobacco, and uh, the guidelines for tobacco free educational institutions, and also the coordination with the Panchayati Raj institution. We have a COTPA Act, that is a cigarette and other tobacco product prohibition of advertisement regulation of trade and commerce products supply and distribution act 2003 for tobacco control in India. 
uh, then uh, the government has released a computer software for the, for the field implementation of these guidelines and the delivery of the comprehensive package in those centers. A uh, pilot study was uh, conducted to evaluate the implementation of uh, these guidelines, which found out the lack of motivated healthcare professionals, difficulty in motivating the community and lack of the higher referral centers for the management of screen positive uh, patients were the challenges. But uh, according to the National Family Health Survey file data, the screening rate for common cancer is less than 2% for all these three common cancers, indicating that uh, there are barriers of availing the screening facility and or the challenges of implementing the screening modalities. The broad pragmatic guidelines by the government of India mainly focuses on the opportunistic screening within the existing public health system framework. These pose a unique challenge, such as the cost of administration, training of the manpower, access to screening facilities, their follow-up management, adequate linkages for the confirmatory diagnosis and subsequent treatment. So the health resources allocated toward the cancer control, they vary between us, between different states. Per health wellness center, uh, currently 50,000 is provided infrastructure and resources required to conduct the screening and further investigation and the primary uh, care facilities being poor. Also, there are challenges in improving the cancer screening as the current uh, practice is opportunistic screening. The limited screening behavior among the eligible women need to be researched and should be executed with the specific community education and the screening programs. This will reduce the patient delay to access the care and delay in the prognosis, uh, delay in the diagnosis and treatment. A recent narrative review by the researcher found out limited awareness about the risk factors and the screening practice. The possible solutions of uh, adequate, adroit, motivated healthcare professionals, uh, then the dedicated budget and strengthened healthcare system will help achieve the awareness and cancer screening. Considering the complexities involved in the National Cancer Grid, NCG, a consortium of more than 180 cancer institutions in India, provide the evidence-based strategies and approaches to help uh, adopt the best practices in this field. In terms of the tobacco-related cancer prevention, it is highly essential to find the means of uh, reduction in the tobacco consumption, uh, strengthening the tobacco cessation services, and timely achievement in the COTPA Act. A suggested approach is to develop the tools that can enhance the skills of the healthcare providers, uh, appropriate referrals, robust real-time data monitoring, and its evaluation. To raise the awareness, uh, we need to identify the target groups, for example, which community, who are the stakeholders, and how we can keep them engaged. What should be the mode of dissemination of an awareness, print media, direct media, or an electronic media? And then how do I manage the event? Engaging the stakeholders help the successful implementation of the program. Develop the message that effectively inform men and women who are targeted for this. And decide the geographic location where you want to implement this particular screening or awareness session. Decide on resources in terms of manpower, material, money, machine, mode, infrastructure, transport of the speakers. So prepare a checklist for conducting the cancer awareness. Publish the event once you conduct the event uh, for, the, for motivating people who are involved and who could not avail the facility. Observe the events on various health days. Our department is constantly involved in such activities such as cancer awareness at educational institution at government institutions, conducting virtual symposium on the day of World Cancer Day during COVID times. Virtual symposiums on the occasion of World Cancer Day with the Nehru Science Center. 
community outreach program along with the training programs are conducted regularly. Administering the workshops on the preventive oncology and cancer screening. Not only this across India, but overseas also. So capacity building and training program with hands-on training for medical officers of various districts of Maharashtra. Not only this, but on-site hands-on training for the private medical institutions. You can see here the pictures where the hands-on training was provided on-site. Collaborated with Public Health Department, Maharashtra State, government and the private partners, uh, we are spearheading the hub and spoke model at Khopoli, which covers the distant areas. And the extension of our services that is in currently in budding state or state of art satellite center at Gadhchiroli is an example of reaching out to the difficult area. Collaborating with the government or the municipal medical colleges in terms of training and research, which helps dissemination in the modern uh, with the modern ideas much quicker on the larger scale alliance with the other state can reach and propagate this knowledge to more number of healthcare professionals to achieve the sustainable development goal by the year 2030 the way forward is systematic organized screening of the target population and timely treatment of the detected lesions thank you very much So I'll start Thank you. My presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Subita. And all that you have done for us, and gratitude on behalf of the entire cancer community. Because this is, I can say, a start. And there is still a lot of work to be done. And from your conversations, I have come to understand that the opportunistic or accidental diagnosis is happening. We should do it in a structured manner. We should do it in a structured manner. And if uh, cancer is a very big deal, then maybe awareness is also needed. And we should do more work on that. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your uh, views on that. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Now I would like to Dr. Sarvana. And Dr. Sarvana was here in my meeting in the year and review meeting in the last month. And I have known him a lot about him. And he is doing a lot of work, Dr. Sarvana, in terms of access. When we talk about access, that the things that are necessary to be done in the last mile, then they have been very difficult for the use of surgery. Dr. Sarvana is a robotic surgeon, a surgical oncologist. His name is Dr. Sarvana. He is a robotic surgeon, a surgical oncologist. His name is Dr. Sarvana. He is a robotic surgeon. राजा मनिकम एंड सर जो है तंगम हॉस्पिटल नामकल से आते हैं डॉक्टर साहब आपके लिए बहुत बड़ा चैलेंज है बिकॉज जो टॉपिक हम डिस्कस करने वाले हैं वो कुछ ऐसा है अगर मैं शब्दों में उसको पी रहा तो ऐसा है कि बड़ी अजीब सी जिंदगी है जो मिल नहीं सकता वही तो चाहिए सो आई इंट्रोड्यूस डॉक्टर सरवना एंड रिक्वेस्ट हिम टू इंट्रोड्यूस दी पैनलिस्ट एंड कैरी ऑन द सेशन थैंक यू विवेक फॉर दी इन्विटेशन ऑडिबल ये डॉक्टर साहब वेरी मच So thank you, Vivek, for the invitation. Thank you to Dr. Vijay Patil and Dr. Kumar Prash for uh, you know making this possible. Or uh, uh, I'd like to introduce our es esteemed panel. We have you know a star-studded panel. I hope all of you are online. Uh, so, so the I first think is Dr. Ravi Kanan could not join probably. Yeah, okay, no problem. Yeah. Good. So we'll. I think we have able people. So I'd like to introduce uh, as part of the panel. Uh, uh, Shri Vijay Venkatesh, Madam, who's you know, Namaste, who's uh, ha, you know heading the Max Foundation for uh, the regional head for Max Foundation in India, uh, including South Asia. Uh, Dr. Bhavesh Poladia, he's my colleague and uh, medical oncologist. You know, struggling with us at the last mile of cancer care in in the country, and uh, uh, esteemed Shri Priya Dadji for uh, you know for joining us in this uh, in this discussion. So I'd like to just uh, you know start off with uh, asking a question. Like uh, Bhavesh and me are young. You know we are the young people who have just entered into this limelight. I'm like ten years out of uh, uh, training from Tata Memorial Hospital, gone directly to the grassroots. You know and uh, working with the public at the lowermost level available uh, in the country. But I want to know from uh, established veterans like uh, Priya ji and Vijay madam. You know what? How was this? This thing ten years ago, and how is it now? So I'll, you know, access to cancer care. 
So it's a, it's definitely a continuum. It would have been better 10 years, but what is the visible change that you have seen in the last 10 years and, and, and up to now? Vijayji, you would like to start? Yeah, I think. Uh, yes, yes, uh, Priya, yeah. of course. Uh, if, if with, with your permission, uh, I would like to go back to 20 years because yeah. uh, it was uh, um, exactly 20 years ago that um, uh, uh, access program uh, without any kind of precedent um, uh, was put in place for uh, a rare uh, uh, leukemia called chronic myeloid leukemia. And uh, my, uh, I, I joined uh, that, that, um, that project and uh, it, was, it was something which one had never imagined that a drug which has to be taken lifelong so that leukemic counts can be kept in place um, would be donated at no cost to the patient on such a large scale. So uh, this is the drug I'm talking about is Imatinib, Gleevec. Um, I, of course, am with the Max Foundation and Novartis was our uh, um, pharma donor partner. So they donated the drug to patients at no, co at no cost and the Max Foundation was invited to administer the program. Today, 20 years later, I'm seeing uh, patients who were maybe 10, 12, uh, 20, 30, 40, 60 years of age. They have lived these 20 years um, uh, if, with that extension of life, oh. great quality of life, no financial burden, no financial burden upon the patient. Um, have things become better? Um, well, there are not many uh, pharma companies that are working on access to treatment in the same manner that uh, this company, Novartis, worked all those years ago. But I think uh, the idea was seeded. And I think it's, um, it's uh, the role of the nonprofits. And I think the government also has to play a big role because it is not just the responsibility of the industry. Every, any access program has to be built on robust partnerships between stakeholders. So yes, the idea was there. It was implemented wonderfully. Uh, it was a little difficult to sustain because it is a rare cancer. But today, the Max Foundation is managing the lives of over uh, 22,000 patients who are on this drug, wow. especially just in my region, South Asia region. Uh, but... Uh, and other companies are coming to other uh, nonprofits. And I think the partnership between uh, the industry and the nonprofit is, is very, very uh, important uh, to build upon. I think it has, I think you have, um, you know, built that relationship over the last 20 years and it shows in your work also. Priyaji, any comments from your side? Yeah, I completely I agree with uh, Vijiji. And uh, so, I'm with the Nargis Dath Foundation who's worked with cancer care for the last 40 years. And in this duration of 40 years, I've seen amazing changes in India. Now, I mean, it's definitely positive that we have the best doctors, we have the best facilities. At that time, there was not even enough equipment to treat patients. But today we have well-equipped hospitals in place. Access is there for treatment. But access will only happen when there is a diagnosis. Yes. Uh, people don't have enough access to even diagnose their, uh, their condition. So, doctor, you would know that many times patients come to you at a very late stage. Yeah. So, when, you when a patient comes to you at that stage, cost of treatment of will increase threefolds maybe. And I think that is the, you know, the connect which somehow has to be made smooth. You know, whereas cancer can be detected early, treatment costs are lowered. And, uh, you know, the, and there is, uh, uh, you know, access to very good treatment in our country, you know, and people can live a very healthy life after that treatment, as Vijay just said, you know, you, she's seen people living for 20, 30 years as very normal people. And I think that is where the lacuna is. And we really need to address this issue. We and NGOs play a very key role in that. For us, we are focusing on awareness and early detection. You know, as Dr. Um, uh, Patil mentioned that the three most, um, uh, you know, prominent cancers in India is um, breast, cervical, breast, and cervical. oral. So, and 
we also know what the fears in people are. Nobody wants to come to a medical camp to get checked because the word cancer is there. So that awareness, you know, dispelling the myths of cancer is very important. Whenever we speak about cancer, we speak about cancer with a lot of fear of, you know, are kisi ko cancer ho gaya bhi bichara ye. I think we need to kind of uh, change that narrative and uh, approach cancer as any other disease, which if detected early, can be cured. People can have a good life after that. So those are the uh, challenges we face in grassroots level, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, so uh, just to you know thank you for the, for you know we, I, I am a product of Tata Memorial Hospital and really every day not a day would go by without entering your you know contribution to the hospital and uh, even now you know I I actually uh, visited Tata after a long period of for about you know seven years and uh, right. seeing the the Nazir Foundation on uh, the ICU you know sometimes it would give me chills because you know I had so many memories and uh, we. I know. And all of us are indebted to the contribution that both of you are making. I would have loved it if Dr. Ravi Kannan was here. He's another, you know, you know, totally yeah. a different uh, uh, dream of a person altogether. He would have added so much more for this conversation. Now, uh, coming to Dr. Bhavesh. Now, see, we, we are people, caregivers at almost the last mile. So, what do you think... Uh, 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 he is actually, you know, Dr. Bhavesh is actually a born and brought up Bombay guy. And he's now come with us to a nondescript <laughs> location wow. in Tamil Nadu to treat people in this region. And I'd like to ask him, you know, what are the challenges that you have as a, as a doctor? Do people listen to you? Do people even come to you? What is the challenges that you, on a daily basis, what do you feel you face here? So, thank you. Uh, I hope I'm audible. So, uh, basically, uh, it starts with uh, cancer awareness. Like most of the people don't even uh, know what is the incidence of cancer, what are the common cancers for which screening can be done and it can be detected early. So it starts from there. Then once the diagnosis is done, uh, the patients are scared. So the counseling has to be done that there is no scare if it is in the curative stage. And even if it is in the palliative stage, there are so many options which are there to keep them healthy and keep going for a number of years without any problem. So the counseling is a very important part because without counseling, they will not go to the next step, which is the treatment. Coming to the treatment part, uh, what they want is uh, it should be as uh, simple as possible and uh, it should be accessible and uh, most important, it should be affordable. So these are the three factors which comes in the treatment part. And uh, as we all know that cancer treatment doesn't stop after completing the treatment. The observation is an important part of it. The follow-up is an important part of it because on an average, when we see uh, most cancers, first two to five years are a very important part of their life where we expect that sometimes the cancer may come back. And we have to detect those cancers also early and treat them at a, uh, with a curative endpoint. So first two to five years is again uh, one motivation uh, or, or counseling which is needed so that they follow up regularly. And uh, once beyond five years, usually we expect that they are doing very good and we uh, again uh, continue the follow up, but maybe once in a year. So there are multiple steps at which uh, we do have challenges and uh, one by one we are uh, taking care of it. And uh, slowly, like uh, I would remember uh, like eight years back when I went to uh, Tangam Hospital, uh, my OPD in a month was 30 patients, 3-0. Uh, so it was as low uh, as low as like one patient in a day. And uh, now it is 300 patients, uh, crossing 300 patients in a month. So uh, slowly it is improving uh, and patients are uh, coming uh, forward. Uh, relatives are getting the patients for treatment. Many times even patients, patients were not brought to the hospital because they considered once it is cancer, they have to die. Nothing else has to be done. So uh, uh, step by step, we have seen in the last eight years, things have improved. We have tried to incorporate uh, one by one each and every modality under one roof uh, in the hospital. So the patient do not have to travel much. So again, traveling is one, one problem. But suppose if we don't have one particular modality of treatment, uh, patients have to travel. So once they start traveling, uh, they have to. They have problems of uh, living there, uh, different type of eating. They don't have home environment. 
uh, their family and social supports are cut off so uh, to see that we have all place what we avail is actually you know with all the support with you know we also have uh, uh, government funding through the through the uh, through the you know national schemes we have help from ngos like yourself you know helping us at the grassroots level we've come to a conclusion that you know it is possible to give affordable care without burning the pocket of a, a cancer patient to almost 60 to 70% of the indications that are present now you know the commonest ones like uh, uh, priya ji mentioned like you know breast cervical oral cancer you know it's not very expensive most of the, our western colleagues know they are surprised and they are astonished to see that the way the quality of work that we do the surgery that we can perform the treatment costs that we can deliver it at it is totally possible this this is what we have realized you when when we were in uh, tatas we didn't know you know what actual cost of treatment was you know that is one of the things which we never knew and the minute you get out and you're in a, working in a hospital in bombay it just shocks you like anything on what is being charged there's no equitable you know way in which cancer treatments is giving i'm sure as a foundation you would have had this problem you know the same the same for example somebody who's uh, uh, interested in caregiving the same surgery at multiple you know there are multiple options that are available for a patient to get treatment at from you know uh, some amount to 20x you know amount so coming to that what we find a big struggle here is you know cancer information before there was no internet you know there was less confusion you know we say you know internet increases access to everything you know it opens doors to even the lowest rungs of the society but what we have seen over here is that more information more confusion so i think you know even uh, uh, more than treatment i think cancer information has to be smoothened out and the people who are doing good work should be the loudest according to me uh, uh, that is one priority in which you know i feel that we have to work a lot ngos can help a lot you know and and when we came to namakal and even till now the naturopathy person in Nam- namakal district uh, sees the most cancer patients yeah then then doctors i'm not against them i'm not against natural treatments of a, of any kind but i'm telling you that is the awareness that is present at the last mile so uh, forget somebody knowing even about and imagine uh, uh, our people have not heard about imagine even now they don't realize that cml patients can live long just with one tablet a day it's it's so what is your take on cancer information both uh, priya ji vijay ji priya ji you can take it up first i think it's most important and you very rightly said there is so much confusion because when we get patients they have got all the information from the internet and in the bargain they lose so much time because they're just running health as counter so i think information is very important and that's where counseling comes comes in and you know especially of the families because the patient is in the complete disarray it's the families who are taking the decision and running uh, to one place and the other you know so i think that is uh, extremely important and uh, the dissemination of information uh, simplified you yeah. know i think people need a very simple way to learn as to what cancer is what can be done what is the treatment what's the way forward if you give them too much material they're not even going to see it so i think that has to be made very very uh, simple you know for the common man yeah people people like you and me who you know who can access so many doctors who can access so much information is fine but when people who are in the rural areas their dependence is on the local doctor or the you know the local vaid who will tell them no no i'll make you okay you know just have these medicines and you will be fine so these are the people we need to target uh vijay vijay madam you yeah, have i i agree completely uh, i also feel that uh, without uh, right to information uh, there is no uh, there is no access and i think uh, a patient has rights uh, a patient doesn't even know uh, that he or she has the right to know that uh, you know the diagnosis is a life altering life limiting disease Uh, the right to know where treatment exists the right to have uh, their voice heard and the right for access to treatment um, and not just access to treatment like uh, what priya mentioned earlier access to means to 
to access, uh, uh, to obtain that treatment. We are still fighting stigma, myths and misconceptions. These are stumbling blocks. Uh, we are, uh, it's World Cancer Day today. And the, the, the slogan is uh, close the care Cancer gap. gap. Yeah. Unless we commit ourselves to putting the patient as the focal point at the heart of everything we do, no work we do is going to be effective. So how do we get rid of stigma, information, creating knowledge? These are the tools with which we can actually face this life-limiting, life-threatening diagnosis. Insurance policy. I mean, yeah, there important. are policies, but there's such <laughs> fine print, a pre-existing condition. Yeah. And I, I especially uh, because I'm, you know, so thousands of CML <laughs> patients who are living with the disease, <laughs> they have a pre-existing condition, no yeah. policy for them. Out-of-pocket expenses yeah. are simply, Out of they, the exist, they, they destroy the families. You know, um, <laughs> This, in this program, as in many other, there are quite a few other access programs where uh, different um, companies have partnered with, with different institutions for different cancers. Uh, patients do not have the resources to come and access the drug which is given to them at no cost. I have had a patient who's supposed to have 600 mg of this imatinib a day, six little tablets, she should come to me every three months and she, so that she can get her, you know, her reapproval slip and go to a physician, get her BC Arabial done or get a normal test done and then come and collect next three months medication. She comes to me after like nine months, after a year and a half. And I tell her, Kya hua? Kaha thi itne din? you must not be taking your medicine. Ji nahi, amma ji. Main roz dawai leti hu. Main roz ek goli leti hu. She's supposed to take six, <laughs> six of those goalies. Right? <laughs> or there is a patient who tells me, Mere shohar chote bhai hain. Mere jet or sasur kaam karte hain. How can I go and ask my jet or my sasur, that is my father-in-law or my brother-in-law for money to buy a ticket to Bombay so I can come to Tata Hospital and see my doctor. But here also, the patient has a lot of self-respect. This young woman told me, if I could get her sewing machine donated, she said, Main saadi ka fall beading karke, main khud apne ticket So we have to understand that the patient yeah. is not helpless. Yeah. As, a, as somebody in charge of, you know, who, whose role is to counsel the patient, whose role is to foster good adherence behavior, good compliance, we need to understand that the patient also wants to help himself or herself. We have to put ourselves there. Yeah, so uh, excellent uh, thing. So what, uh, uh, another thing which I feel is very skewed in our country is you have a small population of uh, patients or people, you would say, who uh, go to any extent to even have an incremental advantage in their survival or something. And there is such a large population, yes. no means to even get, uh, you know, if we... If, 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 to you know access a treatment thing which is possible which will actually cure the patient you know it's so skewed and uh, and day in and day out when we see this you know i really uh, feel you know uh, sorry for the to the rest of the people you know people just for one month they would spend crores and lakhs of rupees whereas for a life they are not able to do anything so i go and take lectures actually i teach people to become entrepreneurs like doctors no we we don't know this is like, like, like NGO is an entrepreneurship mindset, you know, to go where there is nothing and make something is what uh, uh, you guys do so well. And I actually teach them to get out of your consulting room comfort or your surgery comfort and, and, and uh, try to encourage, you know, get people and uh, things done. So I give lectures. And the first thing is they ask, you know, how do we get funding? Uh, yeah. you know that's the toughest part <laughs> yeah so you know yeah. and and we have found i don't want to share it in this forum because then the, <laughs> the funding agencies will be in trouble but you know uh, i would uh, have uh, liked to get dr ravi to you know he would give information you know on how to actually access funding which is there you know it's i've heard yeah. tell me that see we have money to give, but we don't know whom to give to. Yes. They, even them, they 
they want each rupee accounted for and, uh, i'm sure all of you have the same situation so yeah, yeah. so i think what is the status of funding for such initiatives how how do you go about your daily foundation activities uh, you know how easy it is to get funds for yourself to get things done i'm sure nothing comes for for free just give your experience so funding for us is uh, has been very very difficult especially after covid you know and uh, the funding that comes for me it has been really different because of uh, too many things in the background you know earlier i was in politics so there was no funding yeah. coming in you know yes. so there has been a lot of uh, you know and now i'm completely uh, yeah so into uh, this so, so we've been really uh, working with individual funding funding you know so csr yeah. has become very difficult because uh, they want uh, you know there's a lot of criteria you know we need to kind of meet but things are happening now but i still feel funding is not as robust as it should be especially for uh, for cancer where you require that fund you know like um, uh, you know doctor earlier said that targeted therapy is not even it's not counted yeah 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 it's not and that's a li- yeah there's nothing it's only chemotherapy and you know you're covered with that even in the government schemes but today targeted therapy is like a life saving uh, situation yeah, so there is yeah, where chemo doesn't work targeted therapy will work immunotherapy will work and it's not like but it's expensive is, it's just in a yeah so so you know i mean that's where a, a kind of partnership of pharmaceutical companies Yes. Uh, uh, the government and ngos who can become the implementing uh, partner you know that kind of uh, thing has to happen when you want to look at scale otherwise as an ngo we will definitely continue to do whatever we are doing right now and more yeah. but uh, i think if you want to scale this out it has to be a partnership i think it has to be organized i, I actually very organized uh, coming to the next question actually if i can just say a little bit about uh, add to what yeah. priya has said about uh, csr donations um it, it's very very difficult you know we were we are all struggling all non profits we don't have that kind of uh, uh, expertise skills and knowledge uh, we don't have the kind of uh, resources to 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 employ people you know professional fundraisers yeah. yes scout crowd funding is there uh, and uh, we we uh, <laughs> we received donations uh, like we received we received a, a fairly large amount say Uh, on the third of March or something, and then by thirty first we have to give in a utilization certificate within <laughs> that time. Uh, how do we deal with this? Yeah, for, yeah. it's very difficult. Yeah, yeah. Seriously, what I have started is a very simple, uh, like like you said, you know, personal outreach. We put in started yeah. a a project called Chai for Cancer. We've raised in the last. This is this is the tenth year of Chai for Cancer. This is yeah, specifically it's, it's, raising funds so that I can uh, support the patients or on this on this act. this program uh, to come every four months or every three months to see their doctors to pay for their bus fare their train fare to pay for lodging to pay for their bcr abl tests to pay for the schooling of the little patients Patient. and what i do is just just tell people one cup of chai just donate one cup of chai you'll be drinking throughout the year you just donate that one put whatever value you want to put it you won't believe yeah. it in the last it's not a big amount but in 10 years i have raised like two and a half crores Ten years, Aye, okay. Wow. Yeah, it sounds a big yeah. amount, but we we all know that that is that is just not counting the number in the of chais. It's, so it's, it's so many chais. It's so many chais. It's a drop in the ocean. Yeah. No, no, but, yeah. but it's true. You know, you you drink a cup of coffee for two hundred and fifty rupees today. Yes, yeah. Yes. You know, yeah. every kid is going to uh, uh, yeah. Starbucks. I'm just here, saying, but, one yeah. cup of chai. Yeah. Just put hundred rupees into the chai for cancer account. One really, cup of chai really. once in a month, once in a year. one time just donate your cup of chai yeah. see people have to take ownership and yeah. a, a fund you know it's as as much about raising funds as creating awareness because people don't know there is this kind of need in the cancer community yeah so and uh, i'll i'll end up with one last question to bavish you know uh, sitting at the last mile we always struggle with the end of life uh, care because you know when we were in dmh the mandate was if a patient is coming from a rural area and he's got stage 4 cancer just buy him a train ticket and send him back home at the earliest because he is going to struggle here he's not going to get any benefit yeah. and it's a miserable life the last one or two years they're going to have so but these patients come to us you know 
the adr cancer hospital sense patients cmc well or in south sense yes. patients uh, yes. they all sense yes. patients there is no one taking of the, taking care of the end of yes. it and it's yeah. it's really sometimes not it's as terrible hard. until yeah. it happens to your family member yourself you don't understand yeah. the pain that the families and people you know both we talk so much about screening treatment you know when we are surgeons we treat the early cancers but the, these are the most actually if you look at the population of patients with cancer this is the largest group people it with is. cancer you know needing end of life care you know they don't want pain they want to just die yeah. pain free yes. in fact in fact we uh, you know the local moratoriums would not take a cancer patient uh, uh, you know for the last rites you know because thinking that it will spread the the, the <laughs> immunization would spread in yeah. it is so disheartening to see uh, these things so we have done a little bit uh, and uh, ravi kanan sir also is doing his bit so i wanted this question to go to him but i will end with that because we are you know okay. time and uh, i'm so glad that uh, bhavesh uh, our uh, guy could contribute something and it was wonderful listening to both of you people who are doing so much for cancer in this country because it's not just treatment alone and uh, i always tell it doesn't take an expert uh, to treat cancer it actually takes in you know, a heart to treat to treat a patient yeah. uh, of cancer and uh, you are the two biggest hearts that uh, i have come to know and we and you are still going strong thank you for your presence thank you bhavesh thank you to the organizer for giving this opportunity thank you vivek I thank you for having us thank, thank you yeah, so much thank you. thank you thank you very much echo all thank those you. feelings thank you so much and thank yes you. we miss ravi a lot today yes yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you thank you so much yeah. thank you thank you doc sab and uh, it has been uh, very uh, i would say आई ओपनिंग काइंड ऑफ थिंग और जब हम बात करते हैं कि ऑन ग्राउंड रियलिटी क्या है भाई सारी चीजें हैं लेकिन एक्सेस कितना है एंड विद दिस एक और जब हम कैंसर की बात करते हैं तो बहुत सारे लोग होते हैं इसमें इट्स अ कॉम्प्लेक्स डिसीज इट्स अ कॉम्प्लेक्स प्रोसीजर इट्स अ कॉम्प्लेक्स अवर्ड से जर्नी बहुत सारे लोग जुड़ते हैं लेकिन हर बार जो है चाहे वो फ्रेटर्निटी हो चाहे वो इंडस्ट्री हो एवरीबडी इज वर्किंग फॉर वन थिंग एंड दैट इज पेशेंट लेकिन इस जर्नी में एक ऐसा व्यक्तित्व तो होता है जो कहीं ना कहीं पीछे छूट जाता है उसको उतना क्रेडिट नहीं मिलता है हालांकि जो सारे लोग होते हैं जो जितने भी लोग कैंसर से जूझ पाते हैं लड़ पाते हैं जीत पाते हैं इट्स देखिए उनकी अपने खुद की विल पावर तो होती है लेकिन उसके अलावा उनको बहुत सारे लोगों को सपोर्ट होता है वो जो कड़ी होती है वो होती है केयर गिवर और कई बार हम जो है उनको उतना ड्यू क्रेडिट नहीं दे पाते हैं लेकिन आई थिंक ये और भी ज्यादा इम्पोर्टेंट इसलिए हो जाता है क्योंकि क्लोज क्वार्टर से जो है जब हम देखते हैं तो पेशेंट जो है खुद शायद अपने लिए कुछ नहीं कर पाता है कई बार लेकिन जो केयर गिवर्स होते हैं वो एक स्ट्रॉन्ग पिलर की तरह उनके साथ रहते हैं और जो एक्सपीरियंसेस होते हैं वो काफी सारे मतलब कई बार तो रुला देने वाले होते हैं दिल दहला देने वाले होते हैं और कई बार बहुत ज्यादा मोटिवेट कर देने वाले होते हैं आज हमारे साथ एक बहुत ही उम्दा पैनल है जिसमें मैं आगे इन्वाइट करूंगा मिस्टर रिजवान को आज एक्चुअली ये सेशन जो है यहाँ पे नवीन जी आने वाले थे ही इज आई एस एंड हेल्थ सेक्रेटरी स्पेशल हेल्थ सेक्रेटरी बट बिकॉज यू नो ही हैज सम रिचुअल एट होम फॉर हिज अंकल सो ही इज नॉट एबल टू मेक इट आउट टूडे एंड आगा अगला जो सेशन है वो मैं रिक्वेस्ट करूंगा रिजवान जी को होस्ट करने के लिए रिजवान जी जो है वो एक कैंसर केयर गिवर हैं और उनको खैर उनकी जो जर्नी है वो तो खुद बताएंगे और मैं यहाँ पे सिर्फ एक ही बात कह कहूँगा कि जैसा कि अभी डॉक्टर साहब ने बताया कि जब तक हम वो चीज एक्सपीरियंस नहीं करते हैं जब तक वो हमारे अंदर वो फीलिंग नहीं आती तब तक हमारा जो बेस्ट आउटकम है वो नहीं आता है और इट्स इट्स काइंड ऑफ सेट हिंदी में भी जैसे बोलते ना कि जाके पाव ना फटी बीवाई सो का जाने पीर पर आई मतलब जिसके कभी पैर ही ना फटे हो उसको चलने पे दर्द क्या होता है वो क्या समझ में आएगा सो विद दिस आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट रिजवान भाई टू कम ऑन यू नो स्क्रीन एंड इनवाइट दी पैनलिस्ट एंड वर्क एंड प्रोसेस दिस सेशन थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू विवेक शर्मा जी थैंक यू सो मच फॉर दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी होप आई एम ऑडेबल तो आई वुड लाइक टू इन्वाइट जो आज के हमारे जो पैनलिस्ट हैं सबसे पहले मैं इन्वाइट करना चाहूंगा मिसेज सरली मेनन मैम का जो कि एक कैंसर केयर गिवर भी हैं और साथ साथ सीईओ सेंट जूड इंडिया चाइल्ड केयर सेंटर जो मुंबई से हमारे साथ जुड़ी हैं वेलकम मैम नमस्कार गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन थैंक यू रिजवान जो दूसरे आज के हमारे जो पैनलिस्ट हैं मिस्टर संजीव शर्मा जो पेशेंट एडवोकेट हैं वेलकम संजीव जी नमस्कार आपका स्वागत है जो मुंबई से हमारे साथ जुड़े हैं 
थैंक यू रिजवान भाई और जो आज के हमारे जो तीसरे पैनलिस्ट हैं वो बहुत ही खास हैं क्योंकि वो एक एक्टिव कैंसर पेशेंट है मैं बात कर रहा हूँ श्री बिग्नेश्वर बीरेंद्र जी को जो पटना से हमारे साथ जुड़े हैं नमस्कार सर आपका स्वागत है इस पैनल डिस्कशन में थैंक यू थैंक यू रिजवान भाई गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीबडी हाँ जी तो जैसा कि विवेक जी ने बताया कि मैं एक केयर कीपर हूँ मेरी वाइफ सना जिनकी उम्र महज 32 साल थी पिछले साल उनको लंग कैंसर स्टेज फोर में डिटेक्ट हुआ काफी चैलेंजिंग जर्नी था मेरा मैं एक जॉब करता हूँ मैं प्रॉपर बिहार से हूँ गोपालगंज से और मैं भटिंडा में अभी जॉब करता हूँ एक प्राइवेट कंपनी में न्यूक्लियर फैमिली है पेरेंट्स वहाँ रहते हैं और हम एक सात साल का मेरा बेटा है और हम लोग भटिंडा में रहते हैं जॉब करते हैं बहुत सेटल्ड लाइफ है लाइफ थी इनफैक्ट वो था ना मिडिल क्लास की एक छोटी छोटी सेविंग्स छोटे छोटे अरमान जो आप लेके चलते हो और ऑल ऑफ सडन आपको पता चलता है कि आपके वाइफ को लंग कैंसर है और वो भी स्टेज फोर का खैर उस वक्त तो पता नहीं चला बट जैसी रिपोर्ट आया बायोप्सी का मैं ड्राइव कर रहा था और मैंने रुक के रिपोर्ट देखा तो उस पर कार्सिनोमा अवार्ड लिखा था बींग ए केमिकल इंजीनियर मुझे पता है कार्सिनोमा का मतलब क्या होता है सो so, एक फील हुआ कि अब लाइफ कंप्लीटली चेंज हो चुकी है ये बड़ी लड़ाई है जिसको मुझे अकेले लड़नी है सो जो केयर गिवर के पास सबसे बड़ा चैलेंज होता है कि उसे इमोशनली बहुत स्ट्रॉन्ग रहना पड़ता है क्योंकि आप पेशेंट के सामने अपने आप को ब्रोक डाउन नहीं कर सकते नहीं हो सकते क्योंकि उसका असर उसके ऊपर ज्यादा पड़ता है तो एक सबसे पहला चैलेंज होता है कि आप भी उसी फेज से होके गुजरते हो लेकिन आपको इमोशनली आपको बहुत स्ट्रॉन्ग शो करना पड़ता है दूसरा जो सबसे बड़ा चैलेंज होता है क्योंकि कहाँ ट्रीटमेंट करें आ, क्योंकि मेरे फैमिली में कोई हिस्ट्री नहीं है मुझे पता नहीं था कि कैसे क्या होता है लोगों से राय लिया तो जितने लोगों से आप राय लेते हो लोगों का नजरिया अलग अलग होता है इस हॉस्पिटल में मत जाओ यहाँ उनका इलाज चला था वो डेथ कर गए यहाँ मत जाओ नहीं नहीं वो हॉस्पिटल ठीक नहीं है तो हमें पता भी नहीं है कि कैंसर अलग अलग डिफरेंट हर किसी का डिफरेंट होता है ट्रीटमेंट मेथड डिफरेंट होता है तो एक डिफिकल्टी होती है कि ट्रीटमेंट करें कहाँ आप कन्वीनियंस देखें या बेस्ट हॉस्पिटल देखें कन्वीनियंस के लिए आसपास हॉस्पिटल्स मौजूद हैं लेकिन हो सकता है वो बेस्ट ना हो तो फिर जो मैंने डिसीजन लिया कि चलो मुंबई चलते हैं भटिंडा से काफी दूर है बट हमने कहा कि चलो चलते हैं आपका जॉब जो जो एक सिंगल अर्निंग सोर्स होता है वो कहीं ना कहीं सफर करता है आप इतनी लंबी आपको छुट्टी मिलने में दिक्कत होती है आई वॉज फॉर्चुनेट के जो मेरे इंडस्ट्री से या मेरा जो मैनेजमेंट से सपोर्ट मिला बट जो बाकी लोगों से मैं बात करता हूँ जो साथ में केयर गिवर है तो उनके साथ चैलेंज होता है कि भाई छुट्टी नहीं मिलती बार बार छुट्टी नहीं मिलती है और एल डब्ल्यू पी लीव विदाउट पे लगाते हैं तो पेमेंट नहीं आता है सैलरी कम आती है सो ये एक दूसरा चैलेंज हो जाता है जो जो तीसरा है क्योंकि आप न्यूक्लियर फैमिली में हो आपके पास आपके अलावा कोई नहीं है यू you नो know, पहले के आज से दस साल जब मेरे पेरेंट्स के जब दौर में ज्वाइंट फैमिली होती थी तो वहां रिसोर्सेज काइंड ऑफ मैन पावर के हिसाब से रिसोर्सेज अवेलेबल होते हैं लेकिन आज के दौर में नहीं है आप अकेले हो आपको जॉब भी देखना है जॉब नहीं करोगे तो पैसे नहीं आएंगे पैसे नहीं आएंगे तो ट्रीटमेंट नहीं होगा और ऊपर से अगर आपके पास बच्चा है तो उसको कहाँ छोड़ के जाए उसको कहाँ लेके जाए उसकी स्टडी को कैसे इफेक्ट होगा तो इन सारी चीजों में कहीं ना कहीं केयर गिवर जो है वो फंस के रह जाता है ठीक है तो तो इस तरह के तीसरा जो है इंश्योरेंस आपके पास अगर कहते हैं ना कि जो एक मिडिल क्लास का जो वर्किंग क्लास का आदमी है दो साल तीन साल में एक छोटा छोटा करके सेविंग करता है और जब ट्रीटमेंट की बात आती है तो वो सारी सेविंग एक साथ एक झटके में साइफन हो जाती है ना तो खैर और भी बातें होती रहेंगी तो आइए हम जो यही क्वेश्चन है मैं सबसे पहले बीरेंद्र जी से मैं रूबरू होना चाहूंगा क्योंकि देखिए कोई नहीं चाहेगा कि कैंसर से उसका सामना हो सो बीरेंद्र जी आपसे सवाल ये कि क्योंकि आप एक्टिव कैंसर पेशेंट हैं तो जब सबसे पहले जब आपको पता चला कि ये आपको कैंसर है तो आपके और आपके परिवार का जो इमोशनली चेंज हुआ वो क्या था उस एक्सपीरियंस के बारे में आप हमें बताइए देखिए रिजवान भाई सबसे पहले जो जब कैंसर डिटेक्ट हुआ सबसे पहले तो मैं ही बायोपसी की रिपोर्ट पढ़ रहा था तो आई वॉज शॉक्ट सिंपली शॉक्ट कि मैं ये रिपोर्ट पढ़ रहा हूँ मेरे तो पैर इतने कांपने लगे कि मैं कुछ बया ही नहीं कर सकता कि मैं खुद पेशेंट हूँ मेरे साथ कोई था भी नहीं मैं इंडिविजुअली गया था रिपोर्ट लाने के लिए एज ए कॉमन मैन की तरह गया था स्कूटी थी स्कूटी तो मैं छू ही नहीं पा रहा था कि मैं वो छूंगा तो मालूम चला कि एक दूसरी एक्सीडेंट हो जाएगी या कुछ और हो जाएगा बट फिर अपने आप को 10-15 मिनट 
एक जगह बैठ गया बैठने के बाद में आपने आपको फिर कहा कि नहीं चलो ये देखते हैं क्या है नहीं है उसके बाद से बहुत सारी चेंजेस आ गई हैं अभी के लाइफ में और पिछले ढाई तीन सालों में और अभी के लाइफ में पहले वाली लाइफ और अभी के लाइफ में मतलब मान के चलो कि जमीन आसमान का अंतर है ये ठीक है और जहां तक बात है कि बिल्कुल बहुत सारे लोग जो हैं कि वो अलग अलग टाइप से रिएक्ट करते हैं बहुत सारे लोग हैं जो कि पहले से ज्यादा केयरिंग हो गए हैं वो आपको ज्यादा केयर करते हैं जान गए हैं कि नहीं ही इज ए कैंसर पेशेंट तो वो ज्यादा इमोशनली और ज्यादा सपोर्ट करते हैं आपको बट कुछ ऐसे भी पीपल आपको बाहर में मिलेंगे आपके अगल बगल में नेबर मिलेंगे जो कि आपको टोटली जहां पर पहले से रिलेशन था लेकिन वो क्या है टोटली अब आपको इग्नोर करके निकलना चाहते हैं ताकि क्या है कि कहीं ऐसा तो नहीं है कि कुछ इनकी नीड हो या कुछ हेल्प करनी पड़ जाए तो ये लोग साइड हो जाते हैं बट ओवरऑल अगर मैं देखूं रिजवान भाई तो पहले से लोग ज्यादा मतलब मैं बोलूं तो इमोशनली ज्यादा अटैच हो गए हैं ज्यादा सपोर्ट करते हैं मुझे दैन की अभी पहले के लाइफ में और वो था कि चलो भाई दौड़ रहे हैं इधर से उधर अपना काम ये वो कर रहे हैं लेकिन अब लोग केयर करते हैं पूरी फैमिली जो है कि मेरी केयर करती है और मतलब थैंक टू गॉड और बहुत सारे लोग हैं संजीव जी भी इस पैनल में बैठे हुए हैं संजीव जी भी ने बहुत सपोर्ट किया है मुझे टाइम टू टाइम तो इमोशनली सर बहुत आगे निकल जाता है आदमी वो पहले वाली लाइफ नहीं रहती सर वहां बिल्कुल बिल्कुल ये जो चीजें कहा ना डेफिनेटली इमोशनली सपोर्ट एक पेशेंट के साथ सबका बना रहता है इसमें कोई डाउट नहीं है लेकिन जो सपोर्ट केयर गिवर को चाहिए ना आ, कहीं ना कहीं वो मिसिंग हो जाता है बहुत बारीक एक चीज है जो आ, मैंने महसूस किया कि जब आपके लाइफ में कैंसर नहीं होता है आप अच्छा अर्न कर रहे हो आप फाइनेंशियली बहुत स्ट्रांग हो तो लोगों का जो नजरिया है लोगों का जो अटैचमेंट है वो अलग होता है बिकॉज आई एम फाइनेंशियली स्टेबल हो सकता है मैं मुझसे किसी को जरूरत पड़े आ, किसी भी तरीके से तो लोगों का जो लगाव है वो एक अलग रहता है द तो मोमेंट आप इस तरह के चेंजेस से गुजरते हैं जहां आप एज ए केयर गिवर यू आर नो मोर ए फाइनेंशियली स्ट्रॉन्ग पर्सन आप ऑलरेडी कर्ज लेते हो जो आपकी सेविंग्स हैं वो यूज हो रही हैं सो so, मुझे जो फील होता है कि लोगों का नजरिया उसके बाद जो लोगों का बिहेवियर आपके प्रति थोड़ा चेंज होता है बहुत क्लोज वन तो नहीं लेकिन जो थोड़े डिस्टेंस के लोग हैं कहीं ना कहीं उनके नजरिए में कि ये अब एसेट नहीं रहा ये अब फोन करेगा तो क्या पता कहीं पैसे मांग ले सो uh, so, ये एक केयर गिवर को ये फेस करना पड़ता है डेफिनेटली पेशेंट के साथ तो एक सिंपैथी एक हम्बलनेस तो सबका रहता है लेकिन यस केयर गिवर को ये ट्रांजिशन uh, उसको 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 फील करना पड़ता है तो uh, बिल्कुल uh, हमारे साथ uh, शर्ली मैम मेनन मैम है मैं आपसे मैम जानना चाहूंगा कि आपके नजरिए में कैंसर केयर गिवर होने का मतलब क्या है uh, जो फर्स्ट रिएक्शन क्या होता है जब आपको पता चलता है कि यू आर ए केयर गिवर और आप अपने इस जैसे केयर गिवर के जर्नी के बारे में आपकी लर्निंग्स और फाइंडिंग्स क्या क्या थी मैम उसके बारे में थोड़ा बताइए तो आई थिंक जो पहला रिएक्शन होता है वो तो एब्सोल्यूट शॉक का होता है यू नो आई थिंक इट्स एब्सोल्यूट एब्सोल्यूट शॉक मोस्ट पीपल बिलीव दैट कैंसर कैन हैपन टू माई नेबर और माई रिलेटिव और समी एट माई वर्क प्लेस बट इट कैन हैपन टू समी इन माई फैमिली सो आई थिंक i think once uh, not only the patient even the caregiver can accept the shock and uh, uh, which may take a couple of days it may not uh, take a couple of uh, you know hours or whatever i think once you can accept the shock the initial shock that yes this is uh, there the diagnosis has happened and uh, you just need to find a way forward to uh, get the treatment and to deal with it head on i think uh that is something initially what uh, and i think a caregiver really uh is that person uh who is uh the third person in line between the patient and the doctor it's the the next person is the caregiver who really holds one of the hands of the patient and uh, uh transfers is this really really hard cancer journey i think that's how i can describe a caregiver. बिल्कुल मैम बिल्कुल सही कहा क्योंकि बोलते हैं ना कि वो सारे फैसले जो है वो केयर गिवर को लेना है डॉक्टर अगर आपको ट्रीटमेंट ऑप्शंस दे रहा है 
वो हालांकि आपको उतना टेक्निकली पता नहीं है लेकिन ऑफ कोर्स डॉक्टर अपना बेस्ट करते हैं आपके सामने ऑप्शंस रखते हैं आपको पता भी नहीं है जैसे मेरे सामने ऑप्शंस आया कि आपके आपको टारगेटेड थेरेपी मेरी वाइफ को क्रिजनी चल रहा है तो हालांकि काफी वो भी कॉस्टली है काफी कॉस्टली है थैंक गॉड के मेरे पास शुरू में इंश्योरेंस कुछ अमाउंट का था तो उसके बेसिस पे मैं हिम्मत कर पाया और इस ट्रीटमेंट मेथड को कंटिन्यू कर पाया लेकिन मैं सोचता हूं कि अगर मेरे पास मेरे पास अगर इंश्योरेंस नहीं होता तो तो मैं क्या करता मैं शायद मैं तब भी वो ट्रीटमेंट मेथड चूज करता भले ही वो यू कैन से मेरी औकात से बाहर का ट्रीटमेंट है ये प्रॉब्लम मिडिल क्लास के साथ है जो लोअर क्लास है ना उसके पास बहुत सीधा ऑप्शंस हैं कि आई कैन नॉट अफोर्ड एंड आई विल बस जो है आप कर दो जो प्रिविलेज सोसाइटी है उसके पास ऑफ कोर्स फाइनेंशियली बैकअप है सो so, उनको भी इशू नहीं है जो मिडिल क्लास जो हर जगह पिसता है ना ये यही ये बहुत बड़ी प्रॉब्लम है तो मैं भी यही मानता हूँ कि मेरे लिए चाहे वो मेरी मेरा बच्चा हो मेरे पेरेंट्स हो या मेरी वाइफ हो मुझे लगता है कि नहीं अगर डॉक्टर कह रहा है कि ये एक ट्रीटमेंट मेथड है जो कि बेस्ट है अभी के कंडीशन में भले ही मेरा उतना फाइनेंशियल कंडीशन हो या नहीं हो आ, आ, वो मिडिल क्लास कहीं ना कहीं से कुछ ना कुछ करके जमीन बेचेगा गहने बेचेगा पीएफ से पैसे निकालेगा कर्ज से लेगा लेकिन वो ट्रीटमेंट से पीछे नहीं हटेगा ये मिडिल क्लास की प्रॉब्लम है कि उन्हें लगता है कि जो बेस्ट है मैं क्यों ना लू सो सो ये एक इशू रहता है बट इसमें मैं किसी का दोष नहीं दे सकता क्योंकि डॉक्टर भी आपको बहुत क्लियरली सारे इफ एंड बर्ड्स एंड फाइनेंशियल चीजें समझा के आपको ट्रीटमेंट मेथड चूज करने के लिए बोलता है तो काफी चैलेंज होता है है ना काफी प्रेशर होता है इनफैक्ट आप ट्रीटमेंट मेथड चूज कर दे हो तो वो है प्रॉब्लम रहता है सो आगे बढ़ते हैं अगले हमारे पैनलिस्ट हैं संजीव जी उनसे मैं प्रश्न करना चाहूंगा कि कैंसर पेशेंट का जो केयर गिवर होता है वो अपने आप में काफी कॉम्प्लेक्स होता है वो वो जैसा कि हम बातचीत से समझ पा रहे हैं सो so, संजीव जी आपके हिसाब से जैसे केयर गिवर को क्या ऐसी स्ट्रेटजी अपनानी चाहिए जिससे कि उसकी जो जर्नी है वो थोड़ी आसान हो सके रिजवान भाई एंड सभी जी बिगनेस जी आप सभी लोगों ने बात किया पहला तो जो आप सभी ने बात किया मैं एक ही चीज बोलता हूं कि जब कैंसर आता है कोई भी किसी को घर में हो या गरीब हो अमीर हो या मिडिल क्लास हो वो परेशानी 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 सिंपल सा है शब्द है चाहे वो जिस तरह का लेकिन हम सब मनुष्य है और हम लोगों को लड़ना है उस चीजों से जैसे आपने बताया शनि जी ने बताया बिग्नेश जी ने बताया तो कुछ चीजें तो मैं एज ए केयर गिवर को बोलूंगा कि बहुत ज्यादा ध्यान रखने की जरूरत है जिसमें कि एक तो आज के तारीख में गूगल है तो हर चीज लोग गूगल पे जाके सर्च करते हैं और उसके हिसाब से फिर वो बहुत सारे ट्रीटमेंट में भी लगते हैं डॉक्टर से बात करते हैं ये नहीं होना चाहिए वो होना चाहिए ऐसे नहीं होना चाहिए वैसे होना चाहिए तो मैं बोलूंगा कि प्लीज जानकारी सब चीज का रखिए लेकिन भरोसा अपने डॉक्टर पे कीजिए ये मेरा सारे केयर की भर को रहेगा जो कि तो अभी तक मैं हजारों ने लाखों केयर की भर से मिल चुका हूं और मिलते ही रहता हूं हॉस्पिटल में मेंटली डिस्टर्ब होते हैं क्योंकि जैसे आपने बताया पेशेंट को तो कैंसर हो गए अब उनको ये पता है कि हमें ट्रीटमेंट होगा अब या तो क्या लाइफ में कौमा लगेंगे या फुल स्टॉप होगा उसके प्रक्रिया है वो केयर गिवर को ही करना पड़ता है डे वन से लेके जैसे आपने बनाया फंडिंग से लेके डॉक्टर से बातचीत करना सिस्टर का डांट भी कभी कभी सुन लेना बार्ड बॉय के भी लाइन में लगे हो तो आप पढ़े लिखे फिर भी वो समझाता है तेरे को समझ में नहीं आता है क्या ये सारी चीजें झेलना पड़ता है और इस चीजों को झेलते हैं तो हम एक ही चीज बताएं कि झेलना समझना सब जरूरी है लेकिन एक चीज आप सब चीज इंफॉर्मेशन सबसे लीजिए अगल बगल से मोटिवेशन लीजिए लोगों से बात कीजिए चीज के बारे में जानकारी लीजिए लेकिन पहला चीज है कि आप जो भी डॉक्टर बोले वो कीजिए ये मेरा टेक रहेगा रिजवान भाई एक ही चीज क्योंकि तो हम जो भी केयर गिवर है हम सब लोग यहाँ पे आते हैं वो ट्रीटमेंट के लिए आते हैं अगर आपका ट्रीटमेंट सही है तो सब सही है 
बाकी चीजें हो जाती है दूसरी बात है जो कि फंडिंग का बहुत सारे बात हो रहे थे वहां पर तो मुझे लगता है कि अगर फंडिंग का प्रॉब्लम सोल्व हो जाए तो जितने भी टेंशन है उसमें से 80 से 90 परसेंट चीजें खत्म हो जाएगी अग्रेड एट्टी टू नाइन्टी परसेंट खत्म हो जाएंगे टेंशन कहा होता है एक तो कैरियर की वर्ग को टेंशन एक तो पेशेंट बीमार है जब वो बीमार होते हैं चाहे जैसे भी वो बोलते हैं केमो के वजह से गुस्से आते हैं या जो भी आते हैं वो बिगनेस जी बताएंगे या कभी कभी क्या ऐसे भी गुस्से आते हैं वो निकालना उस, उसके बाद केयर गिवर पे वो सारी चीजें क्योंकि जब कोई भी पैसे केयर गिवर है और पेशेंट बाहर से आता है ट्रीटमेंट के लिए तो वहां पे पेशेंट और केयर गिवर ही रहते हैं बाकी कोई फैमिली रहता नहीं और तो सारा जो एनजाइटी है वो केयर गिवर के ऊपर ही निकाल तो उसको भी संभालना और उसके बाद आगे जैसे रिजवान जी भी बोल रहे कि आगे फंडिंग कहाँ से आएंगे कहाँ से टेस्ट होंगे कहाँ से केमो होगा चलो हमने आप क्रिजाटाइन की बात कर रहे हैं तो अगर चलो छह डोज ले लिया बाकी के डोज कहाँ से आएंगे इंश्योरेंस खत्म हो गया ये सारी चीजें तो ये सारी टेंशन तो ये सब के लिए एक ही सोल्यूशन है कि फंडिंग अगर फंडिंग कहाँ से होंगे वो चीजें अब फंडिंग के बारे में भी थोड़ा सा मैं बोल देता हूँ बीजी मैम ने भी बोला कि उन्होंने ढाई करोड़ रेज किए मैं बोलता हूँ कि अगर 250 करोड़ भी रेज कर ले उन्होंने बहुत अच्छा शब्द बोला कि अगर सागर में एक मोती की तरह ढाई करोड़ ढाई सौ करोड़ भी कर ले तो कितने लोगों को करें कितने लोगों को कितने लोगों तक हम लोग पहुंच पाएंगे तो हमेशा जहां भी हमें बोलने का मौका मिलता है मेरी बोलते हैं कि जिस तरह से गवर्नमेंट बाकी चीजों के लिए सेस लगा रहे हैं वैसे ही एक सेस कैंसर के लिए लगा दें और अगर वो उन्होंने चाह लिया तो ये जितने भी टेंशन है लोगों का वो टेंशन में 80 परसेंट वो कम कर देंगे और एक एक बात और बोलूंगा रिजवान भाई कि आज वर्ल्ड कैंसर डे है हम लोग आज कॉन्क्लेव भी कर रहे हैं उसके उपलक्ष में लेकिन मेरा ये आशा ही नहीं पूर्ण विश्वास है कि एक दिन ऐसा भी आएगा कि हम लोग साथ में बैठ के फ्री कैंसर डे भी मनाएंगे वो दिन भी आएंगे बीट्स चलिए बिल्कुल मैं आशा करता हूं कि आपका आपकी मुंह में घी शक्कर <laughs> ऐसा हमें देखने को मिले आ, आ, बिल्कुल जैसे फंड की बात की डेफिनेटली केयर गिवर के लिए फंड सबसे बड़ा हेडेक होता है आ, हमारे साथ रवि प्रकाश जी भी हैं जिनको हमने सुना और उनके वीडियो भी मैं देखता रहता हूं आ, वो काफी मुझे मोटिवेशन मिलता है उन्होंने भी लास्ट किसी फोरम पे बताया था कि झारखंड गवर्नमेंट से उन्होंने बात करके जो कैंसर के लिए जो मदद मिलता है उसको बढ़ा के कुछ आठ नौ लाख जैसा कर दिया करवा दिया या जो भी बात करके अभी भी जो क्योंकि बहुत सारे डिस्टिंग लोग बैठे हैं जो अलग अलग राज्य सरकारें जो मुहैया कराती हैं फंड वो उसमें काफी वेरिएशन है काफी अनइक्वल है वो चीजें तो कहीं ना कहीं किसी ना किसी तरीके से हमें चाहिए होगा कि जो राज्य सरकारें जो फंड दे रही हैं उसको भी मतलब थोड़ा इक्वलाइज किया जाए उसको बढ़ाया जाए ताकि हर एक स्टेट के लोग जो हैं वो एक तरह के फंड पा सके ताकि उनकी इस जर्नी में मदद मिल सके सो बिल्कुल मैं आगे बढ़ता हूं बीरेंद्र जी से अगला मैं बात करना चाहूंगा कि कैंसर के जर्नी के दौरान डेफिनेटली पेशेंट के साथ साथ फैमिली भी सफर करती है ये सब हमने देखा बात किया आपकी फैमिली ने कैसे मैनेज किया स्पेशली आपकी फैमिली उसने कैसे मैनेज किया वीरेंद्र जी देखिए रिजवान भाई सबसे पहले तो चूंकि पेशेंट भी मैं ही हूँ और केयर टेकर हमारी वाइफ हुई हमारे दो बच्चे हैं और एक मतलब तेरह चौदह साल का है एक सात आठ साल का है तो इसमें क्या है कि सबसे ज्यादा जो सफर होता है वो आपका न्यूक्लियर फैमिली के बच्चे होते हैं आई थिंक सो जो आप मान के चलो कि ठीक है जो गिवर हैं तो वो तो मान लीजिए आपका ख्याल रख रहे हैं सारा कुछ कर रहे हैं वो आपके साथ हैं बच्चे बच्चे का क्या करोगे आप उसकी स्कूलिंग उसकी ये सभी चीज चूंकि ट्रीटमेंट कोई एक दिन की ट्रीटमेंट तो होनी नहीं है आप कभी भी जाते हो कोई भी हॉस्पिटल में महीने दो महीने मैं खुद मुंबई में दो दो महीने तीन तीन महीने रहा हूं वहां पे कंटिन्यूअस उस दौरान में आपके बच्चे का क्या ना पढ़ाई हो पाएगी उसकी ना उसका केयर केयर हो पाएगा तो उसमें से क्या है ना कि अपने को जब सब जो पेशेंट है अपने आप को मतलब स्ट्रांग करके रखा हुआ है 
किसी भी हाल में मेरे चेहरे पे एक सिकन नहीं आनी चाहिए क्योंकि मेरे चेहरे पे अगर सिकन आएगी तो मेरी वाइफ जो मेरी केयर करती है सबसे पहले उसी का जो है कि मोटिवेशन और लो हो जाएगा जो प्लस मेरे अगल बगल में जो मेरे भाई बहन या जो भी मेरे सराउंडिंग्स में जो है लोग उन लोगों का आ, मतलब एनर्जी लेवल बहुत नीचे चला जाएगा मेरे बच्चों का तो मैं अपने चेहरे पर कभी भी ऐसा फीलिंग नहीं लाता हूँ अन्ना मैं सोचता हूँ कि मेरे को कुछ हुआ है इवन कि मैं पहले से ज्यादा केयरिंग हो गया हूँ अपने फैमिली के लिए अपने बच्चे के लिए अपने सारे लोगों के लिए बिकॉज क्या है कि अगर मैं स्ट्रांग नहीं रहूंगा मैं पॉजिटिव नहीं रहूंगा तो आई डोंट थिंक सो कि जो मेरे साथ में है जो मेरा ट्रीटमेंट करवा रहे हैं वहां पे आ, मतलब कि वो मोटिवेट हो पाएंगे और जहां तक आ, संजीव जी ने बताया कि एंजाइटी वगैरह की बात है तो एंजाइटी uh, होती है लेकिन वहां पे क्या है ना अपने आप को आपको uh, मतलब आगे रखना पड़ेगा कि एंजाइटी अगले को सो नहीं मैं तो खुद अर्निंग करने वाला था तो फंड का भी इंतजाम मेरे ही को करना है सारा कुछ तो मेरे को करना है बस केयर केवर तो है बस वो मेरा ध्यान रख रही हैं जैसे जैसे बता रहा हूँ वैसे वैसे वो चलती जा रही है कैसे जा रही है उसमें सबसे बड़ा चीज है अगर पेशेंट पॉजिटिव है अपने आप को पॉजिटिव रखना है कुछ नहीं सोचना है कुछ नहीं हुआ ऐसी कोई भी चीज नहीं है अभी देखो हम लोग तो कैंसर के ऊपर वर्ल्ड कैंसर डे के ऊपर हम बात कर रहे हैं ऐसा होता है कभी कभी रोड पर चलता हुआ आदमी देखते हो कि एक्सीडेंट होता है वो ऑन स्पॉट चला जाता है मेरे पास तो बहुत समय है मेरे पास तो सब कुछ है कि मैं अपना ट्रीटमेंट करा सकता हूँ ठीक हो सकता हूँ तो सबसे पहला चीज जो रिजवाइन भाई होना चाहिए वो पॉजिटिव होना चाहिए आप अगर पॉजिटिव हो बींग पेशेंट बींग पेशेंट अगर पॉजिटिव है तो होल इन्वायरमेंट आपका पॉजिटिव होगा और अगल बगल से किसी को भी कोई प्रॉब्लम नहीं होगा ना आपके बच्चे को ना आपकी वाइफ को ना ब्रदर सिस्टर किसी को भी कुछ नहीं होगी एवरीबॉडी विल बी है जी रिजवान भाई बिल्कुल बिल्कुल बहुत सही बात कही आपने लेकिन सच बोले तो अक्सर लोग यही सलाह देते हैं कि यार पॉजिटिव रहो पॉजिटिव रहो पॉजिटिव रहो लेकिन मुझे मैं एक साल से इस चीज को सफर कर रहा हूँ मुझे नहीं आता कैसे पॉजिटिव होना है <laughs> कैसे पॉजिटिव रहना है मुझे नहीं आता आप सच बोलो तो आई एम रियली स्ट्रगलिंग टू गेट पॉजिटिव क्योंकि क्या है ना कि जैसे कि वीरेंद्र जी ने भी बताया कि देखो बाकी जगह आप हार सकते हो लेकिन जब आप अपने बच्चों को टूटता हुआ या जब अपने बच्चों के साथ जब आप अपने बच्चों को देखते हो ना तो वो फिर वो अंदर से जो इमोशन काफी स्ट्रॉन्ग आपको हिट करती हैं एग्जांपल uh, के तौर पे जैसे बच्चा मेरा सात या आठ सा, सात साल का है साढ़े सात आठ साल का है तो उसको इतनी समझ है कि मम्मा को कुछ हुआ है लेकिन इतनी भी समझ नहीं है कि क्या फेस कर रहे हैं क्या हो रहा है उसको लगता है मम्मा तो ठीक है तो जो हमारे स्टैंडर्ड ऑफ लाइफ में जो गिरावट आई है या जो वो ड्यू टू द फाइनेंशियल कंस्टेंट वो जब बच्चा उस पर क्वेश्चन करता है ना तो उसका जवाब हमारे पास नहीं होता या हम क्यों नहीं घूमने जाते हम हर साल तो घूमने जाते थे हम क्यों नहीं जाते इस समर वेकेशन में हम हम लोग क्यों नहीं घूमने जा रहे हैं आपने बोला था कि हम यहाँ चलेंगे वहां चलेंगे हम कहीं क्यों नहीं जाते या जो भी एक्सपेंसेस या जो भी चीजें हैं क्योंकि आप उसको कैलकुलेटिव वो में लेके चलते हो तो जब आपका बेटा जब क्वेश्चन करता है ना तो फिर आप स्ट्रांग रह नहीं पाते तो ये सारी चीजें मिक्स चीजें चलती रहती हैं लाइफ में आ, तो मैम शर्ली मैम मैं आपसे मैम जानना चाहूंगा क्योंकि आपकी संस्था जो है वो सैकड़ों केयर गिवर को सपोर्ट करती है तो आ, उनके सामने आ, सबसे बड़ी चुनौती क्या होती है और ऐसे कौन से रिसोर्सेज थे जैसे एक रिसोर्सेज संजीव जी ने बताया फंड उसके अलावा और कौन से रिसोर्सेज अगर उन्हें प्रोवाइड हो जाते तो उनकी जर्नी जो है वो और आसान हो सकती थी शर्ली मैम थैंक यू सो आई थिंक वेन द जब पेशेंट छोटा बच्चा होता है तो आई थिंक द बर्ड इन द एंटायर बर्ड इन इज ऑन द पेरेंट्स टू एंश्योर द चाइल्ड इज कम्फर्टेबल एंड यू नो टेन टू शोल्डर द एंटायर बर्ड इन आई थिंक वॉट वी बिलीव इन सेम जूड वे वी सी चिल्ड्रेन फ्रॉम वन मंथ टिल नाउ मच ओल्डर चिल्ड्रेन पोस्ट ट्वेंटी ईयर्स इज आई थिंक द पेरेंट्स नीड टू रिमेन एंगेज वो एक खुला विंडो होता है जब कोई टाइम होता है वेदर मदर्स विल सी डाउन एंड ब्रूड और द फादर हैज नथिंग टू डू एंड सी डाउन एंड ब्रूड आई थिंक दैट्स व्हेन ऑल द थॉट्स कम इन हमारे बच्चे जो गांव में है उनका क्या हो रहा है हमारे बूढ़े माँ बाप है वो कैसे मैनेज कर रहे हैं बिकॉज दर इज लॉस ऑफ इनकम द इनकम जनरेटर इज यर लुकिंग आफ्टर द चाइल्ड हुज सो आई थिंक वी रियली uh ensure that we have a very robust uh engagement uh in senju so the parents are kept uh engaged they kept busy they also acquire and they learn a skill we have 
uh, counselors in uh, the organization at every center. So, you know, whenever they feel that positivity index is slipping down, you know, they can reach out to a counselor. Also, jo hamare centers ke, uh, settings hai, wo community style settings. Hai. To, baki bhi jo parivar rehte, unke bhi cancer se hai. So, you know, they have somebody or the other to talk to. Whether it's people from their own states, people from different states. I think wo ek joint family ho jata hai, jo abhi the missing hai or nuclear families hai. I think they acquire and they, you know, they manage to kind of get a joint family when they stay in a same center. I think that that is one the one thing that we've noticed that really, really keeps them positive. Thank you. Bilkul, uh, Bilkul Sai Ka, ma'am. आगे बढ़ते हैं क्योंकि समय भी काफी कम है हमारे पास मैं संजीव जी से बात करना चाहूंगा जो सर्वाइवर्स के रिहैबिलिटेशन के ऊपर थोड़ी रोशनी डालिए क्योंकि जब एक कैंसर के जर्नी से कोई पेशेंट गुजरता है तो डेफिनेटली वो एक तरह से आइसोलेट हो जाता है हर तरीके से सोशली इकोनॉमिकली फिजिकली वो वीक हो जाता है और फॉर्चुनेटली uh, और सौभाग्य से अब आशा करते हैं कि सबके साथ ऐसा हो अगर वो सरवाइव करते हैं तो उसके बाद उनका रिहैबिलिटेशन uh, में किस तरह के चैलेंजेस फेस uh, करने पड़ते हैं संजीव जी सो so, रिजवान भाई यहां पे दो तरह के हैं अगर एक बच्चा है तो उसका अलग होता है और जो एडल्ट हैं उनके अलग होते हैं तो हम एडल्ट का बात कर रहे हैं जैसे कि अब इंग्लिश जी भी बात कर रहे हैं तो सबसे पहले तो क्या होता है कि अगर कोई भी पेशेंट कल क्या होता है उनके पास दोनों जिम्मेदारी दोनों कंधे पे एक कंधे पे माँबाप की जिम्मेदारी होते है चूंकि माँबाप उनके पेरेंट्स जो भी है ओल्ड हो जाते हैं और एक कंधे पे बच्चे की जिम्मेदारी होती है तो दोनों लेना पड़ता है और जब कोई भी अगर हम कोई भी काम कर रहे हैं तो कैंसर का ट्रीटमेंट तो ऐसा है नहीं कि दस दिन पंद्रह दिन और एक महीने में खत्म हो जाता है मिनिमम मुझे लगता है कि चार महीने से लेके ट्रीटमेंट एक साल एक्टिव ट्रीटमेंट का बात बोल रहा हूँ अगर लुकेमिया है तो ढाई साल तक भी चलते हैं मेंटेनेंस को लेके बट एक साल दो दिन सौ का होता है जो एक साल लगभग तक होता है और एक साल कोई भी व्यक्ति अगर अपना काम छोड़ दे चाहे वो जॉब कर रहा हो या बिजनेस कर रहा हो अगर मैं बोलूं खेती भी कर रहा हो तो उसको फिर से वापस आने में जिस पे वो था वहां पे आने में उसको कम से कम मुझे लगता है तीन से चार साल लग जाए और तीन से चार साल भी लग उसके बाद भी क्या होता है कि ऐसा नहीं है कि एक बार आपका इलाज खत्म हो गया तो फिर आपको नहीं आना फिर आपको फॉलोअप में आते ही रहना फिर लगभग पांच साल तक तो कि कोई साइड लेट साइड इफेक्ट नहीं है या बीमारी में है कि नहीं वो देखने के लिए तो ये एक बहुत मुश्किल है और आ, मैं गुजारिश करूंगा यहाँ पे बहुत सारे जितने भी एनजीओ हैं कि ये एक फोकस करने की बहुत ज्यादा जरूरत है कि लोगों को ट्रीटमेंट के बाद के बाद जो उनकी दशा होती है मैंने बहुत सारे लोगों को तो देखे हैं उनके जॉब छूट जाते हैं पढ़ाई जो करता है वो वो पीछे रह जाता है ये ये मेन चीज है उसके बाद सोसाइटी का स्टिग्मा खास के जो हम कुछ पेशेंट जिनका सर्जरी होता है या जो रेटिनो ब्लास्टोमा का बच्चे हैं अगर वो कोई आ, लोगों के बीच में जाते हैं और जब उनके एक आंख में होते हैं और लोग देखते हैं तो उनके लिए बहुत मुश्किल होता है कि वहां पे सर्वाइव करना तो ऐसे बच्चों के साथ मिलकर हमें उसे प्रोत्साहन करना यहाँ पे बहुत ज्यादा इमोशनल सपोर्ट की जरूरत है उनको या आप किसी की सर्जरी हो गई है किसी के तो आप देखो बच्चे ऐसे आके शेयर करते हैं कि अगर वो वहां पे 200 लोग हैं किसी फंक्शन में भी वो गए हैं अगर किसी के शादी में भी गए हैं तो जितने लोग दुल्हे दुल्हन को नहीं देखते हैं उससे ज्यादा उसको देखते हाँ <laughs> और ये एक बहुत उनके लिए ये होता है आ, अच्छा नहीं लगता है बात अभी भी कितना भी हम बोल रहे रिजवान भाई अस्टिग्मा तो है कि हम 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 सब लोग जानते हैं कि कैंसर छुआ छूत की बीमारी नहीं है लेकिन जो जानता है वो ना अभी हमारे देश की इतनी बड़ी आबादी में मुझे नहीं लगता है कि अच्छे से कैंसर के बारे में दस परसेंट लोग भी जानते होंगे 
यहाँ जितने लोग हैं सब एक्सपर्ट हैं सब कुछ जानते हो लेकिन बाकी दस परसेंट लोग नहीं जानते लेकिन अगर मैं अपना ही बात करूं थोड़ा बहुत कैंसर के बारे में मैं जानकारी हो गई है लेकिन अगर मुझे कोई सिंपल सी चीज बोलेगा अगर टीवी के बारे में हाँ या अगर दूसरे थलेसमिया के बारे में जो की डिसऑर्डर है उसके बारे में भी जानकारी नहीं है जब लोगों को जरूरत पड़ता है इस चीज से तभी लोग जानते तो हमें सोसाइटी को भी अवेयर करने की बहुत जरूरत है लोगों तक अवेयरनेस पहुंचाने की बहुत जरूरत है चीजों का और एज ए सर्वाइवर में हम चार चीज बोलेंगे अगर बच्चे हैं तो एक तो एजुकेशन दूसरे उसके बाद एम्प्लॉयमेंट और तीसरा जो है बच्चे के लिए खास के उनके मैरिज में बहुत प्रॉब्लम होते हैं हाँ बट ऐसे भी लोग बहुत होते हैं अरे चलो नई शादी करेंगे तो भी जीलेंगे बट वो अलग बात है लेकिन कुछ बच्चे ऐसे होते हैं जो कि हमारे सामने आके बात किए हैं कि हमने क्या गुनाह किया है कि जो हमारी शादी नहीं हो सकती हम बताते हैं तो और देखा है कि अगर खास के लड़कियों में जो गांव के हैं अगर पता चले कि अगर उनको कैंसर है तो बहुत सारे लोग है जो जो कि नहीं करना लड़कों में ही होते हैं तो मुंबई में भी बहुत सारे ऐसे बच्चे हमारे हैं जो कि शादी करने के लिए कोई लड़की देने के लिए तैयार नहीं ये चीज ये ये चीज है और तीसरा है सोसाइटी का एक्सेप्टेंस ये चार चीज बहुत जरूरी है एंड इस चीजों पे काम करने की जरूरत है क्योंकि जैसे बीजी मैम या प्रिया मैम बोल रही थी ये सही बात है बीस साल पहले कुछ भी नहीं था अभी बहुत कुछ हेल्प है लोगों को लेकिन बहुत 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 ज्यादा करना अभी बाकी है क्योंकि तो ये भी चीजें बहुत जरूरी है रिजवान भाई दूसरा आप आप लोग इंश्योरेंस के बात कर रहे थे सॉरी ये थोड़ा सा अलग है लेकिन मैं बात, बात कर रहा हूँ इंश्योरेंस इंश्योरेंस का बात कर रहे थे और आयुष्मान भारत का बात कर रहे थे रवि जी ने बहुत अच्छा बोला कि हमें बहुत कम आई थिंक एक या दो जी मैम कंफर्म कर सकती है शायद सी एम एल बच्चे में एमिटेनिव जो है वो आयुष बाकी मुझे लगता है कि एक छोर के टारगेटेड थेरेपी कोई नहीं है जैसे रवि जी बोल रहे हैं कोई भी कवर नहीं है ये तो ट्रीटमेंट की बात है मैं बोलता हूं कि कोई भी इंश्योरेंस चाहे आयुष्मान भारत हो या कोई भी स्टेट का गवर्नमेंट हो या इनफेक्ट आपका जो जो आपने मेडिकल इंश्योरेंस करा के रखा है किसी उन इंश्योरेंस में डायग्नोस्टिक कवर नहीं है कोई भी इंश्योरेंस में तो हमें तो बेसिक पे शुरुआत करना चाहिए हमें ये भी बातें रखना चाहिए लोगों को एक स्टेप आगे बढ़ के कि अगर आज भी क्या लगता है कि जितने लोग मुंबई चेन्नई या कहीं बड़े बड़े सेंटर में ट्रीटमेंट कराए जाते हैं क्या कैंसर के पेशेंट इतना ही है नहीं कैंसर के पेशेंट इससे जितने हर साल रजिस्टर्ड होते हैं मुझे लगता है जब मैं गांव जाता हूं छोटे छोटे हॉस्पिटल में जाता हूं तो लगता है इससे डबल से ज्यादा है जिसकी औकात नहीं है कि वो डिस्ट्रिक्ट हॉस्पिटल तक भी पहुंच सके तो अगर डायग्नोस्टिक ही नहीं होगा उन लोगों को तो फिर कैंसर पता ही नहीं चलेगा तो रजिस्टर्ड कैसे हो चीजों तो ये चीजें भी मुझे बोलना है रिजवान भाई दो तीन चीजें हैं जो कि यहाँ पे बहुत सारे लोग हैं और ये बहुत आगे तक बात जाएगी तो हमें करना चाहिए डायग्नोस्टिक कवर करना चाहिए टारगेटेड थेरेपी कवर करना चाहिए और सरकार को मुझे लगता है ट्रीटमेंट हो कैंसर नाम हुआ ट्रीटमेंट फ्री होना चाहिए और फिर सारे एनजीओ और जितने भी वॉलेंटियर हैं और सभी लोग मिलके सिर्फ जैसे आप बोले ना कि पैसे नहीं होते हैं या आते हैं बच्चे हमें पूछते हैं कहाँ जाने हम लोग का काम फिर बचेगा आपके साथ बैठ के बातें करना इमोशनल सपोर्ट करना आपको आगे बढ़ाना जी जी तो बिल्कुल आ, आ, थोड़ा एक दो कपल ऑफ मिनट हमारे पास और हैं तो इसको मैं यूटिलाइज करना चाहूंगा सेवन मिनट अपने पास और है हाँ ओके सो मैम शर्ली मैम मैं आपसे जानना चाहूंगा पॉजिटिव uh, रहने का मूल मंत्र कैसे पॉजिटिव रहा जाए ये पर्सनली मुझे जानना है तो मैं तीनों लोग से ये जानना चाहूंगा कि कैसे पॉजिटिव रहा जाए इतने स्ट्रेस भरे माहौल में चीजें जहां कई बार राइट ट्रैक पे नहीं चलती हैं खास करके जो केयर गिवर हैं उनके एस्पेक्ट में कि व्हाट इज अ मंत्रा टू बी पॉजिटिव एंड 
to handle these sort of things ma'am there is there is absolutely no mantra it's all in the head you have to make a decision when you're faced with a role of a caregiver you don't have an option right you you have it in your mind you make a decision you stay positive because agar aap hi positive nahi honge to aap care giving kya karo you have to be positive yourself the other thing which i have realized being a caregiver is keep yourself engaged wo beech beech mein jo chote chote windows hote hain 15 minute 20 minute aadha ghanta jo windows hote hain na wahan pe wo positivity index se niche gir jata hai fir aapko motivate karke upar aa jana padta hai so i think it at the end of the day the bottom line is it's you if you decide you have to stay positive you will then work towards everything in your life to ensure that you are positive and be able to care give बिल्कुल थैंक यू शायद मुझे हेल्प मिल सके क्योंकि डेफिनेटली जब आप जॉब करते हैं और साथ साथ आपको हर तीन महीने में ट्रीटमेंट के लिए फॉलोअप के लिए जाना पड़ता है तो बहुत मुश्किल हो जाता है आप ऑर्गेनाइजेशन से छुट्टी लेना बिलीव मी जब एक साल से मैंने आज तक कोई सिक लीव नहीं लिया है मैंने जितनी भी लीव लिया है सिर्फ और सिर्फ ट्रीटमेंट के लिए लिया है मुझे फीवर होता है प्रॉब्लम्स होते हैं मैं मेडिसिन लेके अपनी एक एक छुट्टी बचाने की कोशिश करता हूँ तो ये एक बहुत बड़ा चैलेंज हो जाता है इन चीजों को मैनेज करना बिरेंद्र जी आप थोड़ा अपना आपका मूल मंत्र क्या है हाउ टू बी पॉजिटिव ये सारे सिचुएशन में देखिये रिजवान भाई ऐसा है कि जो होना था सो हो गया इसको हम लोग बैठ जाके कुछ कर तो नहीं सकते चाहे वो आ, आपकी वाइफ का रहे या हमारा रहे या किसी का रहे हम लोग बैठ जाके कुछ कर नहीं सकते तो जब जिसमें जाके कुछ कर नहीं सकते तो उसके बारे में क्या सोचना उसके तो बारे में, में तो आता है वीरेंद्र जी दिमाग नहीं तो नहीं, 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 नहीं सर यही प्रॉब्लम है अगर हम लोग इसको दिमाग से हटा दे देखिए सिंपल ट्रीटमेंट कराना है हुआ है होगा उसका ट्रीटमेंट होएगा वो ठीक होएगा कोई प्रॉब्लम नहीं है उसके लिए अब जो हो गया बैक जाकर मैं उसे कुछ कर नहीं सकता हूं तो मैं उसके बारे में क्यों सोचूं सोचने से क्या होगा रिजवान भाई आप तो होंगे ही होंगे पेशेंट के ऊपर आपके चेहरे पे एक्सप्रेशन आएगा वो मतलब वो बात नहीं रहेगी आपके चेहरे पर आपके चेहरे पर थकान या कुछ दिखेगी तो उसका असर पेशेंट पे पड़ेगा आपने तो अगर हम पॉजिटिव रहते हैं बींग पेशेंट भी पॉजिटिव रहे और आप पॉजिटिव है ठीक है हम कर क्या सकते हैं सिवाय इलाज के अलावा कोई ऑप्शन है कुछ और तो क्यों ना इसे खुशी खुशी एक्सेप्ट करें और इसके साथ आगे बढ़ें कि हाँ भाई आज है कल तो ठीक अपन होंगे ही होंगे आज नहीं तो कल ठीक होना ही होना है ऐसा कुछ थोड़ी है कि अब लोग पहले वाली बात तो रह गई नहीं है मेरा आप ये समझो मैं फार्मा से बिलोंग कर, बिलोंग करता हूँ मैं बिंग रीजनल मैनेजर हेल्थ मैनेजर तक मैं काम किया हूँ मेरा तो ये सब दिन रात का देखा हुआ और मैं तो मेरी वाइफ जो कि कुछ नहीं जानती है उनको मैं ट्रैक से बोलता जैसे कि आपको ऐसे नहीं है देखो ये जांच लिखी गई है ये जगजा लिखा गया है ये लिखा गया है वैसा लिखा गया है यहाँ जाओ वहां जाओ आज के डेट में मैंने उनको टीएमएच में इतना ना इधर उधर भेज चुका हूँ तो वो नोज सी नोज एवरीथिंग कि हाँ कहाँ पे क्या है कैसे करना है क्या प्रोसेस है इच एंड एवरीथिंग तो कहना ये है कि मैं फार्मा में रह के भी जब बोला ना मैंने की जब फार्मा में रह के तो अगले ने जब मेरे को डायग्नोज करके बोला था तो वो रिपोर्ट को बोला वीरेंद्र जी आप फार्मा में रह के आप इतनी लेट कैसे हो और और आपको जान के आश्चर्य होगा मेरे को रिपीट हुआ है आप एक बार की बात करो मेरा डायग्नोस हुआ था अक्टूबर 2020 में उसके बाद में मैंने रेडिएशन uh, वगैरह लिया एवरीथिंग वाज फाइन बट लास्ट ईयर मार्च में फिर क्या हुआ मार्च अप्रैल से मेरा भटिब्रा में वहां पे ट्यूमर uh, हुई और मेरा टोटल भटिब्रा कोलेप्स हो गया था मैं ओपीडी में गया था टीम में मेरे को डायरेक्ट उन्होंने जो है कि एडमिट uh, कर दिया तो आप ये समझो कि मैं पैरालाइज हो गया था पैरालाइज होने के बाद मैं यहाँ बैठा हुआ हूँ और बात कर रहा हूँ इस चीज को तो सर ऐसा कुछ नहीं है अपने मन से सोचना है आप कुछ नहीं कर सकते हैं सिवाय ट्रीटमेंट कराने का और खुले मन से अच्छे मन से पॉजिटिव सोच के इलाज कराइए कुछ नहीं होगा बाकी जो एवरीथिंग जो है कि अवेलेबल है बाकी जो एक, एक संजीव जी ने बहुत अच्छी बात कही है कि फंडिंग मेन टेंशन और प्रेशर जो होता है ना वो छुट्टी और फंडिंग का होता है छुट्टी का भी इशू नहीं होता अगर फंडिंग अवेलेबल हो तो 80 टू 90 परसेंट आपका इशू खत्म हो जाता है ये संजीव जी का कहना अगर गवर्नमेंट है तो अरे गवर्नमेंट की अलग अलग रहती है फॉर एग्जांपल जैसे कि बताया गया कि झारखंड में उन्होंने सात से आठ लाख रुपए का लगभग कराया बिहार में ऐसा कुछ नहीं है बिहार में मैक्सिमम सेवेंटी थाउजेंड एटी थाउजेंड जिससे ज्यादा कुछ करते नहीं वो तो आपका एक से दो कैम्प चले पीछे चला कि आपका फंड पूरा का पूरा एग्जॉस्ट हो गया है 
तो एक यूनिफॉर्म कुछ बनना चाहिए सो दैट क्या है एट लाख टेन लाख का कुछ फंड समथिंग सभी स्टेट गवर्नमेंट कवर करे और सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट को भी चाहिए ऐसा करने के लिए ऐसा नहीं है कि सिर्फ आयुष्मान भारत इसने स्पेशली एक कैंसर पेशेंट के लिए बिंग ए पेशेंट मैं रिक्वेस्ट करूंगा इस चीज को कि एक ऐसा फंड या एक समथिंग कुछ ऐसी पॉलिसी आनी चाहिए बिकॉज नाउ एडेज आने वाले समय में नंबर ऑफ पेशेंट इतने बढ़ रहे हैं इतने बढ़ रहे हैं मेरा डबल फोल्ड ट्रिपल फोल्ड में होते चले जा रहे हैं तो अगर कुछ पॉलिसीज इस टाइप से नहीं बनी और हॉस्पिटल्स वगैरह इस टाइप से सभी जगह पे नहीं आए वेल इक्विप्ड वाले तो फिर जैसे कि कोविड में सिचुएशन संभालना मुश्किल हो गया था आने वाला समय वैसा ही होगा कि आप सिचुएशन को संभाल नहीं पाओगे आज से पांच साल के बाद ओके okay, थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच बिल्कुल आई थिंक हमारे ऑडियंस जो लोग हैं उनको uh, काफी इनसाइट आइडिया मिला होगा पहली के पॉजिटिव कैसा रहना है डेफिनेटली मैं भी इसी चीज के ऊपर काम कर रहा हूं और आज के जो डिस्कशन से uh, मैं भी ये ये चीज मानता हूं कि पेशेंट तो चलो जो सफर करता ही है जो केयर गिवर है मैं मैं उसको बोलता हूँ ही इज द ऑनर ऑफ दैट डिजीज वो मालिक होता है उस, उस बीमारी का उसको वो सारी चीजें उसके ऊपर ही uh, जिम्मेदारी होती है सो so, uh, बहुत अच्छे से आज के इस डिस्कशन में uh, तीनों हमारे जो पैनलिस्ट हैं uh, इनका मैं शुक्रिया रिजवान भाई जी uh, रिजवान भाई लास्ट एक बोल देता हूँ कि इतनी सारी जो चीजें होते रहती है कि एक कैंसर होने के आप केयर गिवर होने से पहले कोई तो एक पल होगा जो आपकी जिंदगी में सबसे खूबसूरत होगा <laughs> exactly. तो जब भी ऐसे परेशानी आए ना जब भी कभी भी दिन रात चौबीस घंटा में कभी भी आंख बंद कीजिए और उस जो खूबसूरत पल था उसको याद कीजिए बिल्कुल ये मन इसके ऊपर मैं काम करूंगा थैंक यू सो मच भाई बस इसके याद कीजिए बाकी सब सही हो जाएगा बिल्कुल बिल्कुल सो थैंक यू सो मच फॉर दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी थैंक यू आवर पैनलिस्ट फॉर दिस नाइस डिस्कशन ओवर टू यू विवेक जी थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच रिजवान भाई और इतना मतलब अच्छा डिस्कशन था और ये सारी जो बातें निकल कर आई हैं या अमूमन जो है लोग बात नहीं करते हैं और इस इन बातों का हम श्योर बहुत अच्छा और बहुत गहरा प्रभाव पड़ेगा हम सारे लोगों पे एंड जो नेक्स्ट सेशन है वो है अबाउट कैंसर रिसर्च एंड रिसर्च फंडिंग बिकॉज रिसर्च जो है वही जो है नई दवाइयाँ और नए तरीके नए मेथड्स जो है लेकर आते हैं जिससे हमारी लाइफ जो है कैंसर पेशेंट्स की लाइफ जो है काफी बेहतर बनती है एंड विदाउट वेस्टिंग एनी टाइम आई वुड लाइक टू इनवाइट दी पोस्टर बॉय ऑफ टूडेज कैंसर रिसर्च इन इंडिया डॉक्टर विजय पाटिल इन्होंने बहुत सारा रिसर्च करा और बहुत सारे uh, ऐसे भी काम करे हैं आई एम श्योर जो लोगों की लाइफ को डायरेक्टली इनडायरेक्टली प्रभावित करते हैं एंड डॉक्टर साहब के साथ में जुड़ने वाले हैं बहुत सारे पैनलिस्ट जो काफी सीनियर हैं डॉक्टर साहब वेलकम एंड रिक्वेस्टेड टू प्रोसीड थैंक यू विवेक सो आई जस्ट शेयर माय स्क्रीन ओके सो आज हम डिस्कस करेंगे कैंसर रिसर्च एंड रिसर्च फंडिंग के बारे में एंड टू डिस्कस दिस आज हमारे पास काफी एमिनेंट लोग हैं। फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई वुड लाइक टू इनवाइट डॉक्टर राकेश जलाली सर सर इज वन ऑफ द मोस्ट वेल नोन रेडिएशन ऑनकोलॉजिस्ट नॉट ओनली इन द कंट्री बट ग्लोबली ही इज अथॉरिटी इन सी एन एस ट्यूमर्स एंड ही लीड्स द अपोलो प्रोटोन कैंसर सेंटर तो जलाली सर वेलकम थैंक यू नेक्स्ट इज माई फ्रेंड डॉक्टर शांतम चक्रवर्ती आई हैव हार्डली सीन एनी वन हु इज एज इंटेलिजेंट एज शांतम बी इट पेशेंट केयर बी इट statistics with understanding of the issues so welcome shantam shantam is a senior radiation oncologist from tmc kolkata thank you vijay uh, next is dr shevanti lime uh, madam has finished her training from us and after that she has been working in india in mumbai since last 10 years has a wealthy uh, uh, experience in research and even in practice and she is one of the very eminent molecular oncologist of Uh, the country uh, so welcome dr shivanti ma'am and uh, the last is a dear friend of mine dr venkat radha krishnan dr venkat radha krishnan has done a lot of research in pediatric cancers one of the highest publications in pediatric cancers come from india and that's frankly contributed by uh, dr venkat after dr samir bakshi so uh, welcome venkat and he is the head of the department of the cancer institute at and medical oncology department thank you dr vijay yeah so with that uh, we'll start the session and uh, i have put questions which are fundamentally which most of us uh, discuss 
uh, very in very few limited meetings we discuss about these issues. But there are today we have people from government background, funding background, your patient advocacy group. So let's hope that something comes out of it. So the disclaimer would be that all discussions today are related to investigative initiated trials and not related to pharma research. So for the understanding of the, all of the people who are hearing, Venkat, can you tell us the differentiation between pharma and investigative initiated trial and why investigative initiated trial are important? Uh, as the name suggests, uh, Dr. Vijay, investigative initiated trials are initiated uh, by individuals uh, for uh, doing research. Unlike pharma, these trials are not for regulatory approval. That is, they are not for selling a drug, new drug, or marketing a new drug. They are more for uh, understanding science or getting to know about something new. So an investigatory initiative trial cannot be used to sell, uh, you know, to get approval by the government of India or to get uh, uh, sell the drug in the market, unlike a pharma-initiated trial. These are, this can be done by individuals, even in small hospitals. You don't have to be in an academic center. You can be in a corporate hospital and do an investigator initiated trial. Uh, what is the difference in funding between a pharma initiated trial and investigative initiated? How does investigative so, trial so get funding? Pharma initiated trial, the funding is provided by the sponsor, where which is typically the pharma company. They have, they are business organizations, so they have the money to fund the trial. Whereas investigatory initiative trial uh, funding can be through various sources. It can be in the organization you're working, like where Cancer Institute or Tata Memorial. It can be from uh, philanthropic donors. Uh, yeah. It can be through government funding through you know DBT schemes or DST schemes. So uh, there are various uh, sources of funding for investigatory initiative trials. But pharma is by the company or it's a business who is uh, doing the study. So uh, I'll come to Shantam. Shantam. Why do you think when already pharma is doing research or uh, these giants are doing research, why do we why do we need investigative initiated research? So the primary reason why investigative initiated trials is required is because these trials are actually done by people who are in the front lines. Most importantly, pharma sponsored research is necessarily and always motivated by drug development in a particular area. The primary motivation of the pharmaceutical company is to generate profit for its shareholders. It has no allegiance to patient care. On the other hand, investigators who will be primarily clinicians have allegiance primarily to patient care. And that is why it is well known that pharma sponsored trials are classically going to be the positive trials. They will often be uh, designed in such a manner that the results turn positive. Investigator initiated trials, on the other hand, will look at results which are clinically meaningful, which will probably result in outcomes that really matter to the patient. And in this area, I think uh, pharmaceutical sponsored trials can never come in. There is also another area that not all cancer care is pharmaceuticals, right? I am a radiation oncologist and radiation oncology trials and even surgical oncology trials cannot be industry driven with a few exceptions. And here majority of the research and the advancement is actually driven by uh, dedicated clinicians, dedicated clinician scientists who are actually interested in making the lives of their patients better. Okay. Uh, th th that's a good point, Shantam. Uh, so coming to Jalali sir, sir, basic question. There are many patients hearing it. Do we need a research or we don't need research at all? Because whenever you talk to patient about research, it is a kind of a negative perception in, uh, in patient population that, okay, uh, research means, oh, they are going to use us like guinea pig. Or this, this is a common perception, even though patient doesn't tell us. So why is research necessary? A very good question, Vijay. And uh, it also reflects the societal pattern of a particular region and especially in lower income countries, including in India. But research is absolutely critical because we don't need to you know, reinvent the wheel. Any medical advance uh, uh, can come only from study. Research does not necessarily mean always a phase three randomized trial. It can be a simple outcome study. It can be a retrospective study, but properly designed, statistically powered. And uh, when any intervention, whether it is investigated, initiated, and uh, as many people said, instead of pharma, we should probably use the word industry because industry is there as well. And the third point, which I also you should be the multicentric cooperative studies. So there are seven, I, I actually put three buckets of the research. One is investigate initiated, 
one is industry purely sponsored and third is for example a very big breast trial which may be externally supported partly by industry partly by industry. it can be a DORTC study it can be an NRG study it can be an icon study it can be the pediatric hematology oncology the inbox study so those also should be borne in mind but the fundamental question is and we have written about it actually in JAMA a few years ago why research is important now in our country actually people like you me Venkat Shantan everyone we are in a very unenviable position. We are in a very difficult position. We have this optimal balance of doing just simple practice because of the sheer number of patients that we see uh, is enormous. And also the resources are relatively limited. And then as you rightly said, the environment is not conducive for research, both from the hospitals or the centers that we work in, and also the patient and caregiver and advocacy groups as well. On the other hand, many of us feel so conscious that we have such a large number of patients, you have the right expertise. It is a matter of putting things together and you can generate world-class data like some of you have already demonstrated. So how to achieve this balance is the challenge that we have in our country and we can talk about it. But fundamentally, research helps us to further advance and it can be a simple research uh, it can be just, for example, you have shown that low dose immunotherapy. Now, no pharma study is going to sponsor that study. Epidemiological study, patient reported outcome study, quality of life study, demographic study, molecular genetic study. These are all very relevant research because you need to know the milieu of your patient population. And that is very important. Very important point, which Van Kurt will actually bear with me, is the percentage of abandonment. There's a huge number of patients in our country, especially pediatric adults, but also in adults where there's an abandonment. There has been tons of data, including coming from our own country. Whenever you put the patients in clinical trials, it may not be like the most elegant research study, but you have the ways. There is a trial coordinator. You get the medical social worker involved. There is a follow-up there, whether it is virtual, whether it is actual, physical and there is a percentage of uh, abandonment has reduced dramatically when you put them in the clinical trials. There is also tons of evidence also available that when patients are in clinical trials, their outcome seems to be slightly better than as compared to the general public. So every single factor actually is in favor of research. Fortunately, in my own uh, career in the last 20, 30 years, I have seen a dramatic change in the receptivity of people and patient advocates also towards research. While there are still some hurdles on it, but it is all of us, it's our unanimous duty to overcome these hurdles and try to be, try to engage people and communities into appropriate your own environmental-based research so that we can cater to our patient populations. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So the, the, what, what we wanted to make a point here is that research is absolutely important. Uh, without research, we cannot have development and outcomes. That, our outcomes won't improve. We would be just they're decades behind if you don't do research and just do clinical practice. Now, let's when you talk about research, one of the main thing and the challenge in India, it's funding. And I'll, I'll ask this question to each one of you. Do you ever get it easy, easy? And if you get it, all, all component, components accounted for, like adverse event management and composition. And I'll start from Dr. Venkat. We'll then go to Dr. Shantam and last to Dr. Jalali for the final verse. So, Dr. Venkat. Funding is difficult. It's like the Aladdin slam. So I sometimes I don't even think about applying for funding. I try to do things which are available within the hospital standard of care studies, which can be paid by your Ayushman Bharat or uh, this thing. Because sometimes you might end up waiting five, six years for funding and your idea becomes obsolete. Yes, there are some funding which can occur, which comes very quickly, especially uh, from professional organizations like ASCO, ASH, but they're not enough to cover all your um, uh, spending. So the first thing before you, you might have a grand idea, but you have to think how you're going to pay for it. If it's go, if it's uh, too much, then I don't think so you should jump into it without uh, trying to arrange for funding. So that, that's what I would say. It's not easy. It's very difficult. Okay. One question. Out of 10 proposals you put, how many you get funding for? One. One. Okay. Okay. And uh, how many, how much funding has come from ICMR or DBT, DST up till now? How many projects? 
So none from my uh, none of my projects, but what, as part of a collaborative icicle, we got uh, okay. funding from one of the government agency, which was again removed after one year. They yeah. promised for three years, we got for one year only. So okay. I don't know the name of the agency. Okay, Shantam. Yeah, I agree. Funding is a huge challenge for us. Speaking speaking from practical experience, I have uh, sort of submitted two grant proposals which came through in DBT and ICMR. The DBT one was for a device development. It was something that I submitted before in the COVID. The funding was approved. I am still waiting for the funding to arrive. So that's a huge thing. Even if the funding is approved, the, the time it takes for the money to come is abysmally pathetic. The other trial that is ICMR trial actually did not fund for a required investigation in the trial, which was really surprising considering the reviewers actually insisted to introduce that investigation into the clinical trial protocol. And subsequently the uh, funding agency decided not to fund for it. So that was really amazing. So definitely if you ask the question whether every component is accountable, this is certainly not. It means uh, clinical trials in India run on shoestring budget. And uh, I'm happy to share that uh, just Yesterday, we went through an IRB proposal where we will be conducting a small survey to actually understand the ground realities of this funding in a little bit better manner. Uh, but I, I am pretty sure about the results. Uh, if we look at the available data from one publication which was done uh, five, six years ago by Dandona et al., uh, I calculated per trial research funding comes out to around the 10 lakhs or 15 lakhs on average, which is, which is nothing when you compare it to the actual cost of running a clinical trial. So I'm pretty sure the vast majority of the people who are actually running clinical trials are doing it simply on the basis of the funds which are available from external sources. Jalalisa? Funding is a huge issue as rightly said. However, I'm not so pessimistic though. There are various ways you can do it. Uh, there are essentially four or five sources of funding. One is the institutional funding. In Tata Memorial Centers, of course, we are hugely benefited by the DAE Research Fund and all of us have benefited from that. Uh, sometimes it is harder because it is quite competitive. But you also should look at the type of funding that we apply for. If it is an institutional drug, then obviously it is difficult. But you should also look at uh, collecting two or three trials and getting a human resource. One of the issues in the trial running is just getting a data manager or getting a statistician on board or getting the follow-ups directly done. So that is one part. The ICMR, DBT, DST, and so on and so forth, absolutely correct, absolutely difficult, almost never we have managed from the clinical oncology perspective. But the problem is that these are essentially only funding agencies for our, whatever basic and translational scientists are there in the country. So it is not impossible to do it. Uh, in fact, I have been on the committees a few times on DBT, and it has been always said that we lack, we hardly get any quality clinical trials, and they would love to uh, fund it, although our experience is slightly different. My advice is to make, uh, Vijay, I love your slides always when you talk about it, write the find the right people. So if you make friends with the totally aligned, but do put some basic and translational aspect uh, there will be some better funding. It may not be consistently, but at least the seed money and some aspect could be done. Now, we are handicapped in India, for example, taking this example of North America, where the AACR, the basic science research uh, from the institution, from the national capital, but also the individual hospitals like Memorial or MD Anderson or Duke and so on and so forth. But the National Cancer Institutes have the basic fundamental funding from the NCI, but also the clinical research is conducted by the several cooperative groups like NRG and so on and so forth. That we lack in India. So the government funding is not there for the clinical trials and clinical research. There could be a basic and translational research. So it is the onus is on clinicians like us while we spend some time on it. But if we can do, like we do patient advocacy, we must also do a clinical trial advocacy and try to extract some money from the government on that. The third source of funding is philanthropy which we have not tapped so well in India. And there are obvious reasons because whenever you go to research and this is a perfect platform because we have very passionate and uh, dynamic patient advocates and our humble plea to them is to also try to motivate the philanthropic concept, not only to put 
uh, they will say, okay, I will take care of 15 children with, with whatever cancer or leukemias. But if we are smart enough and put them in the clinical trial, it can be a prospective database, which is fine and looking at a relatively simple research question, they would not mind. And that can be done. And I can give you an example, Venkatraman would agree with me, what a marvelous support we had from Vinay Jain's GPA Foundation. So they did fund clinical trials, but for a decade, they funded three or four human resources to every cancer center in the country. And I myself in neuro-oncology, we were benefited from it. The key, however, is also to show to them we are using yeah. those resources optimally. So proper presentations, timely publications, making an effort and show will attract the funding. And lastly, we should not dismiss pharma and industry like that. You have to be smart to use that money also to train your human resource, to go to that clinical trial methodology, how to pass the IRB, because they are voluminous consent forms that it's a very good learning process. I always tell them, uh, all my younger colleagues is that be smart, take three or four buckets, it could be one third, one third, one third, or it could be 50% investigation, 25% large cooperative group where your external, where your name may come in a footprint, but it doesn't matter as long as it just comes in a major journal and you will fortunately attract then philanthropy and other sources and also uh, look at the patient advocacy and, and, and industry also smartly because they will fund you at least the human resource. I agree with you, sir. Most of us would be doing that. We have some pharma resource and the pharma resource we try to manage the other trial also. We pull in resource between two or three trials and try to manage. My, 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 my humble request to ICMR is, ICMR somehow keeps coming through these adventurous guidelines for clinical trial research. And they would talk about very heavy adverse event management uh, uh, utilities, compensation laws, which are actually applicable to uh, pharma studies, but these would get applicable to investigate injured trials. I'm okay with this, but when you get funding from ICMR itself, ICMR doesn't pay for the compensation laws. I don't know what kind of body we are. We make the laws, but we say that we are not going to fund for it, which actually difficult, defeats the purpose of making the law. It actually hampers doing any research. The second thing which you point out is very nice, uh, philanthropy. In fact, the low dose uh, trial was uh, uh, supported by one such philanthropic organization run by one of the patients. And I've learned it from you, from the Brain Tumor Foundation of India. In fact, I have been recipient of more funds from Tata than more than Tata have received it from the Brain Tumor Foundation of India. So I think it's important that we tap this. Another important source which we don't tap according to me is the CSR fund the corporate social responsibility fund. Somehow these funds, uh, they get activated somewhere around February and March when the year is going to end. And they end up like we will support for this many patients for this many nutrition or this many uh, robotic procedure. I think we need to be smart enough to see that this fund actually is utilized for studies because the, the, then that fund doesn't touch 15 or 20 patients, but it touches at least 2,000 or 3,000 of the patients. With that, we move to the next uh, things. Sources of research funding, we won't discuss that. Dr. Jalali Sar has nicely put up what sources we have. Now, institutional fund is an important fund and all three of, uh, all four of us have been work, worked in institute. Some of us are still working in institute. Is it true that if you have ICML fund, DBT fund or DST fund, they, these are issued by a few institutes, not all institutes receive it. And let's have frank answers. And I'll start here from Jalali Sir. Absolutely right. I mean, there is an inherent bias in it. I have now working in five years in the private corporate structure. And uh, although we have done in our own humble manner, right from day one, we have a clinical research secretariat. We have seen ongoing clinical trials, 12 or 13 are investigated and four are industry sponsored. And uh, we have now made a central research unit from the Proton Cancer Center. It's called Proxy Ready Research Unit. But we have tried to fund, even COVID time, Apollo tried to fund, and absolutely right, there was a barrier. This barrier of a certain institute, I'm giving you the point of private versus corporate versus government. But within the government also, there are biases, and it is universal. You can't help it. It comes from a major premier institute versus a small university hospital in the US or Europe would be the same. I would also go one step further. 
it also is driven by the branch. Now, for example, current flavor is immuno-oncology or CAR T cell therapy. It is obviously much easier to do that rather than you will tell someone, uh, okay, I'm going to do a phase one, just an exploratory drug trial based on some completely different subject. So that also has to be done. But at the same time, these are the nuances of research. And I always believe timing is critical. What trial to do when also uh, is important from the smartness. There are supposedly objective criteria. They are supposed to be blinded. The institution's names and the investigative names are not supposed to be seen on the, by the referees. Uh, 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 and I, I, I mean, we are a public forum, so I probably it is done fairly, but you do get this sense, frankly, that sometimes uh, they are not so objective as one would hope for. But I feel it is getting better. As I said, I'm more optimistic in that as every year, every five years, every 10 years, especially in oncology, with the global kind of power that we have generated with the clinical trials and, the, and several of them practice changing, the whole world, and including the Indian funding agency, will have to look, uh, look very carefully before awarding. In the past, it was almost impossible to get such kind of funding. So while there are certainly all those four points are absolutely right, the branches, the clinical science, or the, the topical flavor of the season or of the year, but I think it will get a little bit better over a period of time, hopefully. Shantam, uh, do you think radiation oncology trials are not easily funded? Yes, of course. Radiation <laughs> oncology trials are immensely challenging to get fundings for. As Dr. Jalali has mentioned, it is really problematic. Means if you want to do a pure clinical oncology trial where radiation is one of the major components, uh, like we are planning a prophylactic parabolic radiation trial, we got a funding of around 35 lakhs. At the basic minimum, uh, proper funding for this trial would cost us in the very minimum around two to three crores to run. This is excluding the cost of any kind of equipment purchase because no equipment purchase is being planned. Okay. But on a proper scale, if you want to plan this and have funding for everything, including adverse effects, compensation for injuries as per requirement, it's nearly impossible to conduct. So definitely the uh, radiation oncology faces a huge challenge in funding. And this is not only true for India, this is actually true globally. And the share of pie for radiation oncology research is shrinking as the decades pass. And uh, unfortunately, currently, as per the recent, I believe there was a publication in JAMA, which showed uh, the overall global radiation oncology research accounts for around only 5% of the total research funding available. Venkat, I have a slightly different question for you. My question is, uh, for doing a trial, for doing an investigative, do you get paid? No, oh, I don't get paid. No, this th is the important point I wanted to brought about. Like Dr. Shantam pointed out, Dr. Jalali pointed out, Dr. Venkat is also pointing this out. In India, to do research, investigator initiated research, there are no, what you could say, incentives except that it is for the helping of the patient. And because there are patient adversity groups, I actually wanted to bring this point out that neither of the investigators nor the institute gets paid for doing this research. This research is done completely with the, uh, with what you say, bhavna in Hindi, that yes, we want to do something better for the patients and doing this research will lead to an improvement in, uh, uh, in our patient uh, outcomes. We move on to the next uh, okay now th this this things we have actually discussed ye, ki when we get funding from the government uh, this funding suddenly gets curtailed so my question is when you get this such fundings get curtailed i'll actually share my experience i was uh, for reverse swing we had got icmr funding and during covid it suddenly got curtailed but there were patients who were taking my bend as well and i had to pay 1.5 lakhs nearly from my pocket uh, to get that mabendazole because patients were doing well and we couldn't do anything. But this was mabendazole, so I could manage. My question is, uh, what you would do if suddenly the funding gets cut and how it throws off the uh, research completely out of the When cut will start from you this time. Uh, it happened to us uh, at a lot of other centers in the ICL trial when ICMR suddenly withdrew the funding. 
and we are left with data managers whom we couldn't pay and we, it was really a struggle and we had to approach donors NGOs I had to beg and plead with my hospital admin saying that we can't abandon our patients we can't abandon the try and uh, then I had some donor who gave me money and my hospital was uh, thankfully willing to support the funding so we ended up uh, taking over what ICMR had to do but it wasn't easy for everybody it was stressful for all of us uh, so yes uh, <laughs> I hope it shouldn't happen to anybody uh, Shantam this is the question to, to you also if we don't have fundings and I remember that we get calls from ICMR uh, each year don't you think it's better that we complete the research for which we had promised funding than asking for calls each year yeah I completely agree with you Vijay uh, funding being made available for a trial and then being withdrawn is actually criminal, I would say. It is unethical because it's at the end, the clinical trials are being done on human subjects. And people who are consenting have consented for a treatment or an intervention, thinking that this would be provided. If the funding agency is not capable of supporting this trial in the long run, it should not make commitments for that. So what you would advise, because uh, all, out of all four of us, you are the one who have sat on this committee the most. Keep, what would, should be our advice to ICMR or DVST regarding these things? Because this is a problem and year and after year, I know colleagues who, in which the funding suddenly gets dropped, the PhD fellows, uh, money cannot be given. You have already ordered the reagent, but you cannot process with the experiment. This is what happens on the biological side. Clinician side, it is disaster because patients are already on the treatment and suddenly the drug disappears. Then there is, it's it's a big loss of face for for the uh, for the doctor and and overall for the uh, community to say to talk about research. Uh, are you asking me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. To you. No, it is very sad. I have experienced myself, and this cannot happen. And... Shant is actually uh, absolutely right. It is unethical to let it happen. Uh, from every any parameter, any yards to take, it cannot happen. And as you rightly said, I have colleagues from Indian Institute of Science, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. You know, the senior research fellows or the junior research fellows, all of us know the meager salaries that they have. And they don't have any external source. And suddenly the salaries are not happening for months. And they are tenure posts. They are not like a full loan post. And they are uh, only for uh, two years or three years and then have to reapply. That is why, sadly, actually, we are losing some of the great talent to industry. Because including, we were always thinking clinical scientists, but also the basic scientists. And uh, uh, all of us know, you know, even the recent advances, people are setting up their own companies. And this is very sad, cannot happen. Now, this happens sometimes in the West also, by the way. And what BEST has done are two things. One is empowered as compared to slightly here, where we tend to apply as an institute. For example, you are applying from Hinduja or Tata Memorial or TNC, Kolkata, even if you are the PI. There, the PI is the king in the, in the West. So the PI can actually hire and fire, and they have to manage the funding, and they have to do it on a budget on a year-to-year -year basis. So it has its pros and cons. It has the advantage that they always have a backup plan. They don't depend on one source only. But then sometimes, unfortunately, they get empowered too. And there is this policy of perish or publish, which actually uh, is sometimes good because you publish a lot of data and a lot of papers, but actually the knowledge is very little and all of us know the stories that I'm talking about. However, the point I would like to make, which West has done, and we probably should do it in India too, is to engage patient advocacy right in the beginning in the clinical trials. There is a provision of most of the clinical trials and there is always a patient advocate on the IRB anyway, but we are going different way. Instead of the patient advocate on the ethics committee, we get the patient advocate as a co-investigator. It can be either a one patient advocate or it can be a group. It can be, and we, we talk about say lung cancer, so the lung cancer charity or Brain tumor, which is the brain tumor charity. So, uh, and obviously, uh, again, has to be prominent people. But unfortunately, if I may stick my neck out, in general, the research in the present regimen for the last 10, 15 years of the government has been on the downhill. Down and I hear it all the time. 
from the directors of IITs. We had recently IIT Kanpur folks coming here to Chennai. And they were lamenting the fact as well, dwindling. It should increase, actually. It is dwindling. So I think as a unanimous whole scientific community, not only the oncology community, the whole scientific community backed by patient advocates, we have to almost start a revolution, if I may use the word, for the next five to 10 years. We owe it to our PhD scholars and our research fellows and hardworking people and ultimately helps the patient and the science to engage them in the clinical trials so that these things are do not happen or happen at a very small rate. Okay. Okay, so what could be the solutions if you are to do one? Venkat actually spoke about this. When studies with multiple standards of care, comparing two standards of care, using government and insurance involvement in the standard of care. Now, so what? So, and I'll to Shantam. Shantam, do you think we should have some area of oncology which are labeled as studies of public importance or trials of public importance, which should be preferentially funded by the government? And uh, accordingly, uh, we could run a collaborative research on them. And do we? Do you think, uh, because we're uh, short on time, uh, do you think we need alternative guidelines for investigating initiative research so that we don't have, uh, we have a control over the quality, but we don't have so many riders coming in between that there are so many barriers that most of the people in the institute don't want to do research? You're correct, Vijay. But I personally think uh, in order for a clinical trial to be robust, it is important that the regulatory process is not diluted. If you have situations where investigator initiated trials are judged on a different yardstick, the scientific value of that research also gets diluted. So I completely do not agree with the fact that we should have limited regulation. What we need is facilitation of the regulation. Yeah. We need to have a scenario where the clinical trial organization, the funding organization understands that this kind of regulation is being mandated by the law. So this kind is a required funding that needs to be provided. Compensation has to be provided for and insurance should be provided from ICMR. As soon as the clinical trial is funded, it should not be the responsibility of the investigator to go hunt for insurance quotes from different places. A central insurance for all clinical trials in India would go a long way in doing this thing. Uh, regarding your uh, the previous question regarding areas of need, I believe already ICMR DBT regularly come out with calls for proposals which are targeted to areas of need. They ask for uh, proposals in head neck cancer. They ask for proposals in cervical cancer. But unfortunately, uh, I, it may be my lack of knowledge, but uh, the output of all those years of funding in clinical trials, which has actually made a difference is nowhere to be seen, I believe. I would agree with you. Somehow, I've always seen that the trials which don't get funded, they do a much better job in terms of output than those trials which get funded. <laughs> it has to do with probably the motivation of the yeah. investigator. The yeah, investigation who is doing the trial without funding is actually yeah. much, much more motivated <laughs> yeah. than the investigator who is doing it. <laughs> Venkat, uh, your opinion, and, the, and then we'll have the last word from Dr. Jalalist. The solutions I've, all, I've discussed a lot of them previously is that the admin and the senior people should understand that it's research which is going to make our people better. And we have to have research in our country and not just copy what is being done in the West, uh, you know, Europe and USA. If they start understanding and don't penalize people for doing research, don't say that people who are doing research they have a lot of time in their hand. They don't see patients and they're doing for a glory of publication. So those are very hurtful things which we, I as a researchers have to pay. And you see, is it really worth it, you know, after putting all your efforts uh, still to be told that, you know, this is being just done for personal gains or, you know, or you don't want to work. Actually, you work more when you're doing research. Correct. I, I remember Dr. Jalali's statement and Dr. Kumar, sir, if he has joined, uh, he always told me that in government institute, research cannot be done between nine to five. You have to spend time after five. You have to spend your time on your weekends. You have to spend your time on public holidays to do research in government institutes. In the, not only government, basically corporate or any institute, you have to because you, uh, because of the sheer number of patients which we have, we have to focus first on a clinical practice and then shift the gears to clinical research. So it actually is an added uh, a lot of burden. I wouldn't just say added a lot of burden on uh, investigators. And uh, the least thing which we can do is actually. Fail not to torment them with this. So, final words from you. 
I think most of them have been uh, covered quite well. Just a couple of points uh, taking from Venkat. Uh, just to give him some solace, we actually did a small survey. Dr. Cruz led it. Feared that in Data Hospital, the busiest clinicians had the maximum research output. So it is time, it has been shown many times. If you remember, many of you, there was a time in NHS and many other places where there was a constant clinician <laughs> scientists and they had protected research time. And that project that actually, uh, that model has miserably failed because they were neither doing this nor that and that didn't work very well. So ultimately, you still have to do clinical practice, but augment the poor guy, the clinician with the infrastructure, not to have this hassle of compensations, SAEs, IRB proposals, and so on and so forth. And the human resource, I always believe the human resource plays a very important role not only just the drug, which you can, uh, uh, you know, acquire from other sources. So, I mean, I my only plea is that these forums have to be done more. Uh, one of the things which we don't do very well is to have a unified voice. We have the Indian Cancer Congress. We have this isolated bodies of excellence. There is no unified clinical trial voice because still somehow the research is not taken as brightly or as uh, kind of nicely as one, one hopes for. So if uh, we do it a collective voice, both within our oncology community first, patient advocates, philanthropy, and the government, and our translation scientists, hopefully as a collective community, which West has also done very elegantly, uh, those are the solutions. And then how to do it, these are the four or five points that we will be discussing. With that I would say thank you to all. We have actually overshooted. Hi, Vijay. Okay, you are sir, you are there. Oh, and I was listening. I was I, as I messaged that I got preoccupied with something, but I was oh. listening. I joined in between. Uh, okay. uh, so I thought sorry, I'll sorry, I didn't that. know sir, you were there. Sir. No, sure, no, sure at all. It's a very nice discussion, and I thought I'll uh, put one two bits of mine, and because it came to solutions, uh, there is one uh, simple one, uh, and simple one is that. Uh, uh, we can learn from uh, uh, you know the way uh, health uh, you know uh, uh, the way we have our Ayushman scheme kind of things. You get the money, so Ayushman scheme could have been that money goes to the government hospital. They didn't do it that way. They did realize let realize that it doesn't work that way in India. The money is there. Whoever works, it goes there. Now also for research, what happens? Money uh, goes to individual, not necessarily that it has worked or not. It, it is the socialist mindset, the way it has money gets distributed or resource gets distributed. Not to the people necessarily who uh, has uh, you know, done and shown on uh, work to uh, show the research. And we have 30 regional cancer center. The mandate has to be there that if you have a 30 regional center, the money comes from somewhere and it's the income tax, it's the taxpayer money. There has to be uh, research shown by all these centers. So there are some of those uh, tough decisions, but easy to do, but not easy because it's a tough decision. The way it happens in TMH, you get, uh, we get to peer reviewed every five years for each DMG showing that what they have done. And then that time you, me, uh, Dr. Jalali is there. He knows the pressure. It is there in the whole DMG. What you have done in last five years? Uh, there was a very good, uh, uh, you know, practice of, uh, you know, uh, uh, and I wish it gets revived again. And it happens intermittently. That yearly you get reviewed by uh, the director and the group of uh, uh, collegium people. And again, that time, apart from all the things you show, you also show research. And that provides a bit of a uh, accountability and also a uh, 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 you know, bit of a push that those group of people, they, uh, you know, uh, uh, they're, uh, they're nudged to do that research. Uh, but unfortunately, that does, doesn't happen. So there are many solutions and I heard all of them are very nice uh, suggestions given. Uh, but a simpler one, which uh, works at one place and which we have seen and experienced uh, that it works. I don't have anything more to add. So I'll say thank you to all. 
this was one of the most eminent panelists which we could have each one of them is a doyen in their own field and vijay was my apology i had to be at a hospital so yeah, yeah. i couldn't yeah. join i got late my apology no, for no, no, everybody each, each one of them is a doyen in their own field and has done a lot for the patient service and has done a lot at in the individual field of research which is not only used in nationally but been used globally with that we i thank vivek and all the panelists for their um, thoughts and it's over to vivek for the for the uh, proceedings thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you uh, dr vijay and all the eminent uh, panelists it is a wonderful uh, discussion and uh, now uh, i would like to invite on stage uh, dr vanita norona who is uh, an avid researcher and he she has uh, uh, close to you know 600 plus uh, publication in her name and more than you know uh, close to 5000 citations and who better than her uh, could be to tell about uh, the drug development and clinical trials in india dr uh, very welcome to you Thank you so much, uh, Vivek, Kamesh, and the organizers of Lancet uh, Conclave. Very wonderful uh, uh, proceeding so far. Um, really, uh, congratulations. So I will just um, is is this visible? Yes, Dr. Sir. Yes. I would request if you can uh, switch on your camera, if possible. It is on. Sorry. Okay. It's okay. Not... Thanks. It's not on. Okay. um she can just have a look at it please go talk sir thank you okay sorry for my mind is still on no oh, apology it's not working okay so uh, in the next 15 minutes or so i will just talk about uh, drug development clinical trials challenges barriers possible solutions so Why do we need? So this will be the outline of the talk. Why do we need clinical trials? Do we have any you know, data? What are the barriers to conducting clinical trials? And a couple of words on the role of role of regulators. So why do we need clinical trials? So clinical trials forms the basis of what we call evidence-based medicine. And evidence-based medicine really is what provides us with the information that we need to provide the best care to patients. So Simple as that. We don't know how to take care of patients without evidence-based medicine. Um, we have had multiple technological advances. You know, great advances in computer simulation, um, animal testing, but all of this has limitations, and we really cannot completely predict how what will happen when a drug is introduced in the human body. So we need clinical trials. So it allows testing, monitoring of effects of drugs or treatments uh, in multiple patients, and most. Modern medical treatments are the direct result of clinical research. So the top reasons why clinical trials are important. The number one reason is that the results of the clinical trials can affect many people. So this is the answer to why do we do a clinical trial? So um, just to put it in perspective, a busy clinician, uh, we are all we all become doctors to to be, to take care of patients, right? And a busy clinician can treat between ten to thirty new patients a day. So that would translate to roughly about five thousand patients a year. So to take an example of a clinical trial, so the N zero trial that was conducted by Dr. Anil Dikri, and the question was whether uh, elective nose dissection in a clinically nose negative mass in a patient with early oral cavity cancer would improve survival. So he found that uh, elective surgery improved both overall survival as well as reduced survival. So how many patients would this affect? Uh, so we know from global scan that um, globally there are 3.7 lakh patients with lip and oral cavity cancer, and lip and oral cavity cancer causes uh, 1.77 um, lakh deaths um, annually. This number is also increasing in India. So, um, approximately how many of those would have early, early oral cavity cancer? So approximately a quarter of these would have localized disease. So, if we can apply the results of the N zero study, that has the potential to impact almost ninety five thousand patients annually worldwide. So, a small concept in a small study, which has such a huge reach uh, exponentially across the globe. The second reason is that the, the results of clinical trials can make treatment cost effective. So, this is to take an example of a typical patient, uh, Mr. Dave, who has been diagnosed with prostate resistant prostate cancer. So, depending upon his uh, His occupation, his uh, his uh, monthly income is about twenty to twenty five thousand a month. 
This doctor advises them a uh, hormonal tablet called Abraxin, uh, a thousand milligrams a day. So that the uh, original brand, so the um, actual drug costs ninety thousand rupees a month. We are fortunate in India that we have generic medicine, so the generic cost under ten thousand, so nine thousand rupees a month. So he says, I want a prescription of the generic brand, but still, that is about half of his monthly income. So he he's not really sure that he has the money to sustain his life, to support his family, as well as to set his treatment. So that led us to design this study. So there is data, a uh, pharmacokinetic and drug level data. Let's take an apparatus on a lower dose of so 250 milligrams um, with a low fat meal, leads to may lead to similar drug levels and therefore may lead to similar outcomes as the full dose apparatus. So this was a very interesting um, piece written by my colleague, Dr. Amol Patel, uh, studying the cost effectiveness of low dose apparatus. So if all Indian patients to act, they were taking Abiraxone actually received the low dose, the food. Uh, the cost savings would be 182 US million dollars um, per year. And so the average patient would take a US, a US dollar 3,600 over the lifetime. And that, to put it in perspective, the saved amount is approximately 2.5 times the mean per capita income in India. The third reason is to bring new treatments to the market to bring new approved medicines to our Indian patients who do not have access to life-saving drugs. And this permission from Mr. Dubey Thomas, I'd like to just briefly discuss this story. So, Susan Thomas was diagnosed with stage 4 um, metastatic lung adenocarcinoma with brain metastases. She had a rare uh, type of lung cancer, which is high positive. Uh, when she was diagnosed, there was no treatment available in India. So, no specific health directed treatment available in India. With great effort and great uh, advocacy, they were able to get um, not only uh, as the first as directed uh, therapy for Prigotinib, but following that, following that, Kusum was on multiple studies, including so multiple studies, and she was able to be alive for seven years following her diagnosis, thanks to um, clinical trials. Other reasons why clinical trials are important to raise healthcare standards by improving the standards of treatment. To develop new uh, devices, vaccines, cells, procedures, to improve symptoms and quality of life. But the most, the most important reason for clinical trials is the story of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So, uh, this on uh, this is the uh, survival source, and the on this axis we have the year from diagnosis, and on this axis we have the number of people who are alive. So only in the 1960s, a person who is, if you have 100 people who were diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and if you have in mind, uh, most uh, females are children, so a uh, uh, young age, if with whatever available treatment was there, at about 15 to 20 years, most were not alive. Coming and with various uh, sequential clinical trials, uh, in the current era, almost everybody uh, diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia as alive. So this is the importance of clinical trials to improve patient outcomes. And this is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. It's a global uh, body that uh, comes out with guidelines to uh, for, uh, for uh, management of cancer. And the NPCN tells us that they believe is the best management for any patient of cancer in a clinical trial. And they part uh, their participation in clinical trials is especially encouraged. So this is the reason why, from our, from oncology point of view, from the healthcare uh, uh, for provider point of view, why we would like clinical trials. Why should patients participate in clinical trials? So well-designed and well-executed clinical trials are ethical. We have gone to ethical clearance. Um, that there is, we have eliminated all possible harms to the patient. So patients are provided uh, with an opportunity to play an active role in their healthcare. They gain access to new research treatments before they are widely available. To increase options for treatment in the standard of uh, standard of therapy field, uh, to obtain expert medical care at leading healthcare facilities, and to help others to combat contributing to advancement of science. So, really quickly, I think um, we are running later. Do they do I have time? Or so the next question is: Do we have enough of clinical trials? So uh, this was a study done by Angur et al. The role of clinical trial participation. And they found that of every 20 adult patients with cancer, only one enrolled in clinical trials. So only 5% of clinical of patients with cancer enrolled in clinical trials. Now, this is these are global figures. What about India? So disparities in clinical trial participation worldwide. So uh, these investigators uh, looked at about 
7,000 clinical trials worldwide. And they found that about 2,000 of these trials were done in LMRT and about 5,000 were done in HIV. So very big disparity in the number of clinical trials per time in low middle income countries. So to take the example of cervical cancer, you can see here you have North America, more than 50 trials. Here you have India, uh, between 10 to 50 trials. And if you look at the age standardized date of cervical cancer per 100,000 in the United States, it is 6.6, the mortality is 2.7, and the number of uh, cervical uh, cancer trials is 73. Whereas in India, the age standardized rate for cervical cancer per 100,000 is 23. Uh, the mortality was 12.4, and the number of clinical trials was 24. So again, I think there's a huge disparity in the number of clinical trials that we have available in India. I'd like to take you back to the story of um, Ms. Kusum Tomar. So after she got her first um, with asthma-directed drugs, or she got in it, uh, she did well for a while, but then she developed resistance. Um, and then they found that the second, the, the world's first second generation medicine had become available in the United States. But at that point, India was not conducting clinical trials, and they could not get to new medicine. So at a conference, uh, Kusum stood up and, and asked everybody, is it my fault that I am Indian? Yeah, and this question is for all of our patients. Is it our patients' fault that we are, that we are Indian patients and we don't have access to the best clinical trials? So what are the barriers to conducting clinical trials? So lack of time, lack of resources, lack of statistical expertise, absolutely no incentives to conduct research, excessive regulations, a publication bias, and a lack of basic advocacy and understanding of the importance of research. And, and yeah, that's, that's why this, uh, these kind of conferences and these kind of meetings are so very important to advance um, you know, the understanding that this is what feels patients like. So it's more uh, note on the role of regulators. Um, this is a personal experience. Uh, I uh, take care, um, you know, something so very close to my heart is geriatric oncology. So taking care of older patients with lung cancer, older patients with cancer. Uh, so in June 2020, I had applied to the ethics committee um, to with a very simple concept, you know, in older patients, just lowering the dose, the standard dose of chemotherapy, if you're if an older patient with fever, just look at optimized questions. So this is done in June 2020. Uh, there were multiple questions in the ethics committee uh, about various aspects of the protocol. So I did into uh, Dr. Kanish, who at the time was the president of SIO, which is the global geriatric oncology uh, body uh, worldwide. He agreed with the protocol. He thought it was a good idea. And you when know, he wrote back saying it's, it's really not easy to do these trials, very little is known. Uh, this is a very vulnerable population and very few trials. So I thought that ethics can be understand. Um, we eventually did understand that this we got a final approval for the trial, that is June 2022. So two years in the approval process. Um, just to put in a little bit of perspective, uh, there is this, uh, this issue of, uh, of excessive regulations came to the front forefront in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and these were the what what are perceived as the issues with the regulatory bodies and possible strategies, the delays in approval from regulatory agencies as well as from ethics committee. Uh, submissions and approvals, unfamiliarity of the ethics committee members, which are similar guidelines, and infrequently scheduled the uh, ethics committee meetings. So um, I don't want to uh, overshoot the time, so I just want to acknowledge that doing clinical trials in India requires a fantastic team. Absolutely, it's not a single man, a uh, single person's uh, work. And without our uh, team of uh, very, very dedicated researchers, now, you know, this would never have happened. So Dr. Kumar Pravat is the uh, head of our um, department, head of our unit, and he, he is the um, spearhead of all of our active our with clinical health. Dr. Vijay Patel, Dr. Nandini Menon, Dr. Amit, and Dr. Ajay. These are our group of research coordinators and research staff, our medical oncology residents, our uh, molecular laboratory, and uh, my mentor, so Dr. Edward Sri, during my um, training, and my current director, Dr. Badri and Dr. Benadli. Uh, all the patients and caregivers of that memorial. And as uh, Vijay said, um, and as Venkat as well, you know, my family for putting up with, with the countless hours that I spent you know, doing all of this paperwork and you know, doing this um, on personal terms. So to conclude, doing research is tough. Patients, our patients have unique problems, there are multiple opportunities, and we have multiple responsibilities. So as researchers, our responsibilities are to understand this problem and to obtain solutions. As regulators, our responsibilities are to facilitate research, eliminate roadblocks, and mandate and incentivize research. 
As patients and caregivers are responsibilities as the advocate for clinical trials and to ensure that the Indian patients are not left behind as cancer care advances globally. And as corporate and philanthropic organizations, our responsibilities are to provide funding and to help with other infrastructure. So we have both the ability and the responsibility to make a difference in the lives of our patients. So I'll end with this uh, one of my favorite quotes from Barack Obama, the audacity of hope. Right? So hope in the face of uncertainty, uh, of a belief that there are better days ahead. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Rok uh, It was a uh, very, uh, uh, I would say, crisp uh, manner in which, you know, you took us through the entire journey of uh, clinical trials. And I hope, uh, you know, we learned a lot of things out of uh, this uh, session. And next, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Sripad Banavli. Sir is the academic director of uh, TMC Mumbai. And uh, we request him to share the uh, center experience of uh, Wallavalkar Hospital Chiplun because uh, you know uh, charitable hospitals are the pillar of support for the last mile and many of the times you know if these things are known these things are you know if you are aware about it it helps uh, hundreds and thousands of patients sir welcome and uh, please go ahead can I share my screen yes sir okay Okay, thank you. You can see the screen now? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. First of all, excuse me, I have a little, not little, severe pharyngitis. So, my voice is a little uh, cracking. Bear with that. But before I start my talk, you know, I just wanted to give one this thing. You know, just a few days back, I attended a GCP talk actually. In that, they told everything, you know, about the regulatory issues, you know, rights of patients and all but not one word of right of the principal investigator, you know. I really feel bad that we talk a lot about patient, but you know, even the investigator is working hard on the trial and there is absolutely nothing mentioned about the rights of this thing. So I think that's one thing we have to change if we have to have more trials and more people getting interested in trials. So just, uh, you know, with that word, few words, I'll start the talk and I've changed a little bit actually charitable hospitals and I've changed that to development of rural cancer facilities you know because it's not just the charitable hospital but the cancer facilities in rural India that I'm going to talk about. So you know everyone is seeing this data since morning actually Amol Akade has put this on the various forums so you know we have more than 1.5 million cancer cases already being registered now and with the increase in number of cases, it has been estimated that more than 2 million cancer cases will be there by 2026. And these are official figures. The unofficial figures may be much more than that. Very importantly, as we know, the Indian population, 35% of the Indian population is urban and 65% is rural. But as we all know, more than 90% of the cancer care facilities are in urban India. And hardly 10, you have you can you know count on your fingers the rural uh, cancer facilities, comprehensive, I'm saying cancer facilities that are available. So, like again, this number put up by Amul since morning that hardly 22 percent districts, uh, 22 percent districts in India have cancer care facilities. And there are many districts like in you know Mumbai and metropolitan areas where there'll be 10, 20, even 30 cancer care facilities. But in, our, in rural India, there is very few cancer care available. But we have to, uh, actually the other part of which I already told is that with the increase in number of cancer cases in India, the number of diseases available in urban India is really increasing a lot. We have excellent and we even get uh, basically, uh, you know, the foreign tourists who come here for medical tourism, to come here and take treatment for cancers. We have excellent infrastructure, excellent cancer care facilities in the cities, in the metropolitan cities, but very few in rural India. And because of that, if you read the, um, the article published by Dr. Dixit from Tata Memorial Center regarding the mortality rates, though the incidence of cancer cases is very low in, in, our, in rural India, <clears throat> the mortality rates are much, much higher in rural India as compared to urban India. And very importantly, this is another thing which Dr. Badwe always keeps on mentioning, 
with the urbanization of rural India, now even the cancer cases in rural India are increasing to a, for a tremendous uh, reason. As we know, for the last two years, we have been having this Cancer Care Day, the theme of which is basically to uh, make the world aware to close the gap in cancer care. You know, there are many gaps in cancer care, as we know. One is the logistics. That means the cancer care, available cancer care facilities as compared to the uh, number of patients at the same time, available manpower as compared to uh, the number of patients. So there's a big gap in that, which has to be filled. Then there is the affordability gap, you know, those who can afford versus those who cannot. And I think that Dr. Amol will be talking about it in the next talk. So that is another gap. But the third important gap, especially in low mid and middle income countries, including India, is the gap of cancer care facilities available in rural India as compared to the urban India. And I'm going to talk about this and my experience of working in the Walalkar Hospital, how we can try to close the gap. So, you know, very importantly, since there are no cancer care facilities available in rural India, there are a lot of logistic and financial uh, reasons because of which patients find it difficult to come to the cities. I'll give you just an example. You know, we started in Varanasi, two centers, and we thought that because Varanasi is in UP and we had a lot of patients, thousands of patients coming from UP to Tata Memorial Hospital, we thought that the number of cancer cases coming from uh, UP will decrease. But very importantly, actually, oh, last year when we found out the number of cases which have decreased, we have only 800 patients who were less as compared to our previous number from UP. As compared to that, we had nearly 16,000 new cancer cases registered in our two Varanasi centers. So you can imagine there are lots of patients in rural India who do not make it to the tertiary cancer center, but who need cancer care. So that's one aspect of it. And the other is that by the time they come to the tertiary cancer centers, many of them come with advanced disease. And as we know, with the advanced disease, not only the cure rates decrease, but very importantly, the cost of treatment significantly increases as the stage increases. We all know that, you know, for lower stages, we can get away by, by using the level, this, uh, you know, our old protocols, say this, this simple protocol, but as we, the stage increases, and especially for metastatic disease, as we know, recurrent disease, <clears throat> we have to really use the newer molecules, which are exorbitantly expensive and out of reach of most of the patient. And this is another aspect which I always talk about the parody of cancer care in India is that in rural India, many of the low stage curable cancers are treated by people or our doctors who are not aware of the principles of cancer care and therefore they don't do the proper treatment and these patients will you know, get recurrent disease and then they become incurable. At the same time, the advanced cancer cases are, through, are rushed to the tertiary cancer care centers in metropolitan areas, they clog the tertiary care centers. And as it is, as we know, the outcome not only is not uh, as good as, you know, for, uh, I mean, it is, uh, is not worth treating the, the metastatic cancer where we know even the best of treatment cure rates are dismal. Very importantly, actually, now we have in Tata Hospital is in the expansion mode and as you know, we are opening new centers across the country, but it we found out that it takes nearly 450 to 600 crores to build one small tertiary cancer center of around 100 beds. So it's not that it's a simple thing. So, you know, basically it is very expensive proposal and you cannot build such expensive cancer centers in rural India, in every, in every uh, village or every rural district. And for that, actually, it's very important that we use the day one model. So what is this day one model? Basically, it is that, you know, if there are so many good urban tertiary care centers, both government and private, who have excellent staff, excellent, you know, manpower working for them. So if even a few, few percentage of the, uh, the consultants in the government or private tertiary care centers adopt or twin with a rural cancer, rural center actually, and develop into a rural comprehensive care center, we can basically get new centers without much, uh, you know, in use of, uh, of finances, 
For example, the Tata Memorial Center has helped us develop the Rural Cancer Center in Derwan, the BKL Walalkar Hospital. Very importantly, they have not given us any financial help to do this, but they have given us the infrastructure, the help of manpower and the expertise to de develop the center. So without spending one rupee by the, uh, the tertiary care center, we have been able to develop the rural center uh, basically with the expertise from the tertiary center. So what I would suggest is that if the even, uh, you know, 5% of the faculty in centers like Tata or Ames or, you know, TCCs like, uh, you know, um, basically RCC3 or ADR or any of such centers, if they, some of those consultants they take the responsibility of even 5 or 10 uh, rural centers over the years will be able to cross the country. And basically, it is only that the support will be required, and the people who take up this uh, this uh, initiative has to have to make sure that they visit the center on a prescribed time, irrespective of whether they have a meeting or whether there is any other uh, you know commitment that they have to give. So there has to be a total commitment from those people who take up the responsibility, because without that, it would be difficult to add, uh, to uh, you know, develop these centers. So that's what again is written here that if each of the major urban cancer centers, even add up two or three such RCC, we'll have many such more uh, rural centers across the country. And very importantly, the local patients will have access to treatment at the doorsteps. The cost of treatment will come down. Very importantly, I feel that the residents who get trained to work uh, in such centers get trained to work in remote uh, resource limited setting, you know, you can <clears throat> discuss with um, uh, most of our resident, <clears throat> sorry about that, uh, in our, uh, in the uh, Tata Memorial Center, they love to visit this place because they think that they have learned uh, value-added uh, learning is there in such centers and they have, you know, learned to take care of patients with limited set, uh, resources because in Tata and all, you get unlimited resources, it's very easy to take care of patients. But in such centers, you have to really struggle to get work done and you have to use out-of-the-box ideas if you have to take care of the patient. So very importantly, the faculty, the residents may think of novel, non-conventional treatments or ways to treat patients. And this will also encourage creativity uh, is what I feel basically. And I think the metronomic therapies that I started using started because we could not use the so-called standard of care <clears throat> In this setting, but now if you see uh, this same metronomic therapy is I've been now taken over at Tata and thanks to Vijay, Dr. Kumar and the whole team that we have been doing so many more studies on metronomic therapies at the main center and slowly I think he'll make it as a standard of care for many of the cancers uh, that we treat. So very that's one aspect of it. You know, it's easy to con to tell your colleagues and request your colleagues to go to rural India, come with us, start helping us to take care of patients. But the other aspect of it is that the support, you know, why start a memorial hospital thronged with thousands of patients? Nobody knows the, or very few know the doctors who are practicing there. But very importantly, most patients know that if they come to the Tata Memorial Hospital, they will get a lot of support from the, from the hospital and their treatment will be taken care of. So the, and this is because we get lots of support from various NGOs who work with us in the hospital and along with that new the, the from CSR funds so that uh, basically they, they help us to take care of the patients there. So this support is lacking in rural India. Not only that, many of these funds like the Aishman Bharat and the Mahatma Jyotiba Phule and other funds are not actually given to the rural centers. You know, they require a lot of uh, this thing and which they say that this your center is not eligible to get that. But if uh, government also agrees to give funding to these smaller centers, I think more people will be taken care of in the rural India itself and they may not have to come to this uh, to the cities to take treatments. So I request all the NGOs who are involved, who are listening here today, that if you collect 100 rupees for say an urban center, 
please keep 20 rupees at least from that to uh, and donate it to a rural center so that even the rural patients get help there and they don't have to come to the two cities. Government has already heard us, so we get most of the funding like Aishman and MPJY is now given at the BKL Walalukar Hospital. So we are getting government support now. So this is, uh, you know, what I always say that the war cannot be won with general alone, so that is the tertiary care centers. We also need the foot soldiers if we have to win the war. And for that, we need to develop more rural cancer, comprehensive cancer centers so that the comprehensive cancer treatment is given in rural, the rural patients at the doorsteps, which will help us to better take care of the patients, not only in rural India, but also since they will stop, uh, you know, basically from the tertiary care centers, we will have more, you know, less number of patients in the tertiary care centers so that we can take better care of the patient there. This is just I wanted to show that when we analyze the data of consecutive, mind you, not on those on studies or anything, but consecutive patients registered in the BKL Balalkar Hospital sometime back, we had nearly 44% of those patients are alive at more than four years. So this is, I think, is better than I would say of what we are doing in Tata Hospital because we never talk about consecutive patients and we just talk about patients on studies. So I think this is something which I really feel proud about because we have been able to give good care of our patients in the rural setting. And this is what I end my talk with a quote from Muhammad Ali that service to others is the rent you pay for your room year on earth. So I would request many of my colleagues to pick up even one center in each one or 5% of them pick up one center in rural part of the country, we will be able to do much more better service to our patients. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Kumar and Vijay, for giving this opportunity to talk on the subject. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, you are always a lighthouse to uh, most of the people who are working in the oncology domain and connect with patients. You are seen as a, uh, you know, uh, uh, inspiration for the compassion uh, towards the concept patients. Now, I would like to request uh, Dr. Manisha Singh to uh, join us and share the experience at Mahavir Cancer Sansthan, Patna. And uh, uh, meanwhile, she comes on the board and uh, I would like to share with all the audiences, like, you know, when it comes to cancer treatment, we know that, okay, uh, there are only few organizations like Tata Memorial Hospital or Ames or other hospitals, but uh, there is one institution uh, that has been doing a lot of work in terms of uh, charitable work uh, towards the cancer patients. And I was uh, amazed to learn, uh, you know, these facts from her. And I'm sure uh, you, you are going to enjoy and you are going to learn a lot of things from her. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Manisha Singh. Yeah, yeah. Am, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Manisha so I'm sharing. Could you yeah. close another application which is using your camera? We couldn't. We, we are not getting. Oh, I have just. We, I'm not able to. I have just. Uh, it is already in on. use with some other application. Can you close all other application and then turn it on? Am I audible? Yes, you are audible, ma'am. But... Can you start sharing my screen? I'm not able to. Okay. Uh, we'll do it on your behalf, ma'am. You can you can guide yeah, yeah, yeah. us. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. So, uh, very good afternoon to all of you. I hope I'm audible to everybody. I'm yes, audible? Yes, yes, yes ma'am. Okay, okay. So a very good afternoon to everybody. And at the outset, let me thank the organizers, especially Mr. Vivek for coordinating and having me here to speak on this subject and on the auspicious occasion of this World Cancer Day. So I just uh, want to share the experiences of my hospital. How do we go about and how such a huge hospital, a cancer hospital is just running, you know, just under the uh, charitable uh, hospital running under the just the funds that we collect from a mandir, that is a temple, a divine temple from Patna. So I'll just take you to the journey of this uh, 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 the hospital that way I work. So this is the Mahavir Mandir. We ourselves in Patna, we do not know how old this is, but it is said it is more than 300 years old. It was, you know, rebuilt in 1947. And then it was again, a thrice it was built in 1987. 
and the exact history also we also don't know how old it is but the uh, funds that is collected to generate that hospital comes from the charhavas and all the pujas that is being performed in this mandir next please so this is the mahavir mandir and uh, the all the philanthropic work by mahavir mandir trust patna that is being done is it is named shri mahavir sthan nyas samiti headed by acharya kishor kunal and he is the trust monitors working and development for the temple and the trust uses the temple fund to run human welfare organizations and hospitals like mahavir cancer sansthan mahavir arogya sansthan mahavir vatsalya hospital mahavir netralay and now we have the campus two of mahavir cancer also come up and uh, will, you will be happy to know that it is perhaps the first time in india that we will be coming exclusively a mahavir pediatric cancer hospital that will be perhaps uh, we will be inaugurating it in the coming year so these all these hospitals you know we run by this uh, fund collected from the mahavir uh, uh, mandir next please so this is uh, the mahavir cancer hospital the main campus the picture what i am trying to show is this is the campus one and mahavir cancer sansthan is one of the most reputed cancer hospital in our country built on the ideas of compassion and selfless societal service this hospital is a beacon of hope for many underprivileged and poor patients so otherwise perhaps couldn't afford the highly expensive treatment uh, and to go up away from bihar and the cancer hospital was set up by shri mahavir sthan nyas samiti a charitable trust engaged in many philanthropic work i said including running of the most revered uh, mahavir mandir near patna railway station back then seeing the lack of proper and affordable cancer treatment for the poor patients of bihar the trust under the dynamic leadership and guidance of its secretary acharya kishor kunal had envisioned setting up a world class cancer center where people from diverse faith caste and economic status can come for and you know at a uh, treatment at a subsidized cost next please so he is mr acharya kishor kunal and he is a great visionary and by profession profession he was an ips a very dynamic ips officer but then he left his profession and now he is an acharya and his thought is i have no desire for a kingdom nor for a heaven nor for salvation my earnest desire is to be able to you know serve the human suffering and with this principle he works and under his supervision i showed you that mandir has generated so much and so many hospitals are working next please so about this hospital the campus one has more than 650 bedded hospital it is last year the new registrations we were more than 25000 we have all facilities surgical oncology we are even even running dnb in surgical oncology we have 11 high uh, tech modular operation theaters we have lenac machine we have uh, three lenac uh, already operating the facilities of svrt imrt uh, everything there medical oncology we have you know a, a minimum of 250 to 300 patients getting chemotherapy every day we have exclusively pediatric uh, oncology wing we have a bone marrow transplant unit so in fact all ct mris pet scan all machines under one roof so that is exclusively cancer excellent treatment is being done in mahavir cancer sansthan next now this is important slide that wanted to share with you all so what are the financial assistance we are giving to a cancer patient so believe me when a patient enters in, into this hospital even if he is not a diagnosed case of a cancer and he has just stepped in to know whether he or she is suffering because you know the, even the basic exp, uh, i mean investigations are so costly the patient is offered a money of rupees 25000 rupees under the uh, uh, dr Ar arun kurkure fund that is being uh, uh, provided to the hospital so you just need to have an i praman patra and avasya praman patra that is it and investigations of 225000 you are offered free of cost now the other free treatment that we are offering is 15000 per child no first of all we are treating all children up to 18 years we are not charging a single rupee they are treated free of cost zero to i mean one year to 18 year no charge is being taken 
Apart from that, 15,000 per child before admission for investigations. Apart from this, the Arun Kurkure fund that I told, told you all about. Then we have a 10,000 assistance to adults from Bihar and also from Nepal, Bangladesh, etc. For the foreigners, this amount can be increased, taking account their financial status. Now, 50% concession to the poor patient who are unable to pay. So any senior consultant or HOD, they have the right to make that concession slip and that will go to the counter where you are offered a 50% concession. We are giving three time free meal to all the patient admitted. So if it's a 65 bedded hospital and even if you have a minimum of 600 admitted, three time meal, breakfast, lunch and dinner is being provided by the fund of this uh, uh, Mahavir Mandir that we have that the generated uh, chandas and chadhavas that we have from here. We have a highly subsidized meal to patient attendant also, that is 30 rupees per plate. So even if the patients are given free, the attendant will also be not charged much. Now, this is again a very unique thing that one unit of blood and its component at the rate of rupees 100 only, which is really very surprising. The, even, a, you know, the lowest cost in the entire country, even the government blood bank supply at the rate of 550 rupees and we are charging just 100 rupees because leukemia's patient and lymphomas, they, you know, the, we have to give so many uh, blood uh, transfusion to those patients. The recording in progress. Now, again, we have an Antim Yatra ambulance, which we are providing free of cost for all dead patients in and around Patna. We are not going to charge that if you're taking to dead body, please pay for that. No, not at all. Municipal corporation for carrying dead bodies, even it is being considered to send dead bodies in any part of Bihar at a very subsidized rate. Dead bodies are never holed up in the hospital due to non-payment of any hospital dues. This is the basic principle of Kunal, sir, that you cannot hold a body if the patient is crying and that patient is unable to pay. No, we, we are not supposed to do that. And those dues are waived and the dead bodies are sent to the destination free of cost. Highly subsidized ambulance services are available to any patient who want to go inside Bihar or even outside Bihar. Next. Now, the concession in bills of poor patient, we, in progress. any doctor is, I mean, uh, he has a uh, power to waive off the concession from 10% to 15% are made by the officials of Mahavi Cancer Sansthan. Free treatment to sadhus of different temples, including medicines. For employees and their family, including wives and daughter, parents and grandparents, there's a provision of 50% concession of all hospital bills except medicines. Now, the government of Bihar has provided us with the patients, you know, the uh, CM fund, which gives 80,000 to 1 lakh, 1 lakh of rupees. And they are giving 5 lakh for bone marrow transplant. Our 14th bone marrow transplant has been done successfully. And this is again a unique that we have 100% success rate. Till date, we have done just 14 because we initiated just last year doing bone marrow transplant and all transplant have been successful. Now, uh, for the convenience of patient application with documents are submitted in hospital itself from the hospital, this designated staff goes to secretariat and submit application. So we are very fair about in that. Now, the government of India also gave the PM relief fund, it, though it's a little difficult to extract, but then PM relief fund is also being provided to the patient. Next, please. Then we have the Ayushman Bharat. Definitely, uh, this uh, facility is being availed by not only Mahavir Cancer, but a lot of the other hospitals as well. Now, I'm very thankful to Indian progress. Cancer Society, Mumbai, who has recognized the art hospital, the worth and the, uh, I mean, the, the potential that we have. And the, really, we are working for the very downturn patient and Indian Cancer Society for all early stage cancer, where the survival of the patient is 50% at a rate of five year, they are giving up till five lakh. So this is a real boon again for the cancer patient. So thank you Indian Cancer Society once again for recognizing and having faith in us. Now the other uh, societies that we are helping is, is Vansri Vidya Memorial Trust. Children suffering from acute leukemia are being given assistance of rupees 20,000 per patient. But it's not, not only 20,000 if that patient money goes on exhausting and you have to Re -up, keep on reapplying. So perhaps it goes to 60 to 80,000 per patient. Next, please. Next slide. So apart from uh, just serving the patients, uh, not only we are, get, just get a slide back, please. I was just want to show, huh? not only we are just treating the patient, but we are also organizing uh, camps in the rural area because this is very, very important. And just in last three months, we have done already 
35 camps and we are our target is 65 now again that uh, indian society cancer society is helping us in organizing these camp and per camp they are you know paying to the whole, entire the cost they are bearing this uh, i mean the cost of the camp so just in three months, the target is to cover 65 rural areas. So this is under the supervision of Indian Cancer Society and the de uh, health department of the government of Bihar that we have been organizing. So every week, thrice a week, we are doing camp. The basic motto is that still to date, what we have a very advanced case of patients coming and landing up and then a futile use of money and investigation. So let's catch it. And now it's working. Previously, the camp was just, uh, you know, a time pass sort of, but now patients are turning up and a lot of, we are catching early disease. And this is the beauty of the screening camps that we are doing in rural areas. Otherwise, in our hospital also, we are doing a free screening camp every Saturday in-house also in the hospital. So that Saturday, if you have just come for a screening, we are not going to charge anything from you. That is, will be a free of cost of care. Next. So these are all the pics of the free cancer screening and awareness camp in all the districts of Bihar. And you see the huge population and the huge turnover of wherever we go to schools, colleges, or wherever we go for educational purposes. So that also goes side by side. It's not only the treating, but the, uh, uh, the palliative uh, care also runs side by side. Next. So let me just now in a couple of minutes, I'll just show you the, the how different people from different religion have come and joined hands. And in all good events, they have just shown up that they are they are standing by. And this is how Mahavir has grown. So this is the pick of the foundation stone, which was laid down by Imam Sayyid Abdul Bukhari of Jama Masjid of Delhi on 14th May 1995. And the institution was formally inaugurated on 12th December 1998. So this is the journey of 24 years that Mahavir Cancer and Sansthan has grown to this height. Next. These are all the facilities, what I'm trying to show from the cath lab to uh, BMT with all the facilities that we have. Next slide, please. All the pictorial, uh, it will go fast. So this is how the OPD goes on. This is the registration counter outside where the patient gets registered. Next. Next, please. Next. And this is Bhai Iqbal Man Singh, Chief Granth, Patna Sahib Gurudwara, who inaugurated our city scan back in 2000. Next. Recording in progress. A.G. Kalwankar, Chief Governor, Manager, SBI. Whenever we have, you know, he, he gifted us with mammography machine. So we get a lot of gifts also. And uh, from a lot of people who really think that Mahavir is doing a wonderful job to the poor patients. So, and this uh, carries forward. Next, please. And now this is Sadhisri uh, Sampragya ji of Virayatan Inauguration Operation Theatre in our hospital. And the first surgery was conducted by Dr. Rajesh from Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. Next, please. Dr. Rajesh Mistri had performed the first surgery in Mahavi Cancer Sansthan. And uh, His Excellency Rama Joyce, Honorable Governor of Bihar, inaugurated the laser Recording surgery in hospital in 2003. Next, please. And then this is the International Lions Direct, uh, Lions, uh, uh, DG who inaugurated the blood bank in Mahavir Cancer Sansthan back in 2003. So I just shared some of the glimpses of the events that we had in Mahavir. Next, please. Now, His Excellency APJ Abdul Kalamji had come for the inauguration of the pediatric ward in Mahavir Cancer Sansthan. So this was, again, a very big event of Mahavir Cancer Sansthan when he had himself come and, uh, you know, he was so happy to see the children of small little children, happy faces of cancer being treated there. Next, please. Again, Baba Ram Guru Dev has uh, also, uh, you know, he came for the second when we had, we presently, we ha still we have cobalt machine and we are doing a lot of palliative works also. So this was his picture. Next, please. This is His Excellency, the Vice President of India, Shri Bhairo Singh Shekhawat, inaugurated the Department of Cancer Prevention and Control in Mahavir Cancer Sansthan, and this was backdated 2007. Next. Hazrat Maulana Nizamuddin, President Imrat Sharia Patna, inaugurated Mahavir Cancer Sansthan, Dharmshala, 
which is just next to the hospital where it is almost free of cost. The people coming far off can stay in that dharmshala that we have. A Sakam dharmshala is also coming up very shortly. Next, please. Her Excellency, the President of India, Mrs. Pratibha Devi Singh Patel, she inaugurated the Aha Mukon, that was an international conference that we had inaugurated at Mahavir Cancer Sansthan with delegates not from India, from abroad also. She, she was the lady, I mean, the key person behind the inauguration. Next, please. Uh, Shabana Azmiji and uh, Shatrugan Sinaji, they had come for the pain clinic when we inaugurated the pain and palliative clinic. And we have the nerve block system and all, uh, you know, uh, being done at Mahavir Cancer Sistan. So they were the pioneers to, you know, start this function. Next, please. And uh, again, Nitish Kumarji inaugurated our Linux. This was perhaps the second linear excavative and was put up in the hospital. Next. And uh, then Justice uh, Chandra Maulik Prashad visited Mahavir Cancer Sansthan. And uh, again, next, please. Then His Excellency Sri Ram Nath Kovindji, Honorable Governor of Bihar at that time, he inaugurated the Ajanya Aharika to provide free meal to all the cancer patients thrice daily. So this is the, with this policy, we started that nobody will remain hungry ever till Mahavir Mandir has uh, the, you know, generate that much to the poor patient. So I'll just go fast, just go with the slides fast, please. So these are all the pictures that I wanted to share with you. Next, 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 please. So these are all the different occasions of different, you know, uh, dignitaries coming to the hospital for the, and now this is the bone marrow transplant that His Excellency Sri Fagu Chauhan, Honorable Governor of Bihar, inaugurated our bone marrow transplant. And this was just after post-COVID that we had done this inauguration. So, and this was again last year only that we have started pain palliative and hospice. So this is again, very, very important part of our campus too. where really troubled patient who are really deprived of the home care and such patients, we are catering almost free of cost. We are charging almost nothing to them. Even if they don't pay, we are keeping such uh, patients of very, I mean, uh, critical patients where, you know, nothing can be done much just to pay the patients are on morphine or uh, palliating pain, pain and uh, giving a relief. So this is perhaps, again, a, a big uh, feather to the cap of Mahavir cancer that some sound that they had. So the purpose is, I'm just winding it off, the purpose of showing all the pics that People from all dharm, irrespective of whenever called, they come and, you know, we, we get a lot of grants and a lot of funds and a lot of, you know, blessings of the people by which this Mahavir Cancer Sansthan today has grown to the height that we have registered more than 25,000 patients. And we hope that this is perhaps next to Tata Memorial Hospital as per the number of registries. So we keep the, we hope that the blessings keep continuing to us and we keep blooming and growing to a better height. With these words, and thank you everyone for having me here. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Manisha. And uh, now uh, I would request uh, Dr. Firoza Patel, uh, who's a radiation oncologist and palliative care expert from Chandigarh and C. Uh, has a huge background in palliative care and uh, ma'am uh, uh, is having, uh, we are having today uh, her as a moderator and with us uh, are uh, Dr. Naveen uh, Salins, Dr. Jairajan and Dr. Prakash Fernandez. Ma'am, please start. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you for having me for this session. Uh, as we know, cancer treatment is a multidisciplinary treatment with surgery, chemotherapy, and radiotherapy. However, since 80% of the cancer patients in India present at an advanced stage, palliative care should be integrated into active cancer care and not reserved for end-of-life care only. Palliative care and pain... Can you hear me? Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can hear yes. you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay, because... Okay, sorry. So palliative care and pain management have largely been ignored because the measures of health outcome have been pure and extension of life. Caregiving interventions that alleviate pain and severe health-related suffering and increase the dignity at the end of life 
which are the essential features of palliative care, have been grossly neglected. Also, cancer does not affect an individual, but the entire family. And support to caregivers and communication are also important aspects of palliative care. So we would, uh, can I have the next slide, please? So in this uh, panel, we've got Dr. Naveen. Uh, the other two panelists are also there. Can I have the, uh, Dr. Naveen? Yes, ma'am. Dr. Jay Rajan. Yes, I'm here. And Dr. Prakash Fernandez. Yeah, good afternoon. Dr. Sa Naveen is from KIMS Manipal. Dr. Jay Rajan is the palliative care consultant at PD Hinduja Hospital, Mumbai. And Dr. Prakash Fernandez is the head palliative partnership, CIPLA Foundation, Mumbai. The points we would like to discuss is palliative care services in India. What are the ground realities? What are the challenges in its implementation? Where are we now and how can we improve it? Can I have the next slide, please? So I think this question I would like to, is the third panelist there? Is there? Yes, yes, Dr. Dr. Fernandez. So I would like to address this to you as to what percentage of cancer patients in India require palliative care and how many have access to it? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Firoza, for that question. And I think it's really good to begin this because it really depends on how we look at palliative care and our definition of the scope of palliative care. And I think if we look at two aspects of palliative care, one is that palliative care is focused on how the disease is impacting the individual, on their pain, on their symptoms, uh, how, they ex how they're dealing with this diagnosis that they've just received, how it's impacting them spiritually, financially, and the caregiver. So that's one aspect of palliative care. Uh, the second, if we look at palliative care as looking ahead and preparing the patient and family for what's going to happen perhaps, um, you know, the changes that they need in their diet, the physiotherapy, uh, the kind of precautions they can take as their symptoms go on. So preparing them for that journey, uh, which is really important because that helps adherence to treatment. So if we look at these key aspects of palliative care, uh, then I think every patient who's diagnosed with cancer requires palliative care, uh, right from diagnosis. And um, as you mentioned, given that a vast majority are presenting at the advanced stage makes it all the more important uh, in India. So I think uh, if we have an incidence of 1.4 million and the prevalence of about 2.7 million, everybody requires palliative care right from diagnosis. In terms of how many people get access to it, um, there is not so much data available in India, but if we look at morphine as a proxy indicator, uh, and we look at the recent Lancet Commission report who, who did on, on kind of pain relief, it found that only about 4% of those with any serious illness who required pain relief had access to palliative care. So the vast majority, 96%, we're saying, perhaps are people living in pain and suffering because of that pain. Uh, and I therefore, uh, I think that the Lancet Commission really aptly called, we've got a, a, a huge call actually for action to really reduce this abyss in creating access to palliative care. So yes, we all agree, I think that palliative care access is very limited to patients in India. So the next question I would like to ask Dr. Naveen is, how many palliative care specialists are trained in India every year? And how does this compare with the number of trained oncologists per year? Thank you, madam. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, in uh, 2012 is the, when the, I'm talking about two levels of training. One is the more generalist training and the specialist training. I'll start with the specialist training. In 2012 was the first MD program started at Tata Memorial. And from 2012, if we take a decade now, uh, that is till 22, 23, now we have five places where there is an MD palliative medicine offered and five places where there's a DNB palliative medicine offered. And if you cumulatively take the, the number of training positions uh, every year, it is around 26 uh, training positions every year. But if you compare to that of a uh, number of oncologists training, uh, it is probably uh, very, very less. So it is not uh, in proportion to that. 
whereas if we look at in any of the the high income countries the palliative care training uh, is almost two third of the medical oncology training uh, so that that's the gap with the respect to the specialist training uh, in with regards to generalist training you know uh, you are part of the indian association of palliative care and from 2007 onwards there has been a certificate course of palliative care which now around 4000 people in india have undertaken that certificate course but you know this is a very short training program and in 2016 we have started a program for ctc program that is cancer treatment center training program through all india institute of medical sciences with the funding from uh, lian foundation that is asia pacific hospice network and uh, we have uh, last data that i looked up from 2016 to now we have developed set up palliative care uh, opds and centers uh, in 46 centers 46 cancer center so they may not be necessarily specialist but they are probably uh, they are doing some other thing like they may be doing anesthesia or oncology but they have been upskilled to uh, provide palliative care yes i think this is the main uh, thing that we have in india isn't we have specialist trained palliative care people much less than yeah. other general palliative care uh, being done either by pain anesthetists or by radiation oncologists or something so yes trained medical uh, trained palliative care physicians are grossly inadequate and i think we need to address this at some yes. so dr jayarajan i'll come to the next question and that is that how many palliative care services as we know that the uh, iapc has formulated that there are the, we have that uh, manual for what is what should be essential services and we have desirable and essential in this group and in the essential part that a palliative care facility must have we have that they should have trained doctors they should have always they should have morphine and they should be documenting the uh, things well so how do you feel how many palliative care services always have a trained doctor proper documentation and uninterrupted supply of oral morphine in india as far as are you able to hear me thank you for the question yes sir sorry yes as far as uh... uh so the three que- three parts of the question so as far as uh, iapc standards were concerned there were supposed to be essential services as well as desirable services that's right so what happened was that there was one survey actually i looked for it and uh, there was one survey which was done in 2019 between that's uh, right the first half and uh, uh, i'll be quoting most of the figures from there only uh, it was found that uh, you know some 250 organizations uh, uh entered into the were invited to be part of the study and only to uh, around 227 23 centers participated in the study and the, one of the questions was that assessment and documentation of pain and pain scale uh this this study actually revealed glaring deficiencies mm-hmm. in uh, uh the part of, uh, as far as the essential services and the desirable services are concerned uh, as far as documentation and assessment uh, assessment were concerned found that uh, Uh, around uh, less than six uh, percent actually assessed and documented pain uh, and uh, according to the pain scale uh, all the time. Rema- uh, um, around four point five percent of the respondents never even uh, documented this, and eighty nine point two percent actually sometimes uh, uh, assessed and documented the pain according to pain scale and used pain scale. As far as other symptoms are concerned. uh only 4.9% actually of uh, 227 respondents uh, actually uh, said always they always documented uh, and assessed uh, other symptoms but 89.7% said that they assessed it sometimes and uh, 2.7% never did it and only 1.3% said often although we believe that the there will be uninterrupted supply of morphine uh, in most palliative care centers uh, the study revealed that only 5.4% of the organizations were able to uh, give uninterrupted supply always 84.7% were able to do only sometimes and 4.9% were never able to do that 
So th- this showed that assessment as well as the supply of morphine is concerned, that there were good amount of deficiencies. But as the trained doctors were concerned, the standard set was actually 10 days of clinical care, palliative care training under supervision. Uh, the study revealed that as far as the availability of trained doctor as per the standards of IPC was concerned, only 5.4% of the respondents had uh, uh, trained doctor available for patient services uh, all the time. The 85.2% uh, said sometimes, 4% often, uh, 0.9%, 1% of them said that they never had uh, a trained doctor at any time for uh, delivering palliative care services. So the report has revealed that uh, this was in 2019, the report has revealed in which 26.4% uh, were government run organizations and uh, remaining with NGOs and few private hospitals and community-led initiatives and hospitals. And uh, it showed that although IAPC standards have been set for essential and desirable services, uh, the report shows that even in 2019, uh, uh, there were glaring deficiencies. The, uh, sorry, the reason I asked this question was when we normally just ask for a tick mark, you know, do you have morphine? Do you have a trained manpower? This usually comes out as yes. However, if you see the detailed report, yes, only 5.8% had continuous morphine, yes. which is very really sad because I think to start somebody on morphine and then not to be able to give it to them is a crime after that. Yes. Similar with the doctors. So that is why I put this as saying that just that tick mark that so many percent have morphine is not enough. Yes, absolutely so right. People is not enough. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Naveen, the next question I'll ask you, and that is that are most of the palliative care services set up in the government hospitals or basically run by NGOs or uh, private hospitals these days? Yes. So uh, initially, if we look historically in the last three decades, I feel that in the last two decades, the first two decades, uh, I feel that it was mainly in the government hospitals and predominantly run by NGOs and very uh, less and less private enterprises taking up palliative care. But uh, there is a a good shift in the last decade where I've seen several private cancer hospitals asking for palliative care consultants, setting up palliative care department. Many private medical colleges setting up palliative care services. Now, if we just look at the, the DNB, five DNBs that has been started, uh, uh, all are in private institute, some in corporate hospital. Now, if you look among the five MDs that are started, three are in government uh, and two are in private. So, so there is this change in trend and, and uh, people are realizing uh, more and more because patients and families are asking for it. You know, uh, it, they are asking for a good quality of life uh, good symptom relief even during treatment and beyond that, you know. So that that felt need is there, and uh, and I'm just looking at the question below, which links to the above question. Yes, I, I think so. You can answer that as well. Yes, yes. It's the same and, thing, you know. Do yeah, private yeah, hospitals uh, invest? Because yes. our our um, uh, impression always has been that it is something that needs to be provided free to the people, and that everyone should have access to it. So therefore, my question was that: Do private hospitals also invest in? Uh, palliative yes, care? Yeah. Answered yeah. that partly. If you want right. to continue. Yeah. Right now, I am in a private medical college. Yes. And, and there is significant investment in palliative care. We are now four consultants, uh, although we have an MD program. And and you know, always uh, the return on investment need not be financial. You know, uh, there has to be a value-based return. And uh, what they have felt is that the, there is significant cost-saving benefit also. Uh, we work in very closely in ICUs. And one thing that we have done is that the average length of stay uh, after care, uh, has come in has dropped from 15.9 days to 9.1 days. Now, this is a huge indirect revenue, you know, 
So that's why they need a robust palliative care service to be there. So they are investing. But uh, Jairajan would agree with me, any private enterprises that invest money would always look at the outcomes. And outcomes right. are not just financial outcomes in terms of family satisfaction, goodwill generation. And, and all those things are also uh, outcomes that would be looked at. Thank you. Can we go to the next slide, please? Now, uh, this was again to Dr. Naveen or to... Uh, that what are the main challenges faced in setting up a palliative care service and how is it different in a government setup or in a private setup? Dr. Naveen? Or... Hello? Hello? Can, can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Naveen, can you hear her? Dr. Naveen, or anybody else who wants to answer this? Dr. Fernandez, do you want me to answer or would you yes. like to? Anyone who wants, I can only see you, uh, Dr. Naveen and Dr. Uh... I'm there. Yeah, okay. It's okay. Any one of you who wants Dr. to? Dr. Naveen? Yeah. So, so challenge is faced in setting up a palliative care service. If you uh, look at, again, it depends upon whether we are setting up a specialist service or a, or, uh, a service uh, at in a secondary hospital. In a specialist service, the big challenge that we have is availability of consultants. You know, most of the uh, palliative care services are looking at MD uh, completed. And I have know that at this point of time, there are at least 10 hospitals where there are vacancies. So one of the important challenge is uh, availability of trained uh, human resources. Alongside, in some places, there would be challenges related to opioid access and institution-related challenges. Most often are purely a lack of understanding about the scope of service or the benefit it can. So I hear such some places where they say that their institution uh, are not starting because they don't think it's important. But it's purely because of lack of understanding. Uh, but I feel two important challenges is the, the trained human resources and at, at some places access to medications. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Prakash, at what stage in the trajectory of the patient's cancer are most patients referred for palliative care? Yeah, I think uh, given that the perception of palliative care is towards end of life, uh, I think most of the referrals uh, do come in at an advanced stage. However, uh, you know, over the last five or six years at our CIPLA Palliative Care and Training Center, we have noticed a change in trend. So while initially we had about 80% being referred at really end of life, uh, today that's fallen to about 60%. So about 40% of patients are coming in a bit earlier in their disease trajectory, uh, even concurrent with, uh, with chemotherapy between psychics, they're able to come into the center, get a care plan. Uh, and therefore, I think there is now a changing perception that palliative care can start uh, a bit earlier. Um, and I think that's the model that we found is really working as well when it is integrated into a, a hospital setting. And therefore, it's not really looked at as a referral in that sense. It's looked at as joint working in a sense of a team who is supporting that patient. And I think that really is therefore um, kind of a move which we need to work towards. Therefore, that uh, it's looked at as joint care, shared care with palliative care prof professionals adding in uh, as early as possible. Okay, uh, I think we'll skip a few questions. The, one of the ones that I want to ask is that is palliative care covered under Ayushman Bharat scheme? And also, does medical insurance cover it? Anyone wants to take that up? Yeah. So, madam, uh, with regards to medical insurance, uh, now uh, in this hospital, which I am there, it's a private medical college, and I most of my patients are insured. No insurance has been ever denied. You know, and uh, if you are rather than calling it palliative, if you clearly tell what you are trying to do with the patient, most of the time they, there's no denial. Now, Aishman Bharat scheme, the, the new packages are ready, actually. So there was a panel that was created to create uh, Aishman Bharat packages for palliative care. 
and these packages are quite good and quite competitively priced. Uh, I think there are last uh, some forms of approvals that are needed, and I think it should be released shortly in next few months. Okay, so. Uh... Well, uh, Dr. Jairanit, I would like to ask you, can we have the next slide, please? Uh, do you have any regulatory problems in storing morphine or getting continuous supply of morphine? And what are the main hassles you face in getting morphine? Uh, I don't face any hassles in uh, getting morphine because it's in a hospital setup. So oral morphine, injection morphine, as well as fentanyl, most of them are available uh, easily. So, so none we, of you, sorry. Yeah. So at this moment, uh, as far as none our, of, our institution is concerned, I don't face any problems okay. getting uh, so oral it, morphine or fentanyl patches or buprenorphine patches. I, I'm asking this question mainly for people who are in the government hospitals or even to your, that with the introduction of the fentanyl patch, has the need for oral morphine decreased? Because no, it's no, easier no. in our setup over here, at least in our area, for people to access and get uh, fentanyl, then get oral morphine. So is this something that the others also have faced? Uh, uh, we have patients on fentanyl patches. The issue is uh, not that uh, oral morphine, the need for oral morphine is decreased. As far as I'm concerned, I go with the WHO uh, analgesic ladder and we use morphine as the first line. But the problem is that most of the, when, when patients are referred to us, there might be patients who have been started on fentanyl patch rather than oral morphine. And then switching back or changing is near impossible because if they have good control, you know, our etiquettes and ethics do not allow us to switch to oral morphine, basically. Yeah, so, uh, I, I agree with the Dr. Jairaj. Yeah. You know, uh, I feel, I do not want to generalize this, oncologists sometimes feel more safer to use fentanyl patch than oral morphine. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's okay. Absolutely. Uh, but uh, again, it depends upon who is prescribing. And it's a lot uh, prescriber driven. Uh, we never felt that uh, uh, we use fentanyl patches quite a bit. Our consumption, if you take national standards, uh, we are using quite a bit of fentanyl patch. But still, our oral morphine exceeds that of fentanyl patch. And we are using it uh, as indicated by the book. The reason I asked this question was that most of us as palliative care doctors would use oral morphine. But a large number of us in our practice, we have seen that the oncologists have started using it and they start using fentanyl straight away because they find that easier to obtain probably. But it's also marketed more. Madam. Yes, that's probably. The that's the problem. That's the one. Yeah. yeah. Can we have the next slide, please? Uh, I think we are short of time. So I will just ask one or two questions from this. One is that, do you feel that one of the main reasons palliative care has not been able to make its mark is because we have mainly focused only on cancer? Just a short answer from anyone. So I don't think really, uh, maybe it is not the main reason. I feel if- I said one of the main reasons. One, yeah. Yes. I know if palliative care in cancer had shown it could get integrated early on, perhaps it could have been the example for other serious illnesses. I think kind of the main um, why it's not made its mark is because it's looked at as end of life care and the culture of multidisciplinary working is not really kind of part of the kind of the Indian culture of working. And I think if there's a multidisciplinary culture, if people are willing to share uh, kind of caseload, share the stress and um, look at palliative care as being uh, from diagnosis, I think we can go uh, a long way for palliative care to really transform okay. the healthcare system. So the last question I'd ask is that, do any of you feel that by changing the name of and the definition of palliative care uh, to something that looks after suffering as a whole and symptom management also would benefit palliative care? Internationally, there are studies to support this view. And uh, uh, I also conducted a PhD level research in my place it was with the pediatric oncologists and a lot of pediatric oncologists did feel that uh, we should uh, change uh, the name. Uh, however, uh, that said, uh, changing the name, we have already changed from hospice care to palliative care. And in the United States, they already changed to supportive care. And from supportive care, now they are going to call it as quality of life services. You know, unless we change the way we practice or 
way we uh, project ourselves, just the name changing might not suffice. Okay. I totally agree with it. Yeah. Okay. So I think we are running short of time and I'd like to thank all the panelists for being there and the organizers for giving us this opportunity. Thank you very much. Back to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't think that uh, anybody would have covered it. Uh, I mean, such a big topic in such a small time. Though uh, a politic where is such a topic that you know uh, we can discuss uh, all day about it. And uh, now moving to the next session, uh, I would like to invite Mr. Sandeep Singh. Uh, he is uh, managing director of Alchem Labs. And uh, as we know that uh, when it comes to uh, a disease like cancer, you know, like bigger the problem is, we need a lot of hands. We need to move it. Uh, you know, with uh, with a lot of force, and one such force in moving cancer care is public-private partnership, and uh, it's such a big population in our country. You know, be it uh, you know government alone or be it uh, uh, corporate alone, nobody or even NGOs. You know, nobody can deal it uh, completely uh, single-handedly. So we need a lot of uh, partnerships uh, and uh, for state. And uh, let us learn from uh, Mr. Sandeep Singh how has been his journey and uh, what all things uh, you know he has been uh, able to do in his capacity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Am I uh, audible? Yes, yes, very much. So first of all, you know, it's a pleasure. It's an honor to be here. I have heard, you know, great doctors speak about, uh, you know, cancer and cancer care. Cancer personally has affected, you know, I think most of us, I have seen my grandmother pass to it, my uncle passed to it recently. So I really understand the seriousness of this. And I thank you all for, you know, allowing me to be here to share my limited experience in this uh, so yes, I think this is a very important subject in India, in all the seven pillars of cancer care, right from, uh, you know, prevention, surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, imaging, laboratories, diagnostics, and, and, and uh, palliative care, all of them needs to kind of buck up. And I'm not trying to put it all on the government because ultimately private sector has to come up. And there are some shortcomings like, you know, how many radiotherapy uh, machines do you have in India? I think it's not even 50% of what, uh, you know, we need. So, and, um, you know, whatever limited way Alchem can do, we are trying to do. So, you know, I can share, do a, a presentation, a, a quick one, if that's okay. So I'll just Please go on, sir. Please go on. Yeah. yeah. Is it, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. So, you know, I will not preach to the to the converted. You all know this far better than, you know, I can tell you all. So I'll just leave this, the high incidence of India and why this is such a critical aspect where all pharmaceutical companies must come forward and, uh, you know, move on this. So the incidence is really increasing. It's also got to do with better diagnosis. But I think there's a huge gap. You know, when you look at the mortality rate, obviously, you know, you just wish and pray that we all come forward and we do far better things. So this is the estimated cases of cancer, which, you know, India is suffering from. And uh, I would just on this like to digress and say that we have, we are going to recently launch, uh, soon going to launch cetuximab for head and neck cancer. So, you know, we are trying to do, and even a launch of a new product might not seem like a public private partnership, but in a way it is, because when you do clinical trials and you go through DCGI, you have, you work very closely with the public sector. Yes, so you know, state governments are, adapt, are adopting a public partnership model, and Alchem has experience uh, about it recently. And I'll happily talk about it. But I, we all see the stats: the 95% of cancer centers are in urban areas, but 70% of population is situated in the rural areas. So I think there is certainly a lot to do there. So I'll coming to the main point. So Alchem has partnered with Tata Memorial Hospital. In, for the state of Bihar, we have, we have executed three projects, large projects. One is the support for constructing advanced radiotherapy center at Muzaffarpur district. The second one is support for home-based palliative healthcare services in Muzaffarpur once again. And cancer screening and awareness, which I think is critical for, you know, winning against cancer or trying to, you know, put up a brief front is screening. Where we have put at three districts, uh, cancer screening and awareness at 
बक्सर जहानाबाद एंड भागलपुर so this is the uh, one is obviously a artist reconstructed uh, image but the other one is a real picture and we are trying to make a difference we all know how many people come from bihar up to bombay because of lack of facilities and if we can control that we will think we have played a reasonable role in that so we are also doing home based palliative care services we have just started i'm um, you know so we are one of the home based palliative care services is one of the first kind services we have initiated in bihar the team consists of one doctor one staff nurse and a counselor they visit the identified patients home and provide the services on on a daily basis and this is completely given free of cost 100% of the patients are below the poverty line so cancer screening and an awareness we are do, doing it at uh, those three districts and you will see that it is a small thing we are no no way saying that that it it make it's making a huge difference but it's a beginning we have done community cancer screening at 264 awareness campaigns 24 and capacity for building workshops of healthcare workers 46 this is till december and baksar jahanabad and bhagalpur all we are doing and we will increase this in the next few months yeah these are just glimpses of pictures what uh, you know we show we have done and uh, yeah so that's from my side it's just a beginning but we'd love to participate more and hopefully make a difference thank you thank you so much sir and uh, it's been an honor to have you today here and learn you know what corporate or you know uh, the private uh, players are doing in terms of this shared mission of eliminating or uh, reducing cancer incidences in our country and uh, next uh, i would like to invite a personality who's uh, was dealing with the uh, topic or or the domain wherein uh, which is quite prevalent and aisa bolte hain ki jo hum dekhte sunte hain waisa hi ban jate hain waisa hi behave karne lagte hain that's why uh, media is very very important in our life and uh, you know uh, i would like to call upon uh, mr samir kumar he is uh, head of prasar bharti news services and uh, samir is uh, just to introduce you know he is uh, uh, from iit kadakpur i am kolkata he has been uh, you know uh, an is officer also in past and sir on a lighter note uh, anything else that has been miss missed by you you have been an investment banker as well uh thank you vivek ji am i uh, yes sir uh, yeah, we can we can hear you and see you both great great um uh, thanks um uh, I mean I'm really honored to be part of uh, uh this great initiative on World Cancer Day and uh, as you've asked me to uh, talk about role of media in addressing the cancer so first of all what I would like to do is to switch to Hindi because <clears throat> jitna um uh, to the ground jitne bhi aapke is uh, is wonderful organized is event mein uh first half mein jitne uh, कम्युनिकेशन हुए अधिकांश मैंने सुने वो हिंदी में थे तो मीडिया के रोल पे भी जो एक मेजर एक तरीके से ट्रांजिशन की जरूरत है कैंसर को लेकर के और यहाँ पर रोल जो है मीडिया का बहुत बहुत ही इम्पोर्टेंट हो जाता है सो so, दो एस्पेक्ट है मीडिया के अगर हम देखें तो एक जो हम ट्रेडिशनल मीडिया के सेंस में जो बातें करते हैं विच इज मोर ऑफ ऑफ अ ब्रॉडकास्टिंग नेचर राइट सो हमने टीवी रेडियो प्रिंट इनमें देखा है बट साथ में सोशल मीडिया के आने से एक जो इंटरेक्शन है दैट इज देयर और uh, उसका भी हमें काफी एडवांटेज लेना है सो द फर्स्ट जो रोल है आई वु लाइक टू टॉक अबाउट वो ये है कि कैंसर जो है सबसे पहले जो फोकस है हमारा उस कैंसर के पेशेंट को लेकर के उसमें हमें बड़ी क्लैरिटी रखनी है कि ये इट्स अ मोर देन एनीथिंग एल्स एक ये क्वालिटी ऑफ लाइफ इश्यू है पेशेंट के कैंसर के डिटेक्ट होते ही जो उस पेशेंट के लाइफ में हो रहा है वहां पे मीडिया का रोल बहुत बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट हो जाता है और जितना आप 
जो पर्सनल इंटरेक्शन पहले भी रहे हैं और आज आपने जिस तरीके से जितना अच्छा ऑर्गेनाइजेशन किया है ऑर्गेनाइज uh, किया इवेंट को uh, लोगों की बातें सुनकर और जनरल uh, जो अवेलेबल uh, कंटेंट uh, है उसको देखकर यह समझ में आता है कि पॉजिटिव एटीट्यूड होना uh, एक कैंसर कैंसर uh, पेशेंट का वो बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट है और वहां पे मीडिया का रोल बहुत ही बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट हो जाता है सो टीवी रेडियो प्रिंट एंड मोर ऑन सोशल मीडिया यहां पर जितना ज्यादा पॉजिटिव स्टोरीज केस स्टडीज जो कैंसर को फाइट करने का जो कैंसर को सरवाइव जिन्होंने किया है जिन्होंने इस बैटल को जीता है वो बहुत बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट हो जाता है मीडिया का रोल और सोशल मीडिया इसमें इंक्रीजिंगली ट्रिमेंडस रोल प्ले करता है आई मीन अदर फॉर्म ऑफ मीडिया के लिए बहुत सारी बहुत सारी चीजें हैं इस पर आगे भी हम बात करेंगे बट ये एक पॉजिटिव एटीट्यूड जहां पे है उसको हाईलाइट करना आई थिंक इससे ज्यादा इंपॉर्टेंट जो है आ, कुछ भी नहीं हो सकता है बिकॉज एक ये क्वालिटी ऑफ लाइफ डेफिनेटली जो है वो कैंसर जो है नीचे लेकर के आ जाता है पेशेंट्स का तो आ, उसमें आ, आ, उनके स्ट्रेंथ को जो है वो बना करके रखना जरूरी है सो एंड दैट लीड्स टू जो जो अगली बात है वो है स्टिग्मा ऑफ कैंसर को हटाने की जरूरत है कैंसर का होना डेथ सेंटेंस नहीं है नॉट एनी मोर लेकिन क्या हम अभी भी इसको वैसे ही ट्रीट नहीं करते हैं सो so, इसमें ये जो डब्ल्यूएचओ uh, uh, का ये जो तीन साल का जो कैंपेन चल रहा है Uh, जो सेकेंड ईयर ये है क्लोजिंग द केयर गैप ये बहुत बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट uh, है एंड uh, आप सबका हम सबका जो uh, ये एक मेन रोल होना चाहिए कि कैंसर uh, मतलब सीधे डेथ के साथ जो आइडेंटिफाई होने वाली जो चीज है उसको हटाना पड़ेगा और कोविड uh, को लेकर के बहुत सारे uh, इसको वी कांट uh, अंडरप्ले जो कोविड ने जितना है वो क्रिएट किया है लेकिन एक पॉजिटिव चीज अगर हम देखें सो so कोविड के शुरुआत में कोविड होना वॉज लाइक अ डेथ सेंटेंस आई स्टिल रिमेंबर सॉरी मैं फिर अभी भी मुझे ये ध्यान है बिल्कुल शुरू में यू नो फर्स्ट वेव में यूएस स्पेशली यूएस में न्यूयॉर्क वगैरह के uh, जो हमारे कुछ फ्रेंड्स रिलेटिव हैं उनसे बात करते समय जो डर का जो एक तरीके से सिचुएशन जो वहां पर था कोविड होना मतलब स्पेशली एल्डरली का कोविड होना बिल्कुल डेथ सेंटेंस की तरह से हो गया था और आज देखिए तो कहीं ना कहीं पूरा का पूरा विश्व जो है एटलीस्ट उस स्टेज से बाहर आ चुका है सो ये जो स्टिग्मा ऑफ कैंसर है वो डेथ uh, सेंटेंस नहीं है कैंसर इस चीज को हाईलाइट करना इस चीज को आगे लेकर के आना हम सब के लिए बहुत जरूरी है ये मीडिया का और वहां पे हम सब का कंट्रीब्यूशन बहुत जरूरी है और इसमें एक जो क्लोज द केयर गैप के साथ साथ एक गैप जो है वो बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट है इसको आइडेंटिफाई करना इसको रिकग्नाइज करना इसको करेक्ट करना यू uh, नो you know, uh, वो देख रहा था अभी एक वीडियो अभी चल रहा था काफी वायरल भी हुआ था लेडी जो ट्रेन और पटरी के बीच के गैप में ट्रेन और प्लेटफॉर्म के बीच के गैप में फंस गई एंड सडनली उसको देखते देखते ध्यान आया कि लंदन में जो ट्यूब है मेट्रो इक्वेलेंट जो इसको हम बोलते हैं माइंड द गैप बहुत बड़ा एक कैंपेन चलता रहता है ठीक है सो समथिंग ऑफ दैट सॉर्ट हमको यहाँ पे जेनरेट करने की जरूरत है कैंसर में बिकॉज इनको कैंसर हुआ था ये हम सुनते हैं बहुत सारे केसेस में जहां पे कि डेथ हुई रहती है इवन दो अगर हम ये सवाल पूछे कि अच्छा कैंसर के चलते इनका डेथ हुआ नहीं इनको हार्ट अटैक आया था बट चार साल पहले इनको कैंसर डिटेक्ट हुआ था सो so, ये जो कैंसर होते ही उसका उसकी आइडेंटिटी हम बना देते हैं कैंसर पेशेंट की तरह अगर हम उसमें जाए एक्चुअली यहाँ पे स्टडीज की जरूरत है कि एक कैंसर पेशेंट के डेथ की बात होती है और पता चलता है कि जैसे ही आप सवाल पूछना शुरू करें कोई एक बता रहा था कि उनके आ, आ, किसी अंकल का अभी हाल फिलहाल में डेथ हुआ एंड दे लाइक अरे उनको तो प्रोस्टेट जो है कैंसर जो है वो डिटेक्ट हुआ था ऑल ऑफ अस नो कि इट्स वन ऑफ द लीडिंग कॉजेज ऑफ 
यू नो सर्ट ऑफ कैंसर जो है मेन में है वो सबको पता है बट वेन आस्ट तो उनकी डेथ क्या उससे हुई थी नहीं उनको हार्ट अटैक आया था बट स्टिल वो कैंसर पेशेंट होने का जो एक स्टिग्मा सा है वो उसके साथ ही आइडेंटिफाई होता है बहुत सारे ऐसे ऐसे इट्स नॉट जस्ट देर बहुत की अच्छा छह साल पहले इनका ओपन हार्ट सर्जरी हुआ था किसी किसी के बारे में बात हुई क्या उसके चलते डेथ हुआ नहीं निमोनिया हो गया था उसके चलते डेथ हुआ लेकिन वो ओपन हार्ट सर्जरी की बात जो है वो साथ में अटैच हो जाती है सो ये कैंसर के साथ बहुत बुरी तरीके से होता है जहां पर कि इसको अभी भी उसके साथ जो स्टिग्मा है वो बहुत बुरी तरह लगा हुआ तो उसको हटाना बहुत जरूरी है और वहां पर फिर जो इस साल का जो क्लोज द केयर गैप का जो मोटो है कि एक सपोर्ट सिस्टम बिल्ड करना अभी हम अभी बीरेंद्र जी जो जिन्होंने बहुत ही अच्छे तरीके से बोथ अपने पॉजिटिव एटीट्यूड और जो एक सपोर्ट सिस्टम के लिए कि बच्चों पे पर स्पेशली मिडिल क्लास में बच्चों पे बहुत ज्यादा असर पड़ता है तो और कुछ नहीं तो हम कुछ नहीं कर सकते अगर किसी के बारे में अगर पता चला कि उसे कैंसर है तो कम से कम उसके लिए एक सपोर्ट सिस्टम तो बना दें आज के दिन में सोशल मीडिया को यूज करके जिस भी स्पेशली uh, इतना लोकलाइज सोशल मीडिया हमारे पास अवेलेबल है विथ ऑल दीज प्लेटफॉर्म्स तो जो एक मोबिलाइज करने की बात होती है फ्रेंड्स की फैमिली की कोवर्कर्स की कम्युनिटीज की सो so, ये हम सब किसी कैंसर पेशेंट के अराउंड आकर के छोटी छोटी चीजों का भी अगर मान लीजिए उनके बच्चों के ट्यूशन की बात हो गई उनके बच्चों के एक एक सिस्टमेटिक तरीके से एक घंटे तक उनको पढ़ाने की बात हो गई उनके खाने के ख्याल रखने की चीजें हो गई तो इन सारी चीजों से भी उनके साथ आकर के बिकॉज कैंसर इज नॉट अ कम्युनिकेबल डिजीज ये तो एटलीस्ट एक गुड चीज ये है अभी के स्टेटस में मीडिया के 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 पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू से कि ये बहुत क्लियर है कि कैंसर एक कम्युनिकेबल डिजीज नहीं है सो so, एक जो भय का जो माहौल उस कुछ एक बाकी डिजीज के साथ वो यहाँ पे नहीं है विच इज गुड थिंग लेकिन उसके अराउंड आगे बिल्ड करने की जरूरत है एक सपोर्ट सिस्टम बनाने की कैंसर पेशेंट के अराउंड जितना हम कर सकते हैं थोड़ा श्रम दान कर सकते हैं थोड़ा समय दान कर सकते हैं धन तो मान लीजिए हम कर रहे हैं नहीं कर रहे हैं और उसके लिए बहुत बहुत आपके प्लेटफॉर्म पे बहुत अच्छे से बात हुई जो करने की जरूरत है फंडिंग के लिए सो स्पेशली जो मिडिल और लो इनकम कंट्रीज में जो देखा जा रहा है और वो हमारे यहाँ फिर वो रूरल और अर्बन के भी बड़े अच्छे से बात हुई यहाँ पे कैंसर जो है बड़े एडवांस स्टेजेस में डायग्नोज होता है तो इसका इफेक्ट जो होता है वो आई एम नॉट सेइंग कि उन सब चीजों की जरूरत नहीं है वो है अर्ली डायग्नोसिस डिटेक्शन इन सब की जरूरत है लेकिन हम जो कर सकते हैं एटलीस्ट इस सोशल मीडिया के जमाने में एक सपोर्ट सिस्टम जो वहां बना सकते हैं वो बहुत बहुत मदद कर सकता है कैंसर पेशेंट्स को इस, इस, इस चैलेंज से जूझने की और यहाँ पे अगेन जो एक नैरेटिव जो है वो बिल्ड करने की जरूरत है कि टेक्नोलॉजी आज जो है वो 2023 की का टेक्नोलॉजी है कैंसर डेथ सेंटेंस होता था 1970s में आज की टेक्नोलॉजी के साथ कैंसर कैंसर को जीता जा सकता है मोस्ट ऑफ द ब्रेस्ट कैंसर के जो केसेस हैं विच इज द लीडिंग कॉज ऑल ऑफ स्नो वो जो है वो क्यूरेबल है और बहुत सारे हमारे जो यू नो पेशेंट्स हैं वो उसको अच्छे से फाइट करके वापस आ रहे हैं सो so, ये जो टेक्नोलॉजी का जो एडवांसमेंट हुआ है उसके बारे में बातें करने की जरूरत है कि वो कहाँ पे जा रहा है कैसे जा रहा है ये जो चला आ रहा है रोल कैंसर का हमारे समाज में हम सबके ऊपर उसको उसमें जो जिस तरीके से टेक्नोलॉजी के एडवांसमेंट हुए हैं उनकी बातों को करने की जरूरत है ना आखिरी तीन पॉइंट जल्दी से आप एक रखने की जरूरत है कि जो हम कर सकते हैं हम अब ये जो मीडिया के रोल की बात है ये केवल कैंसर पेशेंट्स की बात नहीं हम सबके लिए हमें सबको पता है कि स्मोकिंग और ड्रिंकिंग ये दोनों चीजों को अवॉइड करना हम सबके लिए जरूरी है इवन फ्रॉम कैंसर के प्रिवेंशन के पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू से तो यहां पर आ, ये तो सबके लिए जो है ये इफेक्टिव हो सकता है एंड सेकेंड जो हमें करना है दो चीजें तो दो चीजें नहीं करनी है क्या सिगरेट नहीं पीना है अल्कोहल नहीं लेना है और जो करना है वो क्या है एक्सरसाइज और हेल्दी ईटिंग ये तो बहुत ही फंडामेंटल चीज है ये तो 
सब हम सबको करना चाहिए एंड वी ऑल नो कि ये चारों चीजें कंबाइंड जो है कैंसर के रिडक्शन में ऑटोमेटिकली काम करना शुरू कर देती हैं सो so, ये आ, बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट है कि एक मीडिया के पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू से इन चीजों को हम ब्रेक डाउन करके यहां तक इनकी बात करें एंड देन जो एक बहुत ही भी टाटा मेमोरियल हॉस्पिटल से अभी डॉक्टर नीता नायर ने एक पेपर प्रेजेंट किया था सेंट एंटोनियो ब्रेस्ट कैंसर सिंपोजियम जो कि वन ऑफ द मोस्ट जो है प्रेस्टिजियस ब्रेस्ट कैंसर कॉन्फ्रेंस है वर्ल्ड में वहां पे उन्होंने पहली बार जो है एक तरीके से योगा का जो इफेक्टिवनेस है उसके डेटा उन्होंने वहां प्रेजेंट किए एंड इट इज कंक्लूसिव इन अ वे थ्रू हर वर्क हमें पता है कि योगा एक कॉम्प्लीमेंट्री थेरेपी की तरह से इन द वुमन अंडरगोइंग ब्रेस्ट कैंसर का ट्रीटमेंट है इट इज डेटा ये एविडेंस बेस्ड है कि योगा हेल्प्स नाउ अब ये चीजें जो है स्मोकिंग uh, नहीं करना अल्कोहल नहीं पीना डेली एक्सरसाइज करना उसमें योगा को इंक्लूड करना और अच्छा हेल्दी uh, खाना खाना ये तो हम सब कर सकते हैं और ये बिल्ड करता है एक कैंसर फ्री सोसाइटी की तरफ हम सबको एंड फाइनली बहुत बार बातें होती हैं कि कैंसर के लिए क्या हो रहा है समाज में सरकार क्या कर रही है सो वेरी क्विकली जो है ये uh, जो है uh, आयुष्मान भारत के तहत हेल्थ एंड वेलनेस सेंटर्स जो है वहां पे अगर हम देखें तो ओरल कैंसर के करीब 18 करोड़ जो है वो डायग्नोसिस हो चुके हैं ब्रेस्ट कैंसर के भी करीब आठ आठ साढ़े आठ करोड़ हो चुके हैं सर्विकल कैंसर के छह करोड़ के आसपास स्क्रीनिंग जो है वो हो चुकी है हमारे छह जो फंक्शनल एम्स है वहां पे ऑलरेडी कैंसर ट्रीटमेंट की फैसिलिटीज हो चुकी हैं इसके अलावा तेरह और स्टेट ऐसे हॉस्पिटल्स हैं झारखंड में पंजाब में हिमाचल में कर्नाटका राजस्थान तमिलनाडु बिहार और इवन यूपी में चार पांच ऐसे हॉस्पिटल्स हैं स्टेट के जहां पे कि कैंसर को के, के लिए फैसिलिटीज हो चुकी हैं बस ऑलमोस्ट डिप्लॉय होने वाली है नॉर्थ ईस्ट में छह हॉस्पिटल्स में जो है सात एक्चुअली कैंसर हॉस्पिटल्स जो आसाम लोन में जो है वो सेटअप हो रहे हैं तो गवर्नमेंट की तरफ से भी बहुत कुछ जो है नया होते जा रहा है तो जस्ट ये ये चीज क्योंकि हमें पता है और ये चीज बार बार आपके फोरम पे आई है कि प्राइवेट के साथ साथ गवर्नमेंट का रोल और गवर्नमेंट ने जो किया है उसको एटलीस्ट उन फैसिलिटीज के बारे में लोगों तक पता होना और गवर्नमेंट जो है कैंसर के रिसर्च को कैसे बूस्ट कर रही है एम्स झज्जर में जो है वो एक नेशनल कैंसर इंस्टीट्यूट जो है वहां सेटअप किया गया है फिर इसके अलावा सेंटर फॉर इंटीग्रेटिव ऑन्कोलॉजी इसके अलावा चित्रंजन नेशनल कैंसर इंस्टीट्यूट इन वो जो कोलकाता में इन सब में कैंसर को रिसर्च को लेकर के काफी बढ़ावा दिया जा रहा है और इसके अलावा पी स्कीम्स जो है मेडिकल डिवाइसेज जो है रेडियोथेरेपी uh, को लेकर के रेडियो uh, इमेजिंग को लेकर के बिकॉज द बेटर डायग्नोसिस हो सके उतना जो है uh, वो अच्छा है एंड फाइनली आई नो आई एम सॉरी कि मेडिसिन uh, वगैरह को लेकर के भी काफी चीजें हो रही हैं सो so, इनको लेकर के मीडिया uh, का रोल बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट हो जाता है बट द बॉटम लाइन इज कि हम कैंसर पेशेंट को जो है वो एक क्वालिटी ऑफ लाइफ को समझते हुए एक पॉजिटिव एटीट्यूड को और उनके आसपास एक सपोर्ट एंड केयर सेटअप जो हम बनाने में मदद कर सके दैट बी रियली हेल्पफुल एंड बेस्ट ऑफ लक एंड थैंक्स फॉर द अमेजिंग वर्क एवरीवन इज डूइंग ओवर टू यू विवेक जी थैंक यू सो मच सर एंड सिंस यू आर हेडिंग प्रसार भारती न्यूज सर्विसेज एंड आई एम श्योर दिस मैसेज वुड हैव रीच टू मेनी पीपल हु आर यू नो फॉलोइंग मीडिया और वर्किंग इन मीडिया एंड दे वुड टेक इट इन अ राइट स्पिरिट टू हेल्प अस क्रिएट पॉजिटिव अवेयरनेस नॉट ओनली अवेयरनेस पॉजिटिव अवेयरनेस अबाउट कैंसर एंड चेंज द नेरेटिव फ्रॉम द डेस्ट सेंटेंस टू दी होप एंड विद दिस आई वुड लाइक टू वेलकम अ गेस्ट हु हैज बीन यू नो लाइक वी हैड बीन वेटिंग फॉर लॉन्ग एंड वी हैड बीन टॉकिंग अलॉन्ग हर फॉर हर डिपार्टमेंट Uh, throughout the day uh, let's welcome uh, miss urvasi prasad uh, she is a uh, director of niti ayog ma'am welcome and uh, uh, one more thing i would like to share with the, all the audiences that uh, she is uh, one of the uh, officials i would say that who understands the topic very closely because uh, uh, if if you don't mind you know i can share that she is going through you know uh, cancer and uh, she has experienced everything that you know we had been talking about uh, uh, the entire day and uh, ma'am uh, without wasting time i would like to invite you and uh, share uh, your uh, initiatives and uh, thoughts 
thank you uh, thank you for having me here i hope i'm audible to you yes ma'am yeah okay um so uh, yeah i think um, you know like you said um, that uh, you know i'm obviously going to speak uh, from the policy perspective uh, you know as you requested me to do uh, from the government's perspective uh, but but also i do have a you know a personal um, experience as well you know of of this condition which i think uh, you know then makes it much more meaningful you know if you want to uh, think about making any policies or programs uh, for people because i do believe that you know cancer is something it's very complex you know it's just one word um, but it has so many elements and so many dimensions uh, you know the healthcare is just one part of it um but but then there's the whole uh, you know the emotional uh, aspects the psychological aspects uh, the uh, social aspects uh, and of course financial aspects so you know it's not just a disease or just a health system issue uh, it is a whole of society issue um and i think it's very important that we start to look at cancer in that fashion that you know this is something uh, which the entire society has to has to tackle uh and and it's not something which uh, you know can we just left to the affected uh, individual um so i think you know from uh, the government's uh, point of view uh, i think one of the very big areas uh, that we are trying to now uh, stress on and and the previous uh, speaker also alluded to that uh, is on uh, you know prevention uh, promotion of healthy lifestyles um as well as you know early detection because i think it's very important for people to understand uh, that sometimes you can do everything right you know and and you can still get cancer you know so there is no um you know it's it's uh, it's there's no full proof way to ensure that you know you will never get cancer you can eat healthy you can exercise you can be a non smoker a non drinker uh, i mean personally i think my profile you know ticks all these boxes um but you you never know you know when when this disease can just happen to you there's there's so many different reasons why it happens in an individual um so i think that is of course something very important to understand that we should not stigmatize or discriminate against you know somebody who's got cancer as as sort of you know almost blaming them or saying you know it's your fault uh, you must not have done something right that is also not true but of course we should all follow a certain healthy lifestyle we should do what is in our hands uh and and what is in our hands uh, is is not so much you know our genetics is not really in our hands a lot of times our environment is not in our hands you know a lot of us are living in very polluted uh, you know cities and and that might not be in our hands you know we might not be able to do anything about that but you can certainly do things like trying to uh, have a healthy diet trying to you know uh, have a good exercise regime trying to as i say cut out uh, you know what are possible Uh, carcinogens like smoking and alcohol etc so from the government's point of view uh, we are really trying to promote you know these healthy behaviors these healthy lifestyles uh, amongst people um, what what we call wellness you know really promoting wellness and healthy living uh, mental health is also a very important dimension of that uh you know why why you might develop cancer or any other disease might not necessarily be related to your physical health it could also be related to your mental health you know if you are somebody who's going through a lot of stress uh you're going through depression you're going through anxiety even that can uh, you know make you more prone to to getting different kinds of diseases including cancer so so i think that is a big thrust you know of the government and hopefully we'll see more of that going forward um that you know through the health and wellness centers uh, like was just mentioned um the uh, you know the the previous speaker uh, you know also spoke about that uh, that um, you know we are going to uh, try and focus on those uh, you know wellness and prevention aspects uh, now the difference in the health and wellness centers is that uh, earlier you know we had a big focus on reproductive maternal child health now we have shifted that Uh, and said that we must have screening for non communicable diseases uh, that is something that we have brought you know into the whole ambit of the health and wellness centers now of course that is still to be fully operationalized across the country uh, but but that is the intent of the government uh, that you know you create awareness uh, you have integration of ayush 
you know with these health and wellness centers you know yoga and and you know other healthy uh, living mechanisms but then you also promote early detection uh, and screening and early detection are two very important facets you know like i said it's you might despite your best efforts still develop this disease um and and so in that case your next best bet is to identify it as early as possible uh, so that you know you can uh, get the most effective treatment and you can hopefully be cured uh, so the next thing that you know that we are really focusing on through this primary healthcare setup of the government uh, is actually on screening and and early detection uh, and skilling our health workforce to be able to do that see you don't have doctors and specialists everywhere in the country Uh, we are a very large country we are a very diverse country there are rural areas remote areas in a delhi or in a bombay you might not have a problem you know getting a doctor or a specialist uh, but in a rural or remote area you might not be able to so you have to skill your health workers who are there uh, to possibly start and identify you know signs and symptoms which could be worrying in somebody uh, so that they can actually be picked up at an early stage and then they can be referred uh you know to a doctor or or you know to a specialist uh, at a higher level of care so that is something which is another very important pillar of the government's and policy efforts uh, is how do you skill the health workforce uh, so this is one part of you know even when we talk of ayushman bharat this is one pillar uh, the health and wellness centers and uh, you know the skilling of the workforce and and going beyond just doctors and specialists this is a very very important pillar of that the other pillar which is what people know more about and talk more about is is the pradhan mantri jan arogya yojana um and that is of course the insurance part um and you know under this um, what we are trying to do is constantly you know cover um, more and more packages and i think you will see uh, you know more revisions to this uh, in the days and months to come because you know this is a very dynamic process um in terms of what should be covered uh what are the kind of treatments that should be covered under insurance um and and also the whole issue of outpatient because you know a lot of times in cancer uh, the treatment that you get is actually outpatient uh, you don't actually get admitted to a hospital uh, you know if you're just receiving chemotherapy or even if you're getting radiation uh, you might have it as an outpatient uh, so in that case you know how do you cover your costs and 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 how do you reduce the financial burden um that is also something that you know we are really looking at very carefully not just the central government but also the state governments um because you know niti aayog where i work we engage with the state governments a lot as well you know our work is not just with the central government um so with the center and the states uh, we are trying to look at the second component as well the insurance part how do we make it more comprehensive how do we cover uh, some of the latest advances in cancer treatment and how do we also look at uh, the outpatient uh, you know aspect uh, of cancer treatment and you know people who are not actually admitted to hospital um, but i think even beyond that uh, you know is is something that uh, that we are thinking about and of course often for that we rely on civil society and we rely on partnerships um, is that you know it's not just the health direct healthcare expenses that a patient or a family undergoes there's a lot of indirect expenses also uh you know you have you have to have travel you have caregivers uh you know their uh, finances also get affected uh, so that is why i said at the beginning that you know we need a whole of society approach uh, when we think about cancer you know government has a very important role to play policy has a very important role to play as i said in you know promoting well being in prevention screening early detection uh, reducing the financial burden of treatment as well as making you know care more accessible uh you know like i said we are not talking of just urban centers india doesn't live just in cities uh, we are also talking of our rural and remote areas uh, so of course all of this is a very important mandate of the government uh, but the government cannot do it alone and and therefore partnerships with civil society partnerships with you know the corporate sector these are very very crucial uh, because everybody has a very important role to play in this whole cancer uh, you know care landscape Uh, if if we may call it that way um and i think uh, you know that is something that we should do as we go forward uh, is think of it as a whole of society think of it in terms of how the different stakeholders can contribute how they can partner uh, and that is something that you know we are definitely trying to facilitate you know as as at niti aayog we engage with 
civil society partners we engage with private sector uh, we engage with a lot of different you know external stakeholders uh, and and we try to channel you know those inputs into the policy making uh, so so i'm hopeful that you know uh, we can have more forums like these we can have more discussion avenues like these but we can also build them them into more meaningful partnerships um, and as i said whole of society partnerships uh, so that we can give the patient uh and their family the caregivers uh, a truly holistic uh kind of support you know which goes beyond just healthcare uh, and and covers all the different dimensions uh, that a disease like cancer impacts um so uh yeah so i'll uh, i'll i'll stop my remarks here and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to you know come here and and be a part of this forum thank you so much uh, roshi ji and uh, it has been uh, very nice to have you and learn from the government perspective like you know majority of the times you know we or often say that okay sarkar ye nahi karti sarkar wo nahi karti hai it is very important to understand that sarkar kar rahi hai aur kabhi kabhi thoda time lagta hai but yes uh, things are in progress and uh, i'll i'll connect you uh, shortly uh, for uh, you know continuing our discussion that we had uh, thank you so much and uh, jaisa ki hum jante hain ki uh, industry is one thing that uh, everybody looks after you know uh, you know government and uh, that is something that moves the mountain uh, and uh, i'm very happy to introduce uh, once again dr vijay patil to lead a session uh, called uh, stronger together when we are having stalwarts from the industry and we would learn from them that how it is going to help cancer patients and caregivers Thank you, Vivek. Let me just share my slides and then start. I hope the slides are visible. Vivek, are the slides visible? yeah slides of this okay 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 we'll start so uh, thank you vivek for this opportunity and i think uh, we have uh, amit is there from policy bazaar we have uh, mr james from matco uh, dr ankita is here yeah hi dr vijay i'm here uh, hi 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 uh, we have mr suresh here he is a ceo from cytical hospital okay uh we have dr bharat bosle who is a senior oncologist and the director of sunrise oncology centers so dr hi, bharat you are here yeah hi. dr bharat is also yes here. yes i am here okay uh and do we have dr venkat ramna who is the ceo of kalkinos healthcare i am here okay yeah okay great so let, let's start and uh, without any wasting time we can so my first question is actually deals with the uh, cancer insurance issues and there's only a single clinician among us uh, dr bharat bosle and i would like to have from his opinion he he works in different setups he is a consultant in bombay hospital jaslok hospital bridge candy has his own healthcare uh, chain of uh, dcas and also also has worked in tata previously so bharat what do you think are the issues with insurance today yes uh, so dr vijay uh, see cancer uh, news for a patient as well as the family is anyways you know devastating and painful news and what after you know a series of counseling what we start is the treatment now now there are various aspects if i can elaborate it will take too much of time so i will know i will come to that we uh, point by point the first thing is you no know, once we start the investigations uh, you don't have the final diagnosis you have provisional diagnosis so that comes under investigation and that is where you no know, the biggest hurdle starts insurance companies most of the insurance companies i i would say not all there are you know companies who don't uh, create this uh, hassle the investigations are never ever you no know, uh, approved by the uh, companies most of the companies i would say what happens you understand nowadays uh, you no know, there are therapies which you don't need the admission and uh, you no know, then Uh, there is something there is a clause where you no know, patient has to be admit, admitted and 30 days before and 30 days after that they, they you can reimburse but nowadays our uh, treatment has so much advances we do the biopsy and sometime it comes as a erpr positive breast cancer metastatic and you have you no know, two drugs which are being given orally the patient doesn't require admission at all 
no and there are many other cancers like no lung cancer where you do a biopsy the report comes as a hulk positive these kind of no therapies are point blank rejected and you also understand the cost is not simple cost now somebody who is paying continuously emi or whatever no monthly or yearly um, sum ups for many years and suddenly the company is giving rejections to a patient who and and his family who they are in pain they are in pain of this bre breaking bad news so this is the biggest problem second thing these oral drugs as, as you mentioned reimbursement of oral drugs as we are not admitting these are because of the newer innovations and something which is better than the previous therapy we have to adapt to the newer therapies now what has ha happened vijay most of the guidelines including the nccn european and now we have icmr guidelines also they have adapted themselves these therapies are approved therapies these are not something which we are giving in a clinical trial these are approved therapies then you write these therapies these are getting rejected so the reason behind this somebody of the age of 70 who has been paying the money for last 30 years the word chemotherapy has been mentioned in the their records now you have to understand chemotherapy is something which is not written for each and every cancer so the simple rejection comes that your treatment is of no the reimbursement will be approved only if you get chemotherapy otherwise it will not be provided so the thing is that these are all anti cancer therapy be it chemotherapy be it oral targeted therapy be it a biological therapy which is in the form of monoclonal antibody technically i can't label that as a chemotherapy so this is all they play around the technicality so this is this is a major hurdle and i feel no many times i had to write and speak to the doctors but there are companies which don't allow no verbal communications and we keep on no doing all this communication for years and you have to understand the survival of these patients sometime no ends earlier than this reimbursements so one must from the industry take this point and many i see this kind of conferences where i can put up my words and the patients advocacy group also can put up their words this is very very important point you know first ask and, and thank you for asking this as a first point so do you also face uh, insurance issues with accreditation let's say if the hospital is not nabh then insurance rejects the hospitals yes so far no uh, not everywhere but now as i am you know i feel myself you no know, privileged because i work in mumbai so but then a uh, few of my colleagues we have discussed with this with me that accreditation sometimes creates a problem but we have to understand it's a process accreditation also process which takes many months or years so somebody should not should not obstruct the reimbursement if there is no accreditation because accreditation also takes time no there are phases of uh, accreditation because this is something new they have created uh, nabl and if you go to rural area we have been discussing the figure 65% of the population cancer population takes treatment in the rural area where no it is very difficult either you have to fasten the process and somebody has to take the responsibility we are talking of giving therapy at lesser cost and this accreditation process itself takes much of the cost so where we are reducing the cost we are adding the cost okay, so to sum up i think the issues with dr bharat brought out as uh, pre diagnostic workup reimbursement doesn't happen for some reasons which are best known to the insurance companies the insurance doesn't uh, uh, give Uh, reimbursements for daycare or day OPD treatments, like if there are oral drugs, it doesn't happen. You need to take the patients indoor. Somehow, it is also based on very futuristic attitude that if you have been taken a policy thirty or forty years back, and if the developments which have happened in immunotherapy and targeted therapy, somehow uh, the patients won't benefit from the development because you took a policy thirty, forty years back when these developments didn't exist. so this this is also even seen in the radi radiation uh, side and surgical side so we'll break uh, amit uh, ji yahan pe amit ji what do you think could be the solution for this because this is a, a this is a big problem that more than more people now have uh, insurances and th th this becomes a hassle in fact i'll tell you i used to work at tata hospitals it's only a month since i've shifted to hinduja what i see is that patient who have a ca were cash paying they get discharged immediately but those who have insurance they have to take there's a delay in all the process like the discharge also doesn't happen if you need to mark them for discharge at 8 o'clock they would go and leave at 5 or 6 o'clock because the insurance would then have to again approve the things so actually it sometimes feel that having a insurance is actually a hassle in your treatment right see uh, and i'll give you two perspectives here yeah. uh, from uh, representing the insurance industry 
see first perspective is one as as you know as was just mentioned see there are there are there are chances you know there are cases where claims get rejected or claims get delayed but you have to understand why it happens right so insurance companies cannot at their whims and fancies decide to reject a claim so you have to understand insurance is at the end of the day a legal contract that a customer gets into with an insurance company right it has its own terms and conditions clauses which are definitely complicated so customers have to understand that the biggest issue that we face is people have a health insurance policy they don't know what it what it covers what it does not cover that that has you know so far has been the single biggest challenge right if you if you go back let's say you know 5 uh, years 10 years back people would you typically buy the policy some agent will come home they will basically get a check they will get you uh, get you to sign on a piece of paper you won't even know what room rent capping your policy had what sum insured your policy had what waiting periods your policy had so it is it is you know at the end of the day it is somewhere important for everybody every you know for everybody to understand what health insurance policy i have so for example does my policy cover for outpatient treatment or not right if if my policy does not cover for outpatient treatment then the insurance company has all the right to reject the reject the claim for an outpatient treatment right so but but the good thing is and see because because of this there was always a lot of mistrust between customers and insurance companies because customers used to feel that my claims are not being honored to address this what has happened in the last 3 4 years especially is that the iirdai the regulatory body for insurance in india they have come up with a lot of standardization in health insurance so now what you see is a fairly standard health insurance policy similar to how let's say a car insurance policy is right so there are no there are no major surprises out there for example daycare treatments there is a list of daycare treatments to, uh, which are which are typically covered uh, what what kind of exclusion should be there there is a list of exclusion like for example earlier hiv aids was excluded by all all health insurance companies now there is a regulation which says that hiv aids has to be covered similarly modern treatments robotic surgeries which become fairly important in complicated procedures they are all now insurance companies are now practically forced to cover because the regulator has decided that all health insurance policies have to cover them right so so there has been and there has been a lot of advancement because of that now there is way more transparency than than what it used to be earlier but that said i would still say somewhere it is every customer's prerogative that they know what health insurance policy they have right if if let's say you today have a policy which does not cover for outpatient treatment and then one wants to go for outpatient treatment then then obviously the claim will get denied because the premium for that has not been paid so there i don't I'll, think I'll, claim... I'll, 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 i'll halt you at this point the problem is amit ji then I'll, i'll tell you what happens when i was studying in 2004 and 5 in medical oncology lung cancer treatment used to be always an inpatient treatment or a day care treatment let's see some person takes a insurance at that point now what happens is in 2018 we get drugs which are better which are simpler so they had they are administered on an outpatient benefit and outpatient department like because they are tablets and this we are seeing in all cancers which is going to happen that better treatments are going to come with which are targeted therapies are, are will be outpatient and frankly uh, with i am a dm in medical oncology i have done two super specializations frankly even if you ask me what are the treatments in kidney elements which have to be covered or what are treatment in an endocrine which are need to cover and all the things i also don't know them how do you feel that a lay person who has no knowledge of medicine would come to know okay isme chemotherapy likha tha yaar immunotherapy nahi likha tha ya fir you understand i find it i find it very difficult for other doctor to myself to choose a insurance policy many times so how do you think uh, that uh, we we could communicate that there is a lack of communication from both ways how can we overcome this lack of communication and, and one know. one more point out take here and which i think bharat would agree with me a lot of time insurance companies insist on asking for what is the cause of cancer cause of now cause of cancer is multifactorial we cannot it's a random event many of times you cannot pinpoint it yeah, but yeah. It, actually if by chance you write in the in the paper that the patient had habits like smoking or anything the claims get rejected sure so i'll, I'll answer i'll answer the second one first yeah, yeah. see the you mentioned a very important point right you mentioned that one one i think very very truly i don't think anybody can pinpoint to the exact reason for cancer yeah. right but 
See again, I'll tell you. I'll tell you where insurance companies would would come from in this case. An insurance company, when they are selling a policy to a customer, they clearly ask, "Do you smoke or drink?" Okay. That is a mandatory question in every health insurance policy. Now, the only reason where a claim would most likely get rejected in such a scenario is if the customer has not mentioned that he smokes, but in the in the uh, in the diagnosis, it comes out that he is a smoker. So, see. Be- the reason again reason why cancer happened one it's very debatable why cancer happened even if whatever the reason is cancer cannot be denied but if there is a misdeclaration like the customer said that i don't smoke but the doctor thinks that smoking is the biggest reason for cancer then again see the customer has basically breached the contract and somewhere somewhere the insurance company has all the right so you have to understand it's a legal contract if because had the customer said that i smoke then there would have been a slightly higher premium the customer would have paid yeah. and then there is no way that the claim would have been denied and dr bharat to your that question is right. yes. that is the right uh, no i had a patient and they have declared that the patient was smoker and alcoholic and the company kept on giving the insurance because it was in the declaration what vijay was trying to ask like this is like lymphoma where no i had personally spoken to the whoever doctor whoever so doctor from the mm-hmm. company they kept on asking exact the cancer so apart from no there are cancers where you cannot pinpoint a cause like a lymphoma right. why the lymphoma happens a blood cancer why right? if there are no genetic cause in smoking and to a person who has already you know the entire family we treat our entire you no know, patients family as a you know and psychological patient because they are yeah. under tremendous trauma and anxiety and then we are facing that because the cost of the treatment is also not in few thousands and it sometimes goes in lakhs and then Correct. risk comes as a trauma so this is the first instance so maybe you know we are trying to ask there has to be a communication if you have a reason then directly the doctor treating doctor is ready to speak it's not like that no i don't want to speak and i have filled the form i will not many occasions no i had com- started the communication from my and even vijay had so i mean we had couple of no patients together so we he also no spoken to the companies and we try to convince but that may not be possible for each and every doctor in the country some people are treating 50 patients in a day that is what we are trying to know uh, communicate to you that's it absolutely you know i think i think dr bharat that's a that's a fair point and see so i'll tell you what as policy bazaar what we try to do as policy bazaar one whenever we sell a health insurance policy we make sure that we over a recorded line inform the customer that these are the terms and conditions in your policy so by the way like as you said right we also we also get a lot of customers coming back to us saying that my claim is rejected we actually for every such case we are able to send back the recording sir this is exactly what we had told you 2 years back 5 years back and we had told you this the problem is now if, so i'll give you a very simplistic example you know just to just to explain this uh, to all let's say if and uh, this used to happen earlier people used to have uh, health insurance policies where there were room rent limits hmm. right so typically let's say a room a room in a hospital costs 10000 rupees but you had a policy which costs which had a room rent limit of 5000 rupees now if the if the customer forgets it and goes to a 10000 rupee room then you know obviously the, the customer will feel bad because the claim is denied or paid only half of it but see you have to understand the insurance company is not at fault in that yeah. so as somewhere i think it's insurance insurance industry does get sort of uh, it is a very high complaint category right as you would understand so what ends up happening is a lot of a lot of complaints do come a lot of hue and cry happens but as you said in your in your message just now in the chat message to everybody there is iidai there is the ombudsman there is there are brokers like policy bazaar who stand and really stand hard for our customers today as policy bazaar if any of our customers claim gets denied because of a mistake that our guys made we actually pay for those as well see the, the, again the onus of knowing what you have bought lies with the customer you can't buy something and then expect something else they are obviously see, it's eventually a commercial deal that one does with you know with the customer and the insurance company so you can't really pay for everything but if if what is being paid is in the realm of what the insurance policy is bought for there is no way that a claim can be denied we have just very recently we got a claim approved of 30 lakh rupees it was a cancer patient the claim was rejected by the insurance company there was no reason no valid reason for rejection we fought with the insurance company on the customer's behalf and we got the claim approved so there is no way that a claim can be rejected unless there is a reason that is the only thing for you know for for all patients or you know for any policy holder to to remember okay uh, but any more uh, uh, questions or any more uh, issues with respect to insurance you have i i think that's no if you know there is a mediator who can no mediate in between like as you say in the chemo sector there has to be a talk in between you no know, caregiver and uh, uh, the 
hello yeah 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 that's it that's it if there that's is a it. communication i think the most of the issues are technical issues which can be sorted out but the problem is that there is a big communication gap there is no discussion happening yeah i think uh, uh, uh... venkat ji wants to make a comment and yeah. uh, quick one uh, dr vijay i think uh, there is one key element missing in this entire process uh, one the extent and pace of innovations which have been happening yeah. either the regulator yeah. or any of the people in the ecosystem of oncology are probably not have much of a clue insurance being perhaps the last in the value chain that is one historically much of the reimbursements have all been on the issues of uh, illness not necessarily on wellness that's the yeah. second thing third in oncology as you know very well i don't need to tell you much of it is still an unknown unknown and if you slot in specifically as to look this is a protocol this is what you need to do no clinician will try any innovation at all he'll end up doing the least common multiple rather than trying to do what is best in a patient's perspective fourth and most importantly this is we try to do it even in our tatas days we used to tell see cancer is something which is like 70% of cases are um cup cancer of an unknown primary to ask for somebody what is it where it happened why it happened especially in the kind of a uh, emotional turmoil where one person's foot is already in the grave and uh, we need to look at many of these things with a far greater degree of empathy yeah. and a value based care system rather than as to what you sign when you send and how you sign uh, we on, let's give a break on this i think uh, we are often missing the human element in this entire process and going by uh, a very strict interpretation of a contract if we if we put ourselves in a, in the patient shoes we'll always find a way to say how can i make this happen rather than saying clause dundo kaise main nahi isko de sakta hu so i think that's a clear disconnect and many a times for a hospital system also uh, if there is an insurance patient they don't want to take because yeah. the time the money comes in it takes 7 or 8 months or yeah. even 12 months they Yes, sir. I think Dr. Ramu will know. Working capital will kill a hospital in uh, if you don't get your money upfront. I think these are some of the issues and challenges we need to deal with, and uh, and forums like this are good. At least we are express able to express uh, quite candidly without any uh, quote unquote uh, fear or favor. Uh, many people would have to come into this together to make it happen, and we need to move to a much more value based care approach rather than a cure and care approach where. we are allowed and uh, if you ask me elon musk never went to any engineering college he was an msc in physics he created the most brilliant tesla or uh, aviation company uh, we we if you say did he go to engineering he never went to stanford or mit so he would not have qualified by any stretch of imagination for anything so i think in that sense uh, all of us have an equal responsibility to make this happen Dr. Ram, I would like to bring it to you. Uh, do you feel challenges with insurance? No, I, mean, I think the challenges are obvious. I think uh, it's already been stated. At the very fundamental level, I think there is a trust deficit, and the trust deficit is everywhere actually. Um, and it starts with the fact that we don't think that the patient is at the center of um, the whole mm -hmm. situation. I think um, clinical practice. Uh, hospitals insurance companies providers pharma companies uh, i think the entire situation has to put the patient at the center and then design systems that can actually make it more patient centric i think if you complicate a policy uh, with a, you know a thousand clauses i don't think a normal human being can actually go through it and figure out what they are actually signing up for so Uh, everything actually including cancer care in that matter you know the complications the number of types of cancers itself is so confounding the number of types of treatments that the patient can get whether they should do chemo first surgery next chemo next immunotherapy there is so much information and confusion um, alongside with the stress and the fear and the stigma all simultaneously hitting the patient and the family i think um, there needs to be as 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 venkat mentioned enormous empathy in all of us to deal with it and to construct or design hospitals and healthcare systems that are truly patient centric i think trust and a patient centricity would be in my opinion uh, fundamental and anything other which we are currently seeing needs to be disincentivized we need to have policies that incentivize a more organized protocol based care approach a comprehensive care approach 
and actually pay for it uh, appropriately. In my opinion, if you don't fund the care appropriately, you're going to compromise it as well. So while there is a large amount of focus on universal health coverage, which is absolutely necessary, by keeping the price point so low, I think we are almost getting the quality impacted in terms of what we can deliver. And we are almost saying that, you know, something is better than nothing. Uh, that is quite uh, arguable, actually, is it's really better than uh, nothing. So there are many challenges that a hospital faces, uh, but we are doing our best to try and address it, I think, one patient at a time. Yeah. Okay, I'll come to that quality because I have kept a slide on that. And we'll come, I'll come back to you. Sure. So uh, now the, another issue uh, which we all wanted to discuss today and that was regarding uh, uh, access to drugs. And uh, now access to drugs is a difficult issue. Today itself, in between the two talks, I had to discuss with patient for TDX, uh, that is trastuzumab going to Rusticon, and it's the huge cost of it. So, uh, and I'll come to, the, to, to Ankita here. Uh, patient assistance program are important. In fact, uh, me, Bharat, and one of our friends were actually uh, with Dr. Kumar and all, we were trying to build up a, a site for patient information. And we actually wanted to include all drugs which are included in patient assistance program. None of the MNCs actually neither responded to our emails, neither were willing to share that information to be put on in public domain. And that's my first question, that if we are giving patient assistance program, why don't we disclose it in public domain so that most of the people benefit? And why are the criteria not displayed uh, in such a way that patients actually know about it and they don't have to run behind the oncologist to give them the option that this option exists? And I'll, I'll have this question to Ankita. Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, thanks Dr. Fadil, for that question. Uh, I'll start with a disclaimer that I'm not from the right function. So I okay. come from the medical function. So, okay. But I'll still, uh, I mean, in general, I will try and address uh, on the patient assistance programs and especially because uh, pharmaceuticals across uh, all the organizations, especially the MNCs, uh, we have moved a long way in terms of improving and improvising on the assistance programs. Um, that we are bringing, especially for the high uh, value drugs, uh, of course, with an intention to improve the access and ultimately improve the patient outcomes. Uh, there is a lot of information around the patient assistance program, which is available to the treating physician. And also, uh, when I talk about Pfizer, we do have an online platform where once the patient calls, uh, he will get all the information about the assistance programs there are there is there is nothing which is hidden in terms of like the transparency that we were talking about from an insurance perspective similarly in the assistance programs as well um, once the patient reaches the organization at the first call itself he's made aware about all the clause uh, uh, which he probably would be would be looked into to provide the assistance program the most important thing I would like to highlight here, Dr. Patil, is uh, the, the indication, right? So from the regulatory perspective, the organizations are bound to provide the assistance program only in the approved indications and the approved combinations. And I, I think in all my experience, that is one area we realize that uh, that is the commonest reason to reject any of the assistance programs to any of our drugs. I have a question, Ian, and and that... Uh... Uh, about indications. So the commonly the thing is uh, is that that they would say that this indication is not approved by DCGI. The thing is that uh, to get a DCGI approval, even if it has got US FDA approval, or if that publication has come in New England Journal and Lancet, or would it be in NCCN and SMO guidelines, which most of the medical oncologists, it takes a lead time of around one one and a half year, and uh, it becomes difficult when you know that this drug is going to benefit the patient, but just because this process has not happened, uh, the drug cannot be... Bharat, I wanted your opinion on this. Like we know that this has happened with immunotherapy drugs also. Uh, there are 16, 17 indications for pemerolizumab, but DCGI covers only five to six for us to 
uh, what do you do now you, you are muted bharat bharat you are muted yeah so i will answer it in different way now the uh, if this is only a technical problem the company says this is not indian authority approved on the other hand they say that suppose a drug a is approved in esophagus metastatic cancer the data can be extrapolated to it has happened in you no know, i have been part of the meetings the same company also says that no if you have indication for this this can be extrapolated to other indication but when it comes to giving the drugs 1 plus 1 program this is the common uh, citation comes from the company and as you rightly said it takes almost one and one uh, half year for the you know approvals to come in the meantime so many lives are lost and we understand the importance of giving immunotherapy because sometime in a metastatic setting this targeted therapy and immunotherapy can cure the patient so this is very valid point no uh, dr vijay is asking and there has to be no some uh, uh, step should be taken from the companies that within 6 months or 1 year or 1 and half year if the drug is going to be approved by the indian government this should be including the pap if you have a level 1 evidence approved by the Uh, guidelines which we follow in india ankita uh, uh, one second I'll, I'll, uh, dr venkat has a comment will take his comment and then you can address it so, dr venkat uh, yeah i think uh, dr vijay just uh, while not holding the brief for uh, dcgi uh, in the little of evidence that what we ourselves have seen is uh, many of the indications that what one would assume are available in the west but when you look at the epidemiological profile of indian patients it's way off the whack we ourselves know you yourself have done a paper on low dose immunotherapy which has literally put the fire in the bellies of many pharma companies not just here but across the world second even if a normal marker like an egfr the expression of it in indian population is three times more than that of elsewhere third even for pembro the efficacy of it in indian cohorts based on some data what we have seen is less than 14% uh, so i think uh, dcgi in some ways is right in indicating uh, that you need to test and get indian data unfortunately many of the pharma companies are not willing to run a india first trial or an india inclusive trial as part of uh, the global process for which people like yourselves would need to step in and encourage them to do it in the event that they have to get access to medicine second another thing which uh, many of the pharma might wish to seriously consider is uh, voluntary licensing for low and middle income countries like say it has happened in the case of hepatitis b uh, it has happened in the case of remdesivir there's no reason why it can't happen for uh, cancer drugs where the extent of impact on such a large population they would never get elsewhere so i think uh, these are some learnings which collectively we would have to come together uh, on this to solve sorry to interrupt on this yeah, yeah. ankita all yours yeah so um, again dr padal i just one comment i would make here is uh, definitely all our endeavor is to get the approval of the indication as soon as we have one of the key country approval whether it is us or europe uh, and uh, you can see more and more the organizations uh, and especially i can talk about pfizer that we are ensuring that these approvals come as early as possible and uh, uh, there is a need for all of us together to raise this to the regulatory authorities as well so that we can get an expedited approval from their side also i would say the bottleneck is not from the organization side in in terms of extending these assistance yeah. programs because we would be more than happy to extend this to as many patients as possible it's just because we are bound by the regulation in terms of approved indications and uh, and i think we all can work together there okay and any comments on this the point which uh, even uh, uh, venkat ji raised can we have an lmsc specific price in see vijay okay. yeah yeah i must thanks to the companies because see if you look at uh, their policies for costing in countries like in you know, low middle income countries definitely you no know, people are getting benefited yeah. and definitely for each and every patient i try my best that's why i you know uh, put forth my point that Uh, we should not lose the time because for patients these months also are very very important whatever the companies all the companies are doing is great that they are no bringing the cost by one third in most of the uh, targeted therapy or immunotherapy the 1 plus 1 program for example for immunotherapy or uh, like no there are oral drugs 
like uh, alk inhibitors which are given for 8 months and then lifelong free so i have patients who have been now taking free drugs for 5 to 6 years that's that's really good thing and we these patients in spite of having brain metastasis are surviving which are, otherwise would not have been possible patients who took the drugs in the clinical trials way back in to, to, uh, to 2010 are still alive so this is this this shows unless and until you have an access to the drug the drug has no meaning you have only written a paper your team has written a paper where no 97% of the people are not having access to a drug then i don't look at the drug as a miracle drug at all if single patient of mine is not having access it's it's like no it's it's injustice and that is what we are now discussing these issues i think no, again if there is a lot of communication happens in a stepwise manner these issues can be sorted I, I agree with you, Bharat. And I was going to allude that with all the patient assistance programs which we have, the uptake of uh, the newer drugs is in single-digit percentages in the country. In fact, uh, we would be coming up data even after when you are using low dose. What is the uptake? And I'm I don't think that uptake. would be 50% on more even when we are using going to use the low dose so if if even after using 1/10th of the dose if 50% of the population still cannot uh, take the oh. drug then we we should be really pondering on the prices the way we are going to put it and that's the reason why i just brought this issue ankita all yours yeah i think dr um, dr bosley mentioned this that now if you see and especially when i talk about pfizer most of the innovative molecules that we are bringing in even before the launch we work on the india specific pricing and you uh, all the drugs are being launched with a patient assistance program again with with the objective that the access can be reached to as many patients as possible uh, i i just i mean it came to my mind and i just also want to give an example uh, earlier i think and you must be aware about palbociclib in male breast cancer uh uh male breast cancer being a very very niche indication but still we realized that we were not able to pass on the benefit of palbociclib assistance program to these patients because this was not an approved indication and uh, believe me we worked on like a absolutely in an agile manner at at brilliant speed and we got the approval just for the fact that we can provide this access to the male breast cancer patients as well so as i mentioned it's not the intention from the industry but it's it's just a collective work together so that we can get these indications yeah. approved as early as possible yeah and uh, l- l- let's go ahead with this discussion now when we talk about uh, access i think we cannot get away without talking about generic medicines in india and we are the hub of it and let me talk to uh rajkumar ji uh, rajkumar ji how do you think the generics can help to improve the access and frankly i also wanted to know how we decide the cost for a generic because uh, i'll give you an example for generic co- called tdm1 and i won't name the company here in public domain whose this generic is this generic is also costly and uh, it's not that i can uh, prescribe it to most of a uh, uh, patient so if you can uh we can have a discussion on this issues like how do we i'm sure generic improves the access but how do we uh, control the cost of a generic also yeah i would like to put across some statistics as yeah. far as the access is concerned when i came into oncology in the year 2004 so that time if you see any even the palpable tumors or non palpable tumors the percentage of population getting treated out of the incidence was below 20% but after the generics made the therapy affordable and accessible i think we have seen a sea change when it comes to the number of patients getting treated today it moved on from 10 to 20% and some of the palpable tumors today even up to 35% and 40% of patients are getting treated i am not ascribing it totally to the affordability of generics it also goes to the credit of the state and the central schemes be it ayushman or the uh, central schemes and of course the number of oncologists who have come into the picture i still remember 20 to 21 medical oncologists used to pass out every year that was in 2004 today we have 100 dm and dnb oncologists coming out i still remember that uh, anything outside the metro cities uh, people used to find it difficult but today even places like latur uh, yeah. barda aurangabad 
everywhere you have dm medical oncologists and dm hematologists so access definitely in terms of generics has translated into number of patients getting treated one question which I have is, uh, uh, this happens for the biosimilar that every biosimilar has to do a trial and the DCJ looks at the data. Do you think it's necessary for every cytotoxic chemotherapy drug? Because what I see, what little bit understanding why I have of the process is that only the first generic actually does the trial and the rest just follows. And we have some data which uh, one was from another MNC which got published about what are the levels of the active drugs in Indian, uh, which they picked up from generic markets, claiming that the activity in this was less. So do you think we need uh, to have uh, trials, patient data, not only bioequivalence data? Yeah, uh, let's look at the global standards. If you look at the US FDA, which is one of the most respected uh, regulatory bodies in the world, we have, from our company, we have 30 drugs approved till date. None of them, or all of them are synthetic chemistry. Let me just bifurcate them into synthetic chemistry and then the recombinant proteins, yeah. then the monoclonals. Yeah. So when we talk about the synthetic chemistry, none of these 30 drugs required a clinical trial. It's quite simple because in chemistry, you don't call anything as similar. There's no purpose in doing it you have to get the exact replica of it, the same molecular formula, the same bonding in the same area. If it's a double bond, it has to be a double bond. So it has to be exactly same. So chemically, you have to establish the equivalence. So you need to submit the chemistry dossier to the regulator, be it US or the CDS code. And the chemistry dossier is analyzed and then your sample is analyzed at CDL, uh, the central drug laboratory and they do various analysis one of the simple analysis is hplc mm. uh, uh, chromatography either a, a liquid or a gas chromatography depending upon the uh, compound they do it and then the equivalence is established and then the chemistry dossier gives them an insight of the process that has been followed in the formulation uh, be it the api or the api to the formulation what kind of process has been uh, done. This is also looked into. So this establishes the chemical equivalence. And then they come into something called as BCS classification, biopharmaceutical classification system, which puts drugs into four compartments, the synthetic compounds into four compartments, like high solubility, low permeability, like it's based on solubility and permeability. So if it is category one, where the solubility is high and permeability is high, Category three, where the solubility is high, where the permeability is less. So one and three does not require bioequivalence, even in US. Out of the 30 products which I talked about, the synthetic chemistry products, if it falls under BCS category one and three, you don't even require a BE. A chemical equivalence is more than sufficient. The global standard for approving chemical drugs, synthetic drugs, is about the BCS classification. And if it falls in BCS2 and BCS3 category, where the solubility is less irrespective of the permeability, you need to conduct a crossover bioequivalence. And when you talked about the amount of active sub substance available, let's say in serum or whatever kind of tissue which you have tested, it all boils down to the quality which is delivered by that particular company. If you really want to I feel there should be a stricter regulatory on quality control. And what would you say for biosimilars? Yeah, biosimilars is a different space because you cannot use the word like same. You have to use the word similar because the amino acid sequence, even though it's the same protein which you are talking about, certain amino acid sequence need not match because the way in which you have created the protein. So when you and uh, the, we, very like we, we, when we were at Tata, we used to have audits every five years, um, yearly audits. We would look at how many patients dropped out, what were our adverse events like with respect to the international standards. Do we see such audits happening in most of the corporates, and uh, uh, whether we see with this 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 needs to be put in some regulatory way that these audits are done. We, we have we have this data 
that we, we are making more hospitals we are making more protocols but are we maintaining the quality no oh, you're right so i think the key uh, is access right to first of all nobody is going to a hospital uh, as a patient to say that i've got cancer i think that's really the last thing that's there in any patient's mind um they probably have some symptoms that are prolonged and they go to a, a general physician or a local hospital and it escalates over a period of time hopefully as fast as it can to get to the point where the diagnosis is accurate i think a lot of time in and even money um and i would say precious time because a lot of the patients that we still see are delayed uh, and i think tata is a classic example i think you've seen patients from all over the country and even outside who come very often very late because they have not been diagnosed very early and i think this this is the first thing that we need to address is can we look at early detection and early diagnosis locally um by bringing in expertise in a different set of forms the expertise continues to be concentrated in the urban areas there's a lot of efforts i think uh, we can go around but there is enormous amount of efforts but there are also reasons why this is the case right urban centers have the better infrastructure better schools and oncologists want to live there so there is a there is a good number of reasons why there is concentration in the urban centers while uh, there is more focus on improving rural centers and access through reimbursements promotions incentives and all of that for the oncologists to move there this is a process that will take time i think um, in the in, in the immediate term we need to focus on can we get the diagnosis uh, for those patients even if Uh, they are remotely located and i think there's a lot of work and uh, technology is definitely going to help us there i think that's uh, that's uh, the way i see it i would uh, i have an opinion here from venkatji venkatji you have been working in the space of uh, how we could uh, uh, improve the diagnostic abilities at uh, remote places could you have some comment on this so in this sir i think uh, dr ramu and many others even prior to this call have echoed something which is uh, at times might touch a raw nerve but uh, by the time a person unfortunately reaches a cancer center 7 out of 10 times it's already too late so the, we cannot but over emphasize the need for early detection and get the diagnostics right in the first instance and even you, you earlier mentioned on uh, particular access to drugs or a patient support program to recall some time back uh, we had been working with kumar sir on yeah. when any patient comes in irrespective of what drug is available for whom is there a possibility to do a very large ngs panel test yeah. at the price point of a pet ct hopefully ideally a whole genome and a whole transcriptome test it's like when anyone is asking you are saying look i want to answer question 3 for question 3 i know how to answer in this you have answered everything let anybody pick what uh, what answer they want to pick as a digital public goods platform and let innovations kick in if you also look at uh, in a similar manner keras was looked at as a driver and or a particular cause for cancer it took 11 years for amgen to come out with a drug so in many cases much of it is an unknown unknown so therefore initiatives like this which we started off in trying to get many entities together uh, if you really leapfrog in terms of getting the detection early and the diagnostic right in a distributed fashion much closer to a person's home uh we perhaps don't need a replica of a rejeve hotel at every single location on the back of your knowledge a good uh, general physician can give chemo at a, or a uh, targeted therapy at a, right now as you know subcutaneous injections are given at a person's home they have never visited a hospital today so i think these are some innovations which we should uh, embrace and uh, like what has happened in the area of telecom india can leapfrog uh, we directly migrated from a 2g to a 4g and in our view we can definitely migrate to a precision medicine protocol much faster and much ahead at a much more affordable construct than what many others have seen with a value based standard of care that is equal if not better than most places so there is value in it for literally everybody yeah. okay uh, uh, to to understand I'll just share we had done a retrospective analysis in tata why people come late and uh, I, i think what point you you brought about and uh, uh, mr ramu brought about is correct the primary delay happens at the process the patient reaches the first doctor in the median time of 30 days 
but then it takes around four to five months in between from them to say that this is not this is something cancer and you need to move ahead to a cancer to see a cancer doctor and we we actually saw that from the first symptom to reach to Tata the median delay was around around nine months in head and neck cancer patient and we are talking about head and neck cancer patient where seventy eighty percent are oral cavity cancer which actually can you don't need any sophisticated uh, instrument they you you see it uh, that it's there yeah dentist can pick up that symptom. yeah Not yeah. That. Yeah, you, you see that there. So I, I'll have a comment here from uh, Dr. Bharat. Dr. Bharat, you have been involved in some home care plans and you have been visiting in Goa and providing uh, chemotherapies in Goa. And uh, uh, Venkatji brought about an important issue that uh, we, we need to see how we can um, provide access close to the home rather than getting them to Mumbai because uh, one of the analysis which I had done, and this was for a study of video follow-up of this clinical follow-up, in which the surprise was, it is not the doctor's fees or it's not the hosp or hospital fees or it's not the medication which was costly. The most costly was, yeah. the, was the stay in Mumbai and the yeah. cost of <laughs> stay in Mumbai was the, was the major cost. Yes, Vijay, yes, yes. Yeah. So uh, this is a very important point, Vijay. And we have discussed personally in the past now I am no thankful. Yeah, uh, Mr. Venkat is also there, and you and me come from the Tata philosophy. And I have many times shared on the public forum that we are really fortunate to be trained in Tata Institute, where a culture comes, no, and it percolates into each and every employee. And I, I am happy saying, no, Mr. Venkat is also no trying to reach out to the grassroots, where no, we as a caregiver, once we reach at that level for the treatment of patient, we get opportunity for the prevention also indirectly. So we get opportunity to counsel the relatives coming in over there. As I told, we are very fortunate. We are sitting in Mumbai. You advise the pet scan. It is just next door. You know, patient is sometimes most of the time they are you know uh, paying class. But it is the major problem is in the rural areas, and that's where you no, know, I realize and I have never tried to you know, sit in one place. If you see in Mumbai also, I have practice across you no know, South Mumbai and you no know, periphery, where the patient population comes from different background. Goa is a place. Still, there is only one medical oncologist. Recently, one of our colleagues shifted over there. So, entire state, there are only two medical oncologists. And largely, you know, a, a place where a tourism is also available, a health tourism, there are no uh, healthcare providers. It We started in 2017 and in a part of uh, 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 Thane, we have set up a daycare. We have one more daycare in Boruli side. So, where we realized that Mumbai to Mumbai connectivity is a problem sometimes for the patient. Patient from Borivali side coming to South Bombay is a big problem. Patient says, no, we can't travel. No, there are various reasons. In Mumbai, one part to other part, traveling is also costly. As you mentioned, staying in Mumbai, outside Mumbai, people don't come to uh, Mumbai for the fear of, no, it feels like going to uh, USA for people who are in rural Maharashtra, not only uh, other parts of India, I'm telling you. This, this is a lighter right note, sir. Forget that getting people from TMH Parel to go to Attract is like India. <laughs> so, so, so that is very, very important. I know, I know the bus goes from. Uh, <laughs> so we have started the Borivali Center where we have collaborated with Nana Palkar, which is again a very good, great NGO. We have, which have been uh, helping to many patients who come, uh, you know, outside Mumbai, and they have a fantastic facility in Parel. So they have set up one day care uh, in. TMH, we knew now the TMH daycare is running 24 hours. That's what Vijay told me last year. My time when I left TMS 10 years back, the, the, the daycare was actually a daycare, not a night care. Now it is day and night care. The 24 hour it's open that many of the patients are not getting chemotherapy dates. So uh, this collaboration between Nana Palkar and Sunrise Oncology, we know we provided the healthcare support, the consultants as well as the uh, trained the chemotherapy nurses. And I think it is full of Vijay. There is a waiting list in uh, Borivali also. Every day there are 15 to 20 patients are uh, getting chemotherapy who travels from uh, uh, TMS to Borivali and uh, absolutely funded uh, through NGO supports. And TMS is also doing a great job. Nana Balkar has done a great job. In Goa, we have set up a clinic where no me along with my three of my colleagues, we do visits fortnightly. Initially, we used to visit once in a month. Now, no, uh, with a collaboration, no, unitedly we stand and we work together the care can reach to the local place. And in Goa, we have trained uh, intensivists as well as the oncosurgeons who look after when we are not there. And we are trying to develop the chemotherapy protocols on you know, AI basis 
where you no know, a minimum mistakes happens because everything will be monitored from here the protocol will not be you know uh, delivered unless and until it is scrutinized over here we use thanks to the, uh, the telemedicines which come up in a big way during covid times and we have been utilizing on a regular basis and patients are being evaluated and that is possible actually it has covid has given us a, a, a time period where we have tested all these newer innovations and i i see that you no know, uh, these are coming into practice in a rapid way so that is how we you uh, know manage the kova center where we visit physically once in two weeks but you no know, in between the patients are being taken care uh, through uh, the telemedicines also the cost is coming down significantly because of this a patient who is supposed to know you used to actually come to mumbai taking the flights are getting the same care over there uh, with multidisciplinary team whenever we visit goa we make sure that you no know, all the files are audited as you mentioned rightly i personally uh, do audit we, you and me have done audits in uh, kolkata for an alternative medicine which no actually so yeah. we had gone and checked the audit so thanks to you that you no know, because of you also i st started doing audits i was a part of ethics committee so we uh, do uh, audits of those papers the patients are being discussed in multidisciplinary ways so that kind of a care is possible what has shown uh, no way that this kind of a care is possible even at rural areas uh, james do you has wants to make a comment yeah i just wanted to add uh, when we talked about access to cancer centers for cancer therapy uh, the most pertinent question is even in 2022 why you have sub 40 percentage below 40 percent of patients getting treated of the incident population or the prevalent so it is not just to do with the affordability or the availability of the specialist it is also to do as dr bosley was repeatedly telling around 65% of patients the incident population is there in the rural area it is also to do with the literacy and the awareness yeah. most of the patients are unaware and in this definitely awareness through digital media today everybody is carrying a smartphone and everybody has a fancy of watching a lot of videos i think as pharmaceutical companies many of us have started uh spreading awareness through this 2 minute 3 minute videos so awareness needs to be increased and phc the primary health center physicians need to be trained uh because if they are trained well i think they can point the patients to the regional cancer centers for an early detection and a better outcome and even among the educated population lot of myths are there that needs to be busted the most educated society also even if when they palpate a tumor also still they are not willing to visit an oncologist because of fear so even the fear needs to be busted yeah venkat you wanted to make a comment uh, one comment dr vijay and i'll shut up I'm unfortunately hogging this uh, in terms of uh, what i really might wish to be done and in some ways uh, my colleague dr moni abraham has demonstrated that in kerala and couple of other places by working on the notion of community as a cancer center without walls or boundaries as a test pilot he tested out in uh, idukki and uh, ernakulam ernakulam being having six or seven cancer centers in idukki having nothing in last uh, 12 or 18 months uh, close to 400000 people were risk assessed the first modality was a fidgetal which is a combination of a digital questionnaire plus a physical a construct using any of the existing machinery that might be it could be a panchayat worker it could be an asha anm or asymptomatic people when they are waiting for something else in a multi speciality hospital getting them risk assessed and based on that uh, developing a navigation hierarchy through which we have at this point of time using a command center approach managed from pre cancerous to cancer early stage cancer to late stage close to 25000 patients this would have never happened all of them uh, or many of them could get a uh, time and a cost which uh, otherwise they would have ended up in a cancer center and all of this had been curated in a digital first hierarchy so irrespective of whichever hospital you go you find the same uh, electronic medical record interoperability as the case might be and uh, by design this was built as a participatory system not as a proprietary system and if you go in most places you go what works in one location doesn't work in another and this we had seen based on our own past experience in tatars of uh, having built and commissioned 20 odd cancer centers ranging from uh, tmc calcutta to several of the state or quasi state backed entities 
uh, it is very difficult to get congruence across multiple DMGs. Yeah. But yeah. if that intent, intensity, and integrity of wanting to solve it is there, we have found this definitely can be can happen. And instantly, uh, the Honorable Prime Minister gave a chance for us to present what we did about three weeks ago. He was very keen, and he, his parting comment was, "Jo bhi kar rahe ho, both logon ko balai." So the state also is very keen now to get to this early detection and getting the diagnostic model for which all of us would have, again, I keep repeating, all of us would have to, we may not get the highest factor of engagement, but certainly we can get to a least common multiple of an association. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with you. Early detection would solve a lot of problems. Like, for example, I keep, just to keep telling this, Tata sees around 40,000 patients in TMH Mumbai. And another 20, 30,000 in the ATRAC center. But frankly, we, we, we had the capacity to do only 3,000 to 4,000 surgeries, which means that we were not even catering to 10% of the patients which used to come here. And somewhere down, they were going to somewhere else. So when you look at with the Globocon figures, Tata like institutes do not even cater to 1% to 2% of the patients in this country. And we need many more centers to actually take care of them. With that, I, I would we have actually exceeded the time. And I would want one one comment from each one of you. One thing which needs to change in 2023, and if we can do that, cancer space will be much better to work with. One comment from everyone, and we'll start from Venkatji, you. Early detection, get the diagnostics right in the first instance, and get every single decision done by a tumor board, which is multidisciplinary. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Suresh ji. I think uh, work on the trust deficit, focus on patient centricity in every action and uh, make uh, all decisions comprehensive and governance uh, driven. Okay, James G. Yeah, uh, when we look at the country, per uh, the North, South, East and West, the South and West have got a good penetration of super specialty centers for cancer and the specialists available. But when you look at a state like UPBR, Jharkhand, or for that matter, even West Bengal, Outside Kolkata, even up to Kuch Bihar, you don't have proper centers, Northeast. I think this part of the country, uh, that the North and the East need to have more specialists, more specialty centers, and definitely awareness has to start from the primary health physician, and we need to increase the awareness among the public. Okay. Ankita? I think both the aspects, one is the early detection, early diagnosis, and the referrals of these patients at the right time uh, to the specialist centers, and then the access to the drugs. And it's not a single person or a single organization's efforts that would matter, but, but together, um, the, the public, the, pri the public uh, uh, institutes, the private institutes, and the nonprofit organizations to come together and work comprehensively to improve the cancer care. Now you you actually give the plan for next five years. <laughs> okay, Bharat, one line, uh, Bharat. Yeah, one line. So, see, uh, best treatment is the right of each and every Indian patient. And we all must work together to know uh, make this goal possible. Yeah. With that, I would say thank you to all. And uh, I'm sorry if I have that some raw nerves because that was what Vivek had told me to do. Okay, and this is this was a great opportunity. Many a time we interact amongst medical oncologists and amongst radiation oncologists and surgical oncologists. We never get a comment of other people's to interact. So I learned a lot of things. Thank you, Vivekji, for the opportunity and thank you, panelists, for you. speaking you. your heart out. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, organizers, Vivek and uh, Vijay. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you. Great appreciate. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And uh, with now uh, towards the end of the session, I would request Mr. Maitnath Sharma, uh, who is also co-founder of uh, UHAPO, uh, to conclude with the word of thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Vivek. Uh, in fact, uh, thanks a lot for being a great host today. Uh, and uh, what I would say is in few words at UHAPO, uh, it's a social enterprise. Our mission has been to create awareness of cancer and guide patients and their caregivers from a state of confusion to clarity. This cancer conclave is our biggest step in that direction because our work will not stop at just doing this meeting. We intend to bring a white paper from this discussion we had today and work with your valuable support on some of the pertinent roadblocks coming in the patient journey. We intend to keep communicating and working on the probable solutions around the year and update you all 
in the next conclaves year on year. Uh, before I close, we would like to thank our mentors, uh, some of whom were part of this meeting in guiding and supporting us at every step of uh, our journey. Uh, and uh, I would like to quote here Oscar Wilde, who was a famous playwright, a poet, who once said, when it rains, look for a rainbow, but when it's dark, look for stars. Today, we had stars amongst us who showered us with their wisdom and knowledge in the management of cancer. We wish you all a great weekend and a happy 2023. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.